address of senator john f kennedy to the greater houston ministerial association september twelfth nineteen sixty wherein presidential candidate kennedy dismisses concerns about his roman catholicism and pledges himself to the basic ideal of church state separation this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reverend meza reverend Reck, i am grateful for your generous invitation to speak my views while the so-called religious issue is necessarily and properly the chief topic here tonight i want to emphasize from the outset that we have far more critical issues to face in the nineteen sixty election the spread of communist influence until it now festers ninety miles off the coast of florida the humiliating treatment of our president and vice-president by those who no longer respect our power the hungry children i saw in west virginia the old people who cannot pay their doctor bills the families forced to give up their farms an america with too many slums with too few schools and too late to the moon and outer space these are the real issues which should decide this campaign and they are not religious issues for war and hunger and ignorance and despair know no religious barriers but because i am a catholic and no catholic has ever been elected president the real issues in this campaign have been obscured perhaps deliberately in some quarters less responsible than this so it is apparently necessary for me to state once again not what kind of church i believe in for that should be important only to me but what kind of america i believe in i believe in an america where the separation of church and state is absolute where no catholic prelate would tell the president should he be catholic how to act and no protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote where no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference and where no man is denied public office merely because his religion differs from the president who might appoint him or the people who might elect him i believe in an america that is officially neither catholic protestant nor jewish where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the pope the national council of churches or any other ecclesiastical source where no religious body seeks to impose its will directly or indirectly upon the general populace or the public acts of its officials and where religious liberty is so indivisible that an act against one church is treated as an act against all for while this year it may be a catholic against whom the finger of suspicion is pointed in other years it has been and may some day be again a jew or a quaker or a unitarian or a baptist it was virginia's harassment of baptist preachers for example that helped lead to jefferson's statute of religious freedom today i may be the victim but tomorrow it may be you until the whole fabric of our harmonious society is ripped at a time of great national peril finally i believe in an america where religious intolerance will some day end where all men and all churches are treated as equal where every man has the same right to attend or not attend the church of his choice where there is no catholic vote no anti-catholic vote no block voting of any kind and where catholics protestants and jews at both the lay and pastoral level will refrain from those attitudes of disdain and division which have so often marred their works in the past and promote instead the american ideal of brotherhood that is the kind of america in which i believe and it represents the kind of presidency in which i believe a great office that must neither be humbled by making it the instrument of any one religious group nor tarnished by arbitrarily withholding its occupancy from the members of any one religious group i believe in a president whose religious views are his own private affair neither imposed by him upon the nation or imposed by the nation upon him as a condition to holding that office I would not look with favor upon a president working to subvert the first amendment's guarantees of religious liberty 
nor would our system of checks and balances permit him to do so and neither do i look with favor upon those who would work to subvert article six of the constitution by requiring a religious test even by indirection for it if they disagree with that safeguard they should be out openly working to repeal it i want a chief executive whose public acts are responsible to all groups and obligated to none who can attend any ceremony service or dinner his office may appropriately require of him and whose fulfillment of his presidential oath is not limited or conditioned on any religious oath ritual or obligation this is the kind of america i believe in and this is the kind i fought for in the south pacific and the kind my brother died for in europe no one suggested then that we may have a divided loyalty that we did not believe in liberty or that we belonged to a disloyal group that threatened the freedoms for which our forefathers died and in fact this is the kind of america for which our forefathers died when they fled here to escape religious test oaths that denied office to members of less favored churches when they fought for the constitution the bill of rights and the virginia statute of religious freedom and when they fought at the shrine I visited today, the Alamo. For side by side with Bowie and Crockett died McCafferty and Bailey and Carey, but no one knows whether they were Catholic or not, for there was no religious test at the Alamo. I ask you tonight to follow in that tradition, to judge me on the basis of my record of fourteen years in Congress, on my declared stands against an ambassador to the vatican against unconstitutional aid to parochial schools and against any boycott of the public schools which i have attended myself instead of judging me on the basis of these pamphlets and publications we have all seen that carefully select quotations out of context from the statements of catholic church leaders usually in other countries frequently in other centuries and always omitting of course the statement of the american bishops in nineteen forty eight which strongly endorsed church state separation and which more nearly reflects the views of almost every american catholic i do not consider these other quotations binding upon my public acts why should you but let me say with respect to other countries that i am wholly opposed to the state being used by any religious group catholic or protestant to compel prohibit or persecute the free exercise of any other religion and i hope that you and i condemn with equal fervor those nations which deny their presidency to protestants and those which deny it to catholics and rather than cite the misdeeds of those who differ i would cite the record of the catholic church in such nations as ireland and france and the independence of such statesmen as adenauer and de gaulle but let me stress again that these are my views for contrary to common newspaper usage i am not the catholic candidate for president i am the democratic party's candidate for president who happens also to be a catholic i do not speak for my church on public matters and the church does not speak for me whatever issue may come before me as president on birth control divorce censorship gambling or any other subject i will make my decision in accordance with these views in accordance with what my conscience tells me to be the national interest and without regard to outside religious pressures or dictates and no power or threat of punishment could cause me to decide otherwise but if the time should ever come and i do not concede any conflict to be even remotely possible when my office would require me to either violate my conscience or violate the national interest then i would resign the office and i hope any conscientious public servant would do the same but i do not intend to apologize for these views to my critics of either catholic or protestant faith nor do i intend to disavow either my views or my church in order to win this election if i should lose on the real issues i shall return to my seat in the senate satisfied that i had tried my best and was fairly judged 
but if this election is decided on the basis that forty million americans lost their chance of being president on the day they were baptized then it is the whole nation that will be the loser in the eyes of catholics and non-catholics around the world in the eyes of history and in the eyes of our own people but if on the other hand i should win the election then i shall devote every effort of mind and spirit to fulfilling the oath of the presidency practically identical i might add to the oath i have taken for fourteen years in the congress for without reservation i can solemnly swear that i will faithfully execute the office of president of the united states and will to the best of my ability preserve protect and defend the constitution so help me god End of Presidential Candidate John F. Kennedy's Address to the Greater Houston Ministerial Association, September 12, 1960 Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, October 2015this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Soren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, a Danish thinker of originality and power, represents an anti-intellectualistic position notable for precision of terminology consistency and the wealth and variety of concrete life problems which it is made to illuminate he is perhaps the first modern thinker of rank to perceive that an anti-intellectualist philosophy is not complete without essential recognition of the negative element in communication he has worked out a logic of communication consistent with his own central position and has given it artistic expression in various ways in the form and style of his writings the elementary proposition that reality has characteristics which a knowledge of it cannot as such assimilate receives further amplification and definition the following propositions are characteristic. 1. The metaphysical and ontological have no existence. They are, but when they exist, they exist within the ascetic, the ethical, or the religious. No human being exists in metaphysical categories. 2 the static character of conception permeates the whole realm of logic there are no actual logical transitions all real transitions take place in the realm of the actual by means of a leap and constitute a breach of continuity three the validity of thought in relation to existence does not mean its identity with existence the particular as such cannot be thought, nor the contingent, nor the actual. 4. A skepticism which attacks the validity of thought can be escaped only through a new point of departure, by an act of will, a leap. 5. Truth, in the sense of positive objective knowledge, is unattainable. All such knowledge, sense knowledge, history, metaphysics, is either an approximation or a hypothesis. It is not essential, for it does not express the knowing subject's essential condition in existence. Mathematics does not deal with reality, and the relation of the logical to reality is hypothetical. 6. Truth as essential knowledge is ethical and ethical religious knowledge of the self. The only reality which the knower grasps directly is his own ethical reality. 
all other reality he knows only in the form of possibility essentially in the form of an impartial balancing of alternative possibilities seven the transition from the ideal the possible to the actual the sense for the historical is an act of will it is belief or faith eight the truth is a subjective condition of the individual to know the truth objectively is to be in error to be the truth subjectively is to know the truth nine existence life is essentially striving transition not for an unattainable goal but to realize the individual's own eternal self at this goal he may constantly arrive but in it he cannot remain at rest as long as he exists ten to exist is to solve contradictions not once for all or by means of speculative thought but through passion and pathos these subjective thinkers passionate interest in himself is the greatest possible antithesis to the objective thinkers lofty disinterestedness at the same time the latter since he nevertheless exists exists in distraction and is therefore comical end of summary of the anti-intellectualism of kierkegaard by david f swenson from the philosophical review edited by j e creighton volume twenty five nineteen sixteen Battle of Crater and Experiences of Prison Life by Sumner U. Sherman, late Captain, 4th Rhode Island Volunteers. From the series Personal Narratives of Events in the War of the Rebellion, being papers read before the Rhode Island Soldiers and Sailors Historical Society. Published in 1898. Read by Marianne Spiegel. I have been asked by the society under whose auspices we are gathered tonight to tell you something of my personal experiences in the battle of the mine, or of the crater, as it is sometimes called, and to supplement those experiences with some account of my life in a southern prison. At the time of the battle, I was captain of Company A, 4th Rhode Island Volunteers Infantry. The regiment to which I belonged was a portion of the 9th Army Corps under the command of General Burnside. The battle was fought on the 30th of July, 1864. But some months previous, as far back as January, 1863, the regiment, as also the corps, had been detached from the Army of the Potomac. Burnside, as you know, succeeded McClellan after the Battle of Antietam in command of the Army of the Potomac, but he himself was removed from that command in January, 1863, and taken away from the Army of the Potomac but the regiment to which I belonged ultimately became separated from the Corps and was on detached duty in the city of Norfolk, Virginia, and afterwards at Point Lookout, Maryland, where we were when the order came for us to rejoin the Ninth Corps, which had been brought back to the Army of the Potomac. We arrived in front of Petersburg, at a point on the line where the Ninth Army Corps was stationed, on the 4th of July, 1864. The two lines, our line and the enemy's were at this point very near each other, from 150 to 300 yards apart, the distance varying according to the line of the works. We were ordered to encamp in some woods in the rear of our line of rifle pits and not far from them. Shots from the enemy were continually coming into our camp, being fired at the men in the breastworks in front. We had to erect a barricade in the camp to protect ourselves, behind which we lived, Men, of course, strayed more or less away from the barricade, and every now and then someone would be wounded. Every three or four days it became our turn to take our places in the rifle pits, where we had to stay forty-eight hours and sometimes longer. We never went into the rifle pits without someone being killed or wounded. While we were encamped in this way, we heard of the plan of Lieutenant Colonel Henry Pleasance of the 48th Pennsylvania Infantry, who was a practical miner and his men were largely men who had worked in the coal mines of Pennsylvania. 
he conceived the idea of building a mine under a certain portion of the enemy's works, with the portion of blowing them up. At a certain point in the enemy's line, opposite the point where we were located, was a very strong earthwork, mounting several guns of large caliber, which did very much damage to our fortifications and troops. It was but 150 yards from our line to that point. Back of it, on higher ground, was a hill called Cemetery Hill, regarded as a strategic point. If we could capture that hill, it was believed that much would be done to force General Lee out of Richmond. This fort stood in the way. Colonel Pleasance believed that he could remove it by his plan of blowing it up. The idea was that, if the fort could be removed by the explosions, the enemy being taken by surprise, opportunity would be afforded for our troops, already in position, to charge in through the open space thus made, and, taking advantage of the surprise on the part of the enemy, to push on to the crest of Cemetery Hill. Colonel Pleasance met with no encouragement on the part of General Meade, in command of the Army of the Potomac. Nevertheless, as General Burnside, his corps commander, approved of it, he was allowed to undertake it. No assistance whatever was afforded him by the engineer corps of the army. He had to devise such methods as he could to accomplish his purpose, working at a great disadvantage all the time, but he finally accomplished the task. He began the work inside of our lines, under cover of a hill, at a point where the enemy could not perceive what was being done, and carried his tunnel through the earth the whole distance of 150 yards, until he reached the fort. It was twenty feet below the surface of the ground at the point he reached. From thence he made a branch at right angles on either side, making it in the form of a letter T, as it were, at that point. In these branches he placed large wooden tanks in which powder was to be put. Four tons of powder were placed in these wooden boxes, and connected by a fuse at the entrance of the mine. The 30th of July, 1864, was fixed upon as the time for the explosion to take place. It was intended to have it take place somewhere about three o'clock in the morning. Troops were gotten into position the night before under cover of darkness, ready to charge as soon as the mine should be exploded. I had been engaged for some days previous at the headquarters of the 3rd Division of the Ninth Army Corps, General Potter commanding, as judge advocate in connection with a court-martial. On the evening before the battle, the evening of the 29th, an order came to me to report to my regiment. I did so, and found that it was about to take its place in the line of battle, ready to join in the charge on the morning of the next day. I had my supper in camp as usual, and we started to take up our position, carrying with us no food nor anything in the way of clothing, except the clothes we had on. The time arrived when the explosion was expected to take place, but no explosion occurred. It was learned that the fuse had gone out. An officer of the 48th Pennsylvania volunteered to go in and relight the fuse, and, as I remember, it went out a second time and was relighted. Shortly before five o'clock, just as the sun was rising, a sound as of thunder was distinctly heard, and in a moment the earth at the point where the mine had been constructed was thrown upward, slowly mounting into the air to a height of some two hundred feet, and then, spreading out like a fan, fell back again into the excavation made by the explosion. The soil was of a clayey character, and enormous boulders of clay were thrown up and fell back around the opening, resembling in some respects the crater of a volcano. Hence the battle has sometimes been called the Battle of the Crater. The men who were in this fort, and the artillery, and everything pertaining to the fortifications, huge timbers, ammunition, tents, and everything that would naturally be located there, were all thrown heavenward. The men, of course, were either killed or wounded, with hardly an exception. A large number of men were in the fort. It has been estimated by some that there were a thousand. As soon as the explosion took place, the artillery all along the line on our side, some 120 pieces or more, began firing at that point. The firing lasted some moments, and then the troops were directed to charge. It had been the plan of General Burnside to have his division of colored troops lead the advance. There was in the Ninth Corps at that time a division of colored troops. They had been drilled with the idea of taking the advance, but General Meade overruled Burnside's plan, and thought it best that the colored troops should not be put in that position. So General Burnside called together his division commanders and told them of the change of plan on the very night before the battle, and allowed them to draw lots to see which one should take the lead. The lot fell to General Ledley, the least efficient of the division commanders in the Ninth Corps. When the 3rd Division, to which my regiment belonged, charged over our breastworks and across the space between our line and the enemy's line, they came upon the enemy's works, 
to the right of the crater, but by that time the enemy had recovered from his surprise and was concentrating a terrible fire upon all that region. The men instinctively sought shelter in the excavation made by the explosion, but when we arrived at that point we found the crater filled with troops of General Ledley's division. There seemed to be complete chaos reigning there. The lieutenant colonel of our regiment, who was in command, Colonel Buffum, tried to rally the men, as did officers of other regiments, and to push on to Cemetery Hill, but General Ledley, who should have been with his command, remained behind in a bomb-proof. I remember seeing him, as we passed the front, secure in a bomb-proof. His troops had fallen into confusion in the way I have explained, and he was not there to remedy the situation. It seemed impossible for the officers to accomplish anything in the midst of the reigning confusion. The fourth Rhode Island, the few of us that were together at that time, followed the colonel and the color-bearer out beyond the enemy's works toward Cemetery Hill, but we encountered such a hurricane of shot and shell that it was impossible to face it, and we were driven back again into the shelter of the enemy's works, where we remained. To attempt the capture of Cemetery Hill had proved a failure. Many of the men and officers tried to get back to our own line, but the enemy by that time had raking fire over the space between their line and our own, and it was almost sure death for any person to undertake to cross it. Very few of those who did escaped being killed or wounded. The space between was so covered with the dead and wounded that it was possible for a person to go from one line to the other without stepping on the earth. I have learned since that an order was issued for the troops in the crater to return to our own lines, but I myself did not hear of such an order, neither did Lieutenant Colonel Buffum. We remained in the crater. It was on the 30th of July, as I have said, and one of the hottest days of the summer. The enemy had gotten range upon the crater, and were dropping mortar shell into our midst, but we held them at bay until our ammunition gave out. Finally they made a charge, and succeeded in reaching the crater, and were firing directly down upon us. General Bartlett, the highest officer in rank in the crater, a general from Massachusetts, gave the order for us to surrender. An officer of my regiment, a lieutenant of the 4th Rhode Island, Lieutenant Kibby, tied a white handkerchief on his sword and held it up, in token of surrender. The enemy ceased firing. I may mention that General Bartlett in a previous battle had lost a leg, and it had been replaced by a wooden one. A shot struck him and his leg was broken, but it proved to be the wooden leg. During all this time we had no water to drink, and we were parched with thirst. I had the feeling at the time that if I had a thousand dollars I would give it cheerfully for a drink of water. The sun beating down upon us as it did, exposed as we were, and having neither water to drink nor food to eat, I became very much prostrated. I have always believed that I came very near to having sunstroke from the after effects upon me. When we surrendered, I, in common with the others, began clambering up out of the excavation, up over the boulders of clay to firm ground, and as I reached the surface, a Confederate soldier confronted me, saying, Give me that sword, you damn Yankee. I, of course, immediately surrendered my sword, giving him sword and belt and pistol. I was walking with the colonel to the rear, under the escort of Confederate soldiers, when another soldier, without any ceremony, took my colonel's hat off his head and put a much worse one in its place. The colonel wore a felt hat, and they seemed to be desirous of hats of that description. I had on an infantry cap, and my head was not disturbed. We had gone but a few paces when another Confederate soldier took off the hat that the colonel now had, and put on a still worse one. It seemed very strange to me to see my colonel treated with such disrespect, but he endured it without protest. I felt very weak, and I suppose was not able to walk with my usual steadiness, for I heard one Confederate soldier saying to another, pointing to me, I wish I had the whiskey in me that he has. If I could only have had a little at that time, I think it would have been good for me. We were taken to the rear of the enemy's line, to a field just outside of Petersburg, where we were placed under a Confederate guard, and remained there all that afternoon and all night. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon when we surrendered. A mounted officer rode up during the afternoon to take a view of us, who I was told was General Lee. If it was, it was the only time I ever saw that famous officer. As I have said, I was completely prostrated, and lay upon the ground with no desire and scarcely the strength to get up. A fellow officer brought me some water, which I drank, and bathed my head and forehead and breast in order to restore me, if possible, from the fainting condition I was in. As the sun went down and the night came on, it became cooler, and I began to revive and felt renewed vigor. The Confederates gave us nothing to eat. 
An apple was given me by someone, and that was the only food I had that day. The next day was Sunday. In the morning the Confederates took the officers and the Negroes who had been captured in battle and arranged us in an order like this, four officers, four Negroes, four officers, four Negroes, and so on, until the, all the officers and Negroes were formed into a line of that character. Then they marched us all over the town of Petersburg, through the streets, to show us up to the inhabitants. The idea they had in view, I suppose, was to humiliate the officers. We passed one house, in the doorway of which stood a white woman, with a colored woman on either side of her, and as we passed I heard her say, That is the way to treat Yankees. Mix them up with the niggers. They are so fond of them. Mix them up. I thought to myself that she was very much in the same position that we were. Another woman whom we passed called out, saying that if she had her way, she would put all those Yankees in front of a battery and mow them all down. A man said to me as we marched along, They are going to take you down to Andersonville. They are dying down there three or four hundred a day. You will never live to see home again. I thought to myself that his welcome was not, to say the least, hospitable. The guard who was marching along by my side said to me that he did not believe in insulting a prisoner, that he had made up his mind never to insult a prisoner, because he had the feeling that he might some time be in the same position. We were taken to an island in the river Appomattox, the officers at last being separated from the colored men. About eight o'clock Sunday evening, eight hard crackers and a small piece of uncooked bacon were given to each of us. I had had no food except the apple that I spoke of since the Friday night previous in camp. I went from Friday night to Sunday night without anything to eat. I ate part of the crackers and the bacon, thinking that I would make them go as far as possible, not knowing when I might receive any more. It was dark when they gave us the crackers and the bacon, and in the morning I discovered that the bacon was alive with maggots and that I had been eating it. I scraped off the maggots and ate the rest of it. On Monday morning they put us aboard box freight cars. There were no seats in the cars, and we were packed in like so many cattle, and started on our journey to Danville, Virginia. Arriving there, we were imprisoned in a tobacco warehouse, where we remained two or three days. This warehouse the Confederate government had improvised as a place in which to incarcerate prisoners of war, and a very large number of men were confined here. We saw some most revolting sights, men reduced to skeletons and so weak that they could scarcely crawl about. Here we were given boiled bacon and hard crackers for our food. The enlisted men remained here, but the commissioned officers were taken on board freight cars again and carried in the same way as before to Columbia, South Carolina. It was a very tedious and long journey. It was insufferably hot, and very little food was supplied us. We arrived at Columbia after dark in the evening and marched directly to the county jail, situated in the city of Columbia. We were placed in rooms in the jail. The one in which I was had nothing in the way of furniture in it. We simply lay down on the floor just as we had come from the freight cars. The next day we were distributed around in the rooms on the floor above that on which we were first placed. The jail stood on one of the principal streets of the city, close to the sidewalk and adjacent to what I took to be the city hall. In the rear of the jail was a yard, surrounded by a high fence and containing outhouses. It was a small yard. In it was a small brick building containing a cook stove. A pipe from the spring led into the yard with a faucet from which we drew water, which was of very excellent quality. The room in which I was placed, I should think, was in the neighborhood of twenty feet square. There were, as I remember, seventeen of us in that room. There were seven similar rooms, four on one side, three on the other side of a hall running the length of the building. The side of the room towards the outer wall consisted of an iron grating. Between that grating and the outer wall was an alleyway perhaps three feet in width. There were windows in this outer wall, which were also covered with gratings. The room contained nothing whatever in the way of chairs or beds or anything for our comfort. It was absolutely empty of everything except lice and bedbugs until we entered it. All along on the angle made by the walls and ceiling were rows of bedbugs, and at night they came down upon us. Having been divided into these rooms, we organized ourselves into messes, there being a mess in each room. Each mess detailed men from its number to do the cooking. We appointed the highest officer of our number in the prison, Colonel Marshall, as Provost Marshall. He appointed a lieutenant as adjutant, who kept a roster and detailed two men every day in each of the rooms to do police duty. Their duty was to sweep the floor and to scrub it when necessity required. No broom was supplied us. We therefore had to purchase one. The men in the room in which I was 
clubbed together and bought a broom, of very inferior quality, for which we paid five dollars in Confederate money. There was a tub belonging to the room, very roughly made, in which we brought up water from the yard below whenever we found it necessary to wash the floor. We would dash the water over the floor and then scrub it with the broom. We were allowed out in the prison yard each day, at daylight in the morning for an hour, and again in the afternoon for an hour. During the morning hour we all gathered around the one faucet in the yard to perform our morning ablutions. There were some 120 of us, as I remember, and of course we could not all engage in this process at the same time. The cooks were allowed to go into the brick house, of which I have spoken, long before daylight, where they built a fire with wood supplied by the Confederate government, and proceeded to fill a wash boiler connected with the cook stove with water, which they heated and stirred in the cornmeal supplied us as the chief article of our diet. This they afterwards baked in two dripping pans, these being the only cooking utensils which the building contained. After they had finished baking this cornbread, they divided it into pieces about as large as one's hand, and perhaps an inch or two thick, and spread it out on boards, which they brought up into the prison about eight or nine o'clock in the morning. A piece of this bread and a tin cup full of cold water constituted our breakfast. When I entered the prison, I had nothing with me but the clothes I had on, and a toothbrush and a small pocket comb. At the time I was taken prisoner, I had some twenty or twenty-five dollars in greenbacks, and this I exchanged for Confederate money, through one of the guards placed over us, receiving, as I remember, some fifteen or twenty dollars for each dollar of the currency of the United States. With this money I bought me a pint tin cup, paying five dollars for it, Confederate money. A naval officer who had been captured at Fort Sumter a year previous to our imprisonment, and who was also in the prison, gave me a small case knife and fork, made of the handle of a toothbrush. A fellow prisoner, who was ingenious with the jackknife, carved a tablespoon out of a piece of wood, of which he made me a present. These articles constituted my kit. The ration supplied us consisted of cornmeal, rice, and sorghum. The rations were issued to last ten days. They amounted to about a pint of meal a day, a tenth of a pint of rice, and a gill of sorghum. The cornmeal was sometimes good, sometimes it was wormy, Sometimes it consisted of the corn and the cob ground up together. The meal was cooked in the way I have described, and twice a day we had a piece of the size I have mentioned. Sometimes we would save our rice and sorghum, and have what we considered a feast. At other times we would sell the sorghum through the guard to somebody outside the prison in exchange for cow peas, and out of these peas a soup would be made. Of course, it consisted of nothing but the peas boiled in water. We had no meat and no salt. When such an exchange was made, we had the luxury of a pint of this soup. As I have said, I had no change of clothing, so when I indulged in the luxury of washing day, I had to go without underclothing until my clothes were dry. Of course, each man had to wash his own clothes. Every now and then it came to my turn to wash the floor and clean up the room as best I could. Retiring at night consisted in sweeping the floor. We went to bed, of course, upon the floor, wearing the clothes that we had worn during the day. I was fortunate enough to procure a log of wood out of the jail yard, which I utilized as a pillow, folding up my coat and placing it on top of the wood to make my pillow more comfortable. Of course, time hung heavy on our hands. We therefore tried to while it away by engaging in games of various kinds. We clubbed together and bought a pack of cards, paying $15 for them, and they were very poor cards at that. Some one of our number made a checker and chessboard out of a square piece of plank and whittled out rough checkers and chessmen. We used to tell stories, and indulged largely in telling what we would like to have to eat, and what we would have if we ever got out of that place. I often dreamed at night of having magnificent banquets, and that seemed to be the case with my fellow prisoners, for we frequently told each other in the morning of the splendid repasts we had had in our dreams. The naval officers of whom I have spoken, some fourteen in number, having been there for a year, and having received their pay in gold regularly, by an arrangement made with the Confederate government on the part of Admiral Dahlgren, had been able to purchase a good many things. They had supplied themselves with a number of books. They had Sir Walter Scott's novels. They had Don Quixote and Gil Blas. The two latter I borrowed of them, and read them in the prison with great interest. Some of the men in the room in which I was, having learned that I knew something of Latin, asked me if I would not undertake to teach them Latin. So I obtained from these naval officers a Latin grammar and a Latin prose composition, and established a class in Latin. So in one way and another we managed to get through each day. 
a portion of each day was occupied by each of us in a critical examination of our underclothing in order to make sure that we destroyed the crop of vermin which we found there each day they were not the kind that are found in the heads of schoolchildren but seemed to infest woolen clothing and as we all wore woolen clothing we were greatly annoyed by them this process we called skirmishing and it was one of our daily duties there were guards around the prison in the jail yard and on the street below at each side of the prison at the front of the prison there was a large window which we were ordered not to approach after six o'clock at night the guard had instructions to fire at any prisoner who might show himself at the window we not infrequently tantalized the guard by going near enough to be seen by him and dodging back just as he fired we were allowed out in the jail yard as i have said early in the morning a confederate corporal would unlock the door and shout yanks all out of course we were counted as we went out and when we returned we were all drawn up in line and counted again to make sure that all that went out had returned the captain in charge of the jail seemed to be a very excellent man he was an elderly man too old for active service in the field and the men under him were either old men or boys some of them hardly old enough to carry a musket this showed to us as we thought that nearly all their available men were at the front the guard was frequently changed that is to say the men who served for a few days would disappear and an entirely new set take their places they wore no uniform and we therefore concluded that they were rustics and others in the neighborhood temporarily serving as guards over prisoners one day while i was waiting for the officer to let us return into the prison we having been allowed out in the yard i was walking back and forth in the lower hall while doing so three young girls came up to the sentinel on duty in front of the building and spoke to him they were evidently of the class known in the south as poor white trash who had come from the country i heard them say to the guard that they would like to see a yankee he immediately pointed to me and said there's one they replied looking critically at me why i don't see but what he looks just like the other men what they expected to see i am sure i cannot tell some monstrous being or other i presume for there had been most surprising stories told at the beginning of the war among the ignorant white and colored people of the horrible appearance of the yankees it was declared that they had horns on their heads and altogether presented a very devilish aspect we used to talk more or less of the possibility of escape we could easily have gotten away from the prison because of the inferior quality of the guard whenever we were allowed outside we could have made a rush and thus gotten away from them some of us of course would probably have been killed or wounded but a majority could have escaped from the prison itself the difficulty was to get to our own lines the nearest place being the seacoast at charleston south carolina this long distance had to be traversed traveling by night and hiding by day the confederates were accustomed to hunt prisoners with bloodhounds so the chances of ultimate escape were very small two of our number however determined to take those chances at the first opportunity so one night when a severe storm was raging the wind blowing and the rain pouring down they tied some blankets together as a rope by which they could be let down to the street here i may say that some of the prisoners happened to have blankets with them when they were captured though i myself was not one of the fortunate ones we had discovered that the sentry on duty when the nights were stormy was in the habit of retiring within the porch over the front door of the prison therefore these two men thought that if they could reach the ground while the sentry was within the porch they might possibly make their escape under cover of the darkness the plan proved successful we let them down from the window and saw and heard no more of them whether they were recaptured or not i did not know for years afterwards they were not brought back to the prison and i have since learned that they succeeded in getting away in order to deceive the officer who called us out in the morning we placed two dummies on the floor in place of the men who had escaped during the previous night this ruse deceived the prison officials so the men had a longer opportunity of making their escape but it was discovered at night when the roll call was made and there were two men lacking and of course i suppose the two escaped prisoners were at once pursued the windows in the prison were sadly lacking in glass many panes having been broken out glass was almost an unknown quantity in the southern confederacy at that time as they manufactured none themselves and the blockade was so stringent that they could import but little the consequence was when winter weather came on that the prisoners suffered from cold the captain of the jail fitted up the vacant spaces with boards and so many panes had to be supplied in this way that it seriously darkened the prison he also placed a stove in the center of the hall which i have spoken of as running the whole length of the prison it was very insufficient in its capacity to heat the prison nevertheless it was better than nothing of course the fuel supplied us was wood 
an old colored woman was allowed to come into the prison whenever she chose to sell what the southern people called snacks to such as were fortunate enough to have money to buy them the lunches consisted mainly of baked sweet potatoes and flour bread or biscuit a new hampshire officer had quite a little sum of money when he was taken prisoner and this he had husbanded to the best of his ability and had some of it left when the cold became quite severe through the old colored woman by paying her liberally for it he obtained an old carpet that had seen its best days it was quite ragged and torn this those who slept on my side of the room placed over them and thus had some little protection from the cold weather we used to sleep spoon fashion under this carpet and of course we all had to turn over at the same time to keep the carpet over us we appointed one of our number to give the word of command whenever he was disposed to have us turn thus we lived week in and week out until nearly six months had gone by one day when i was engaged in teaching my class in latin i heard shouts from some of my fellow prisoners calling sherman sherman you are wanted making my way toward the direction of the shouts i found that a confederate corporal was at the prison door who informed me that he had good news for me he took me downstairs and there i found a confederate major who told me the joyful news that i was to be exchanged next morning i could scarcely believe what he said to be true for i in common with the other prisoners thought we should be compelled to remain there until the end of the war when that might be we did not know i might say here that we were allowed to write letters home but they were limited to one side of half a sheet of note paper the paper and envelopes were of the poorest quality imaginable and cost an exorbitant price reckoned in confederate money these letters had to be read by the captain in charge of the prison and forwarded by him to their destination in my letters i almost always asked my father to do what he could to get me exchanged but i had no hope that he would be successful it seems however that the two governments had made an arrangement to exchange ten thousand sick men the exchange was to have taken place at savannah and five thousand were exchanged at that point when general sherman arrived at savannah which compelled a transfer in the place of exchange the remainder were exchanged at charleston south carolina through the influence of general burnside a friend of my father's my name was included in the list of those to be exchanged although i was not sick all this i learned after reaching home after my interview with the confederate major i was taken upstairs again into my portion of the prison and told my fellow prisoners of my good luck there were six others to whom the same glorious news was imparted of course it was the topic of conversation from that time on during the rest of the day and evening many of the prisoners took advantage of the opportunity to send letters home by us and wrote much longer communications than were allowed we agreeing to secrete them about our persons and carry them away surreptitiously they could thus write many things about themselves and their condition that would not pass muster going through the captain's hands i did not sleep a wink that night the excitement of the news which i had received would not permit me to close my eyes i might say here speaking of sitting up nearly all night that we had no lights in the prison and when night came on we had to sit in the darkness until we were ready to lie down upon the floor occasionally we would indulge in the luxury of a tallow candle of the poorest quality for which we paid a dollar in confederate money sometimes a pine knot would be found among the wood which the cooks used this we would take up into the jail and light in the evening of course it afforded light but it also filled the room with clouds of smoke which escaped through the broken windows next morning our faces would be covered with soot to come back to the matter of my exchange on the afternoon of the next day i was duly liberated with my six companions and marched to a freight train i remember that it was a cold day for that region and that snow was falling it was the only snow as i recollect that we had during the time i was a prisoner the train of cars soon started on its way to charleston south carolina a number of prisoners were gathered at various points coming from andersonville and florence we reached charleston early the next morning and were marched across the city to the wharves charleston was completely abandoned by its inhabitants because of the siege on the part of our forces and it was the most desolate looking place i have ever seen in all my life the damages inflicted by shot and shell were to be seen on every hand the grass had actually grown in the streets of charleston although at the time we were passing through a light snow was on the ground adding to the desolation of the scene general tombs of georgia had threatened before the war began that the south would make grass grow in the streets of boston and that he would call the roll of his slaves on bunker hill grass actually did grow in the streets of charleston as a result of the war 
Arriving at the wharves, we were placed on board of a steam vessel, which proved to be a blockade runner, and we were carried out to a fleet of vessels under the walls of Fort Sumter, which our government had provided for the transport of prisoners. I was placed on board a ship called the United States, with a number of my fellow prisoners. Those of us who were officers were assigned by the captain of the ship to staterooms. We found that there were 900 prisoners on board from Andersonville and Florence, some of them in the last stages of emaciation. Two or three of them died on the voyage from Charleston to Annapolis, and their bodies were buried in the sea. The Sanitary Commission had an agent on board with an ample supply of underclothing. I at once got rid of the clothing which I had worn so long in the prison, throwing it overboard, and accepted with alacrity the new and clean clothing given to me by the agent of the Sanitary Commission. We lay at anchor one night in the Charleston Harbor, and the next day sailed for Annapolis, Maryland. Arriving at that point, we found each prisoner had been granted a thirty days' leave of absence. I telegraphed my father of my arrival at Annapolis, and found, on reaching home, that he could hardly bring himself to believe it. We went from Annapolis to Washington to obtain our pay, which had been accumulating during the period of our imprisonment. I purchased new clothing, and then joyfully started for home. I had served nearly three years, and my regiment had been mustered out of the service during the period of my imprisonment, its time having expired. Some of its members had re-enlisted and were consolidated with the 7th Rhode Island, but I felt that I had done my duty and that I was entitled to withdraw from the service, so I sent in my resignation direct to the Secretary of War at Washington, accompanying it with a surgeon's certificate of my health and setting forth the facts of my service and my imprisonment. I obtained the endorsement of the Governor of the State to my application, and it came back in a few days accepted, and I was out of the service. I have often felt that I would have been tempted to return, had I known that the war would end as soon as it subsequently did, so as to have the satisfaction of being in at the close, if possible. I have never regretted my being in the army during that most trying and critical period of our country. I feel as did the Westerner, who said that he would not part with his experiences for a hundred thousand dollars, and he would not go through them again for a hundred million. End of Battle of the Crater and Experiences of Prison Life by Sumner U. Sherman, late Captain, 4th Rhode Island Volunteers. The Constitution of Japan, 1946. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2015. The Constitution of Japan, 1946. Promulgated on November 3, 1946. Put into effect on May 3, 1947. We, the Japanese people, acting through our duly elected representatives in the National Diet, determined that we shall secure for ourselves and our posterity the fruits of peaceful cooperation with all nations and the blessings of liberty throughout this land, and resolved that never again shall we be visited with the horrors of war through the action of government, do proclaim that sovereign power resides with the people and do firmly establish this constitution. Government is a sacred trust of the people, the authority for which is derived from the people, the powers of which are exercised by the representatives of the people, and the benefits of which are enjoyed by the people. This is a universal principle of mankind upon which this constitution is founded. We reject and revoke all constitutions, laws, ordinances, and rescripts in conflict herewith. We, the Japanese people, desire peace for all time, and are deeply conscious of the high ideals controlling human relationship, and we have determined to preserve our security and existence, trusting in the justice and faith of the peace-loving peoples of the world. We desire to occupy an honored place in an international society striving for the preservation of peace and the banishment of tyranny and slavery, oppression and intolerance for all time from the earth. We recognize that all peoples of the world have the right to live in peace, free from fear and want. 
we believe that no nation is responsible to itself alone but that laws of political morality are universal and that obedience to such laws is incumbent upon all nations who would sustain their own sovereignty and justify their sovereign relationship with other nations we the japanese people pledge our national honor to accomplish these high ideals and purposes with all our resources chapter one the emperor article one the emperor shall be the symbol of the state and of the unity of the people deriving his position from the will of the people with whom resides sovereign power article two the imperial throne shall be dynastic and succeeded to in accordance with the imperial house law passed by the diet article three the advice and approval of the cabinet shall be required for all acts of the emperor in matters of state and the cabinet shall be responsible therefore article four the emperor shall perform only such acts in matters of state as are provided for in this constitution and he shall not have powers related to government paragraph two the emperor may delegate the performance of his acts in matters of state as may be provided by law article five when in accordance with the imperial house law a regency is established the regent shall perform his acts in matter of state in the emperor's name in this case paragraph one of the article will be applicable article six the emperor shall appoint the prime minister as designated by the diet paragraph two the emperor shall appoint the chief judge of the supreme court as designated by the cabinet article seven the emperor with the advice and approval of the cabinet shall perform the following acts in makers of state on behalf of the people one promulgation of amendments of the constitution laws cabinet orders and treaties two convocation of the diet three dissolution of the house of representatives four proclamation of general election of members of the diet five attestation of the appointment and dismissal of ministers of state and other officials as provided for by law and of full powers and credentials of ambassadors and ministers six attestation of general and special amnesty commutation of punishment reprieve and restoration of rights seven awarding of honors eight attestation of instruments of ratification and other diplomatic instruments as provided for by law nine receiving foreign ambassadors and ministers ten performance of ceremonial functions article eight no property can be given to or received by the imperial house nor can any gifts be made therefrom without the authorization of the diet chapter two renunciation of war article nine aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order the japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as a mean of settling international disputes paragraph two in order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph land sea and air forces as well as other war potential will never be maintained the right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized chapter three rights and duties of the people article ten the conditions necessary for being a japanese national shall be determined by law article eleven the people shall not be prevented from enjoying any of the fundamental human rights these fundamental human rights guaranteed to the people by this constitution shall be conferred upon the people of this and future generations as eternal and inviolate rights article twelve 
the freedoms and rights guaranteed to the people by this constitution shall be maintained by the constant endeavor of the people who shall refrain from any abuse of these freedoms and rights and shall always be responsible for utilizing them for the public welfare article thirteen all of the people shall be respected as individuals their right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness shall to the extent that it does not interfere with the public welfare be the supreme consideration in legislation and in other governmental affairs article fourteen all of the people are equal under the law and there shall be no discrimination in political economic or social relations because of race creed sex social status or family origin Paragraph 2. Peers and peerage shall not be recognized. Paragraph 3. No privilege shall accompany any award of honor, decoration, or any distinction, nor shall any such award be valid beyond the lifetime of the individual who now holds or hereafter may receive it. Article 15. The people have the inalienable right to choose their public officials and to dismiss them. Paragraph 2. All public officials are servants of the whole community and not of any group thereof. Paragraph 3. Universal adult suffrage is guaranteed with regard to the election of public officials. Paragraph 4. In all elections, secrecy of the ballot shall not be violated. A voter shall not be answerable, publicly or privately, for the choice he has made. Article 16. Every person shall have the right of peaceful petition for the redress of damage, for the removal of public officials, for the enactment, repeal or amendment of law, ordinances or regulations, and for other matters, nor shall any person be in any way discriminated against sponsoring such a petition. Article 17. Every person may sue for redress as provided by law from the state or a public entity in case he has suffered damage through illegal act of any public official. Article 18. No person shall be held in bondage of any kind. Involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, is prohibited. Article 19. Freedom of thought and conscience shall not be violated. Article 20. Freedom of religion is guaranteed to all. No religious organization shall receive any privileges from the state, nor exercise any political authority. Paragraph 2. No person shall be compelled to take part in any religious acts, celebration, rite, or practice. Paragraph 3. The state and its organs shall refrain from religious education or any other religious activity. Article 21. Freedom of assembly and association, as well as speech, press, and all other forms of expression, are guaranteed. Paragraph 2. No censorship shall be maintained, nor shall the secrecy of any means of communication be violated. Article 22. Every person shall have freedom to choose and change his residence, and to choose his occupation to the extent that it does not interfere with the public welfare. Paragraph 2. Freedom of all persons to move to a foreign country and to divest themselves of their nationality shall be inviolate. Article 23. Academic freedom is guaranteed. Article 24. Marriage shall be based only on the mutual consent of both sexes, and it shall be maintained through mutual cooperation with the equal rights of husband and wife as a basis. Paragraph 2. With regard to choice of spouse, property rights, inheritance, choice of domicile, divorce, and other matters pertaining to marriage and the family, Laws shall be enacted from the standpoint of individual dignity and the essential equality of the sexes. Article 25. All people shall have the right to maintain the minimum standards of wholesome and cultured living. Paragraph 2. 
in all spheres of life the state shall use its endeavours for the promotion and extension of social welfare and security and of public health article twenty six all people shall have the right to receive an equal education correspondent to their ability as provided by law paragraph two all people shall be obligated to have all boys and girls under their protection receive ordinary educations as provided for by law. Such compulsory education shall be free. Article 27. All people shall have the right and the obligation to work. Paragraph 2. Standards for wages, hours, rest and other working conditions shall be fixed by law. Paragraph 3. Children shall not be exploited. Article 28. The right of workers to organize and to bargain and act collectively is guaranteed. Article 29. The right to own or to hold property is inviolable. Paragraph 2. Property rights shall be defined by law in conformity with the public welfare. Paragraph 3. Private property may be taken for public use upon just compensation, therefore. Article 30. The people shall be liable to taxations as provided by law. Article 31. No person shall be deprived of life or liberty, nor shall any other criminal penalty be imposed, except according to procedure established by law. Article 32. No person shall be denied the right of access to the courts. Article 33. No person shall be apprehended except upon warrant issued by a competent judicial officer which specifies the offence with which the person is charged, unless he is apprehended, the offence being committed. Article 34. No person shall be arrested or detained without being at once informed of the charges against him or without the immediate privilege of counsel, nor shall he be detained without adequate cause, and upon demand of any person such cause must be immediately shown in open court in his presence and the presence of his counsel. Article 35. The right of all persons to be secure in their homes, Papers and effects against entries, searches and seizures shall not be impaired except upon warrant issued for adequate cause and particularly describing the place to be searched and things to be seized, or except as provided by Article 33. Paragraph 2. Each search or seizure shall be made upon separate warrant issued by a competent judicial officer. Article 36. The infliction of torture by any public officer and cruel punishments are absolutely forbidden. Article 37. In all criminal cases the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial tribunal. Paragraph 2. He shall be permitted full opportunity to examine all witnesses, and he shall have the right of compulsory process for obtaining witnesses on his behalf at public expense. Paragraph 3. At all times the accused shall have the assistant of competent counsel, who shall, if the accused is unable to secure the same by his own efforts, be assigned to his use by the State. Article 38. No person shall be compelled to testify against himself. Paragraph 2. Confession made under compulsion, torture or threat, or after prolonged arrest or detention, shall not be admitted in evidence. Paragraph 3. No person shall be convicted or punished in cases where the only proof against him is his own confession. Article 39. No person shall be held criminally liable for any act which was lawful at the time it was committed, or of which he has been acquitted, nor shall he be placed in double jeopardy. Article 40. Any person, in case he is acquitted after he has been arrested or detained, may sue the state for redress as provided by law. Chapter 4. The Diet. 
Article 41. The Diet shall be the highest organ of state power and shall be the sole law-making organ of the state. Article 42. The Diet shall consist of two houses, namely the House of Representatives and the House of Councillors. Article 43. Both houses shall consist of elected members, representative of all the people. Paragraph 2. The number of the members of each house shall be fixed by law. Article 44. The qualifications of members of both houses and their electors shall be fixed by law. However, there shall be no discrimination because of race, creed, sex, social status, family origin, education, property, or income. Article 45. The term of office of members of the House of Representatives shall be four years. However, the term shall be terminated before the full term is up in case the House of Representatives is dissolved. Article 46. The term of office of members of the House of Councillors shall be six years, and election for half the members shall take place every three years. Article 47. Electoral districts, method of voting and other matters pertaining to the method of election of members of both houses shall be fixed by law. Article 48. No person shall be permitted to be a member of both houses simultaneously. Article 49. Members of both houses shall receive appropriate annual payment from the National Treasury in accordance with law. Article 50. Except in cases provided by law, members of both houses shall be exempt from apprehension while the Diet is in session, and any members apprehended before the opening of the session shall be freed during the term of the session upon demand of the House. Article 51. Members of both houses shall not be held liable outside the House for speeches, debates or votes cast inside the House. Article 52. An ordinary session of the Diet shall be convoked once per year. Article 53. The Cabinet may determine to convoke extraordinary sessions of the Diet. When a quarter or more of the total members of either House makes the demand, the Cabinet must determine on such convocation. Article 54. When the House of Representatives is dissolved, there must be a general election of members of the House of Representatives within 40 days from the date of dissolution, and the Diet must be convoked within 30 days from the date of the election. Paragraph 2. When the House of Representatives is dissolved, the House of Councillors is closed at the same time. However, the Cabinet may in time of national emergency convoke the House of Councillors in emergency session. Paragraph 3. Measures taken at such session as mentioned in the proviso of the preceding paragraph shall be provisional and shall become null and void unless agreed to by the House of Representatives within a period of ten days after the opening of the next session of the Diet. Article 55. Each House shall judge disputes related to qualifications of its members. However, in order to deny a seat to any member, it is necessary to pass a resolution by a majority of two-thirds or more of the members present. Article 56. Business cannot be transacted in either House unless one-third or more of total membership is present. Paragraph 2. All matters shall be decided, in each House, by a majority of those present, except as elsewhere provided in the Constitution, and in case of a tie, the presiding officer shall decide the issue. Article 57. Deliberation in each House shall be public. However, a secret meeting may be held where a majority of two-thirds or more of those members present passes a resolution, therefore. Paragraph 2. Each House shall keep a record of proceedings. This record shall be published and given general circulation, excepting such parts of proceedings of secret session as may be deemed to require secrecy. 
Paragraph 3. Upon demand of one-fifth or more of the members present, votes of the members on any matter shall be recorded in the minutes. Article 58. Each House shall select its own President and other officials. Paragraph 2. Each House shall establish its rules pertaining to meetings, proceedings, and internal discipline, and may punish members for disorderly conduct. However, in order to expel a member, a majority of two-thirds or more of those members present must pass a resolution thereon. Article 59. A bill becomes a law on passage by both Houses, except as otherwise provided by the Constitution. Paragraph 2. A bill which is passed by the House of Representatives and upon which the House of Councillors makes a decision different from that of the House of Representatives becomes a law when passed a second time by the House of Representatives by a majority of two-thirds or more of the members present. Paragraph 3. The provision of the preceding paragraph does not preclude the House of Representatives from calling for the meeting of a joint committee of both Houses, provided for by law. Paragraph 4. Failure by the House of Councillors to take final action within sixty days after receipt of a bill passed by the House of Representatives, time in recess excepted, may be determined by the House of Representatives to constitute a rejection of the said bill by the House of Councillors. Article 60. The budget must first be submitted to the House of Representatives. Paragraph 2. Upon consideration of the budget, when the House of Councillors makes a decision different from that of the House of Representatives, and when no agreement can be reached even through a joint committee of both Houses provided for by law, or, in the case of failure by the House of Councillors to take final action within thirty days, the period of recess excluded, after the receipt of the budget passed by the House of Representatives, the decision of the House of Representatives shall be the decision of the Diet. Article 61. The second paragraph of the preceding article applies also to the Diet approval required for the conclusion of treaties. Article 62. Each House may conduct investigations in relation to government, and may demand the presence and testimony of witnesses, and the production of records. Article 63. The Prime Minister and other Ministers of State may, at any time, appear in either House for the purpose of speaking on bills, regardless of whether they are members of the House or not. They must appear when their presence is required in order to give answers or explanations. Article 64. The Diet shall set up an impeachment court from among the members of both Houses for the purpose of trying judges against whom removal proceedings have been instituted. Paragraph 2. Matters relating to impeachment shall be provided by law. Chapter 5. The Cabinet. Article 65. Executive power shall be vested in the Cabinet. Article 66. The Cabinet shall consist of the Prime Minister, who shall be its head, and other Ministers of State, as provided for by law. Paragraph 2. The Prime Minister and other Ministers of State must be civilians. Paragraph 3. The Cabinet, in the exercise of executive power, shall be collectively responsible to the Diet. Article 67. The Prime Minister shall be designated from among the members of the Diet by a resolution of the Diet. This designation shall precede all other business. Paragraph 2. If the House of Representatives and the House of Councillors disagrees, and if no agreement can be reached even through a joint committee of both Houses, provided for by law, or the House of Councillors fails to make designation within ten days, exclusive of the period of recess, after the House of Representatives has made designation, the decision of the House of Representatives shall be the decision of the Diet. Article 68. The Prime Minister shall appoint the Ministers of State. 
however a majority of their number must be chosen from among the members of the diet paragraph two the prime minister may remove the ministers of state as he chooses article sixty nine if the house of representatives passes a non-confidence resolution or rejects a confidence resolution the cabinet shall resign en masse unless the house of representatives is dissolved within ten days article seventy when there is a vacancy in the post of prime minister or upon the first convocation of the diet after a general election of members of the house of representatives the cabinet shall resign en masse article seventy one in the cases mentioned in the two preceding articles the cabinet shall continue its functions until the time when a new prime minister is appointed article seventy two the prime minister representing the cabinet submits bills reports on general national affairs and foreign relations to the diet and exercises control and supervision over various administrative branches article seventy three the cabinet in addition to other general administrative functions shall perform the following functions one administer the law faithfully conduct affairs of state two manage foreign affairs three conclude treaties however it shall obtain prior or depending on circumstances subsequent approval of the diet four administer the civil service in accordance with standards established by law five prepare the budget and present it to the diet six enact cabinet orders in order to execute the provisions of this constitution and of the law however it cannot include penal provisions in such cabinet orders unless authorized by such law seven decide on general amnesty special amnesty commutation of punishment reprieve and restoration of rights article seventy four all laws and cabinet orders shall be signed by the competent minister of state and countersigned by the prime minister article seventy five the ministers of state during their tenure of office shall not be subject to legal action without the consent of the prime minister however the right to take that action is not impaired hereby chapter six judiciary article seventy six the whole judicial power is vested in a supreme court and in such inferior courts as are established by law paragraph two no extraordinary tribunal shall be established nor shall any organ or agency of the executive be given final judicial power paragraph three all judges shall be independent in the exercise of their conscience and shall be bound only by this constitution and the laws article seventy seven the supreme court is vested with the rule-making power under which it determines the rules of procedure and of practice and of matters relating to attorneys the internal discipline of the courts and the administration of judicial affairs paragraph two public procurators shall be subject to the rule-making power of the supreme court paragraph three the supreme court may delegate the power to make rules for inferior courts to such courts article seventy eight judges shall not be removed except by public impeachment unless judicially declared mentally or physically incompetent to perform official duties no disciplinary action against judges shall be administered by any executive organ or agency article seventy nine the supreme court shall consist of a chief judge and such number of judges as may be determined by law all such judges excepting the chief judge shall be appointed by the cabinet paragraph two the appointment of the judges of the supreme court shall be reviewed by the people at the first general election of members of the house of representatives following their appointment and shall be reviewed again at the first general election of members of the house of representatives after a lapse of ten years and in the same manner thereafter 
Paragraph 3. In cases mentioned in the foregoing paragraph, when the majority of the voters favours the dismissal of a judge, he shall be dismissed. Paragraph 4. Matters pertaining to review shall be prescribed by law. Paragraph 5. The judges of the Supreme Court shall be retired upon the attainment of the age as fixed by law. Paragraph 6. All such judges shall receive, at regular stated intervals, adequate compensation which shall not be decreased during their terms of office. Article 80. The judges of the inferior courts shall be appointed by the Cabinet from a list of persons nominated by the Supreme Court. All such judges shall hold office for a term of ten years with privilege of reappointment, provided that they shall be retired upon the attainment of the age as fixed by law. Paragraph 2. The judges of the inferior courts shall receive, at regular stated intervals, adequate compensation which shall not be decreased during their terms of office. Article 81. The Supreme Court is the court of last resort, with power to determine the constitutionality of any law, order, regulation, or official act. Article 82. Trials shall be conducted and judgment declared publicly. Paragraph 2. Where a court anonymously determines publicity to be dangerous to public order or morals, a trial may be conducted privately. But trials of political offences, offences involving the press, or cases wherein the rights of people as guaranteed in Chapter 3 of this Constitution are in question, shall always be conducted publicly. Chapter 7. Finance. Article 83. The power to administer national finances shall be exercised as the Diet shall determine. Article 84. No new taxes shall be imposed or existing ones modified except by law or under such conditions as law may prescribe. Article 85. No money shall be expended nor shall the state obligate itself, except as authorized by the Diet. Article 86. Cabinet shall prepare and submit to the Diet for its consideration and decision a budget for each fiscal year. Article 87. In order to provide for unforeseen deficiencies in the budget, a reserve fund may be authorized by the Diet to be expended upon the responsibility of the Cabinet. Paragraph 2. The Cabinet must get subsequent approval of the Diet for all payments from the Reserve Fund. Article 88. All property of the Imperial Household shall belong to the State. All expenses of the Imperial Household shall be appropriated by the Diet in the Budget. Article 89. No public money or other property shall be expended or appropriated for the use, benefit or maintenance of any religious institution or association or for any charitable educational benevolent enterprises not under the control of public authority article ninety final accounts of the expenditures and revenues of state shall be audited annually by a board of audit and submitted by the cabinet to the diet together with the statement of audit during the fiscal year immediately following the period covered. Paragraph 2. The organization and competency of the Board of Audit shall be determined by law. Article 91. At regular intervals and at least annually, the Cabinet shall report to the Diet and the people on the state of national finances. Chapter 8. Local Self-Government. Article 92. Regulations concerning organization and operations of local public entities shall be fixed by law in accordance with the principle of local autonomy. Article 93. The local public entities shall establish assemblies as their deliberative organs in accordance with the law. Paragraph 2. The chief executive officers of all local public entities 
the members of their assemblies and such other local officials as may be determined by law shall be elected by direct popular vote within their several communities article ninety four local entities shall have the right to manage their property affairs and administration and to enact their own regulations within law article ninety five a special law applicable to one local public entity cannot be enacted by the diet without the consent of the majority of the voters of the local public entity concerned obtained in accordance with law chapter nine amendments article ninety six amendment to this constitution shall be initiated by the diet through a concurring vote of two-thirds or more of all the members of each house and shall thereupon be submitted to the people for ratification which shall require the affirmative vote of a majority of all votes cast thereon at special referendum or at such election as the diet shall specify paragraph two amendments when so ratified shall immediately be promulgated by the emperor in the name of the people as an integral part of this constitution chapter ten supreme law article ninety seven the fundamental human rights by this constitution guaranteed to the people of japan are fruits of the age-old struggle of man to be free they have survived the many exacting tests for durability and are conferred upon this and future generations in trust to be held for all time inviolate article ninety eight this constitution shall be the supreme law of the nation and no law ordinance imperial rescript or other act of government or part thereof contrary to the provisions hereof shall have legal force or validity Paragraph 2. The treaties concluded by Japan and established laws of nations shall be faithfully observed. Article 99. The Emperor or the Regent, as well as Ministers of State, members of the Diet, judges, and all other public officials, have the obligation to respect and uphold this Constitution. Chapter 11. Supplementary Provisions article one hundred this constitution shall be enforced as from the day when the period of six months will have elapsed counting from the day of its promulgation paragraph two the enactment of laws necessary for the enforcement of this constitution the election of members of the house of councillors and the procedure for the convocation of the diet and other preparatory procedures for the enforcement of this constitution may be executed before the day prescribed in the preceding paragraph article one hundred and one if the house of councillors is not constituted before the effective date of this constitution the house of representatives shall function as the diet until such time as the house of councillors shall be constituted article one hundred and two the term of office for half the members of the house of councillors serving in the first term under this constitution shall be three years Members falling under this category shall be determined in accordance with law. Article 103. The Ministers of State, members of the House of Representatives, and judges in office on the effective date of this Constitution, and all other public officials who occupy positions corresponding to such positions as are recognized by this Constitution, shall not forfeit their positions automatically on account of the enforcement of this Constitution, unless otherwise specified by law when however successors are elected or appointed under the provisions of this constitution they shall forfeit their positions as a matter of course end of the constitution of japan nineteen forty six darwin verified from Darwinism and Other Essays by John Fisk. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Darwinism. Verified. It is not often that the propounder of a new and startling scientific theory has lived to see his daring innovations accepted by the scientific world in general. Harvey's great discovery of the circulation of blood was scoffed at for nearly a whole generation, and Newton's law of gravitation, though proved by the strictest mathematical proof, received from many eminent men but a slow and grudging acquiescence. Even Leibniz, who, as a mathematician hardly inferior to Newton himself, might have been expected to be convinced on simple inspection of the theory, was prevented from accepting it by the theological objection that it appeared to substitute the action of a physical force for the direct action of the deity. In France, where ideas not of French origin are very apt to be but slowly apprehended, the opposition to the Newtonian theory was not silenced till 1759, when Clairaut and Lalande, by calculating the retardation of Halley's comet, furnished such crucial proof as could not possibly be overcome. At this time, Newton had been thirty-two years in his grave. Seventy-two years had elapsed since the publication of the Principia, and ninety-four since the hypothesis was first definitely conceived. In the present age, when the number of scientific inquirers has greatly increased, and the interchange of thoughts has become rapid and constant, it takes much less time for a new generalization to make its way into people's minds. It is now barely 18 years since Mr. Darwin's views on the origin of species were announced in a book which purported to be only the rough preliminary sketch of a greater work in course of preparation. But, though greeted at the beginning with ridicule and opprobrium, the theory of natural selection has already won a complete and overwhelming victory. One could count on one's fingers the number of eminent naturalists who still declined to adopt it, and the hesitancy of these appears to be determined in the main by theological or metaphysical, and therefore not strictly relevant, objections. But it is not simply that the great body of naturalists have accepted the Darwinian theory. It has become part and parcel of their daily thoughts, an element in every investigation which cannot be got rid of. With the tacit consent that is almost unanimous, the classificatory relations among plants and animals have come to be recognized as representing degrees of genetic kinship. One needs but to read constantly such scientific journals as Nature, or to peer into the proceedings of scientific societies, to see how thoroughly all contemporary inquiry is permeated by the conception of natural selection. The record of research, whether in embryology, in paleontology, or in the study of the classification and distribution of organized beings, has come to be the registration of testimony in support of Mr. Darwin's hypothesis. So deeply indeed has this mighty thinker impressed his thoughts on the mind of the age, that in order fully to unfold the connotation of the word Darwinism, one could hardly stop short of making an index to the entire recent literature of the organic sciences. The sway of natural selection in biology is hardly less complete than that of gravitation in astronomy, and thus it is probably true that no other scientific discoverer has, within his own lifetime, obtained so magnificent a triumph as Mr. Darwin. The comparison of the doctrine of natural selection with the Newtonian theory is made advisedly, as I wish to call attention to some differences in the aspect of the proofs by which the two such different hypotheses are established. First, however, as the point will not hereafter come up for consideration in this paper, it may be well to notice that the theological objection which has been urged against Mr. Darwin, as it was once urged against Newton, and to show briefly why, as above hinted, it cannot be regarded as properly relevant to the discussion of the scientific hypothesis. The theological objection to natural selection, which has weight with many minds, is precisely the same objection that Leibniz made to gravitation, that the action of physical forces appears to be substituted for the direct action of the deity. This has indeed been a very common objection to theories which enlarge and define what is called the action of sec This has indeed been a common objection to theories which enlarge and define what is called the action of secondary causes, but it has been particularly unfortunate in this respect 
that with the progress of inquiry it has invariably been overruled without practical detriment to theism it regularly happens that the so-called atheistical theory becomes accepted as part and parcel of science and yet men remain as firm theists as ever the objection is therefore evidently fallacious and the fallacy is not difficult to point out it lies in a metaphysical misconception of the words force and cause force is implicitly regarded as a sort of entity or demon which has a mode of action distinguishable from that of universal deity otherwise it is meaningless to speak of substituting the one for the other but such a personification of force is a remnant of barbaric thought and is no wise sanctioned by physical science when astronomy speaks of two planets attracting each other with a force which varies directly as their masses and inversely as the squares of their distances apart it simply uses the phrase as a convenient metaphor by which to describe the manner in which the observed movements of the two bodies occur it explains that in presence of each other the two bodies are observed to change their position in certain specified ways and this is all that it means this is all that a strictly scientific hypothesis can possibly allege and this is all that observation can possibly prove whatever goes beyond this and imagines or asserts a kind of pull between the two bodies is not science but metaphysics an atheistic metaphysics may imagine such a pull and may interpret it as the action of something that is not deity but such a conclusion can find no support in the scientific theorem which is simply a generalized description of phenomena the general considerations upon which the belief in the existence and the direct action of deity are otherwise founded are in no wise disturbed by the establishment of any such scientific theorem the theological question is left just where it was before we are still at perfect liberty to maintain that it is the direct action of deity which is manifested in the planetary movements having done nothing more with our newtonian hypothesis than to construct a happy formula for expressing the mode or order of the manifestation we may have learned something new concerning the manner of divine action we certainly have not substituted any other kind of action for it and what is thus obvious in the simple astronomical example is equally true in principle in every case whatever in which one set of phenomena is interpreted by comparison with another set in no case whatsoever can science use the words force or cause except as metaphorically descriptive of some observed or observable sequence of phenomena and consequently at no imaginable future time so long as the essential conditions of human thinking are maintained can science even attempt to substitute the action of any other power for the direct action of the deity darwinism may convince us that the existence of highly complicated organisms is the result of an infinitely diversified aggregate of circumstances so minute as severally to seem trivial or accidental yet the consistent theist will always occupy an impregnable position in maintaining that the entire series in each and every one of its incidents is an immediate manifestation of the creative action of god from an obverse point of view it might be argued that since a philosophical theism must regard divine power as the immediate source of all phenomena alike therefore science cannot properly explain any particular group of phenomena by a direct reference to the action of the deity such a reference is not an explanation since it adds nothing to our previous knowledge either of the phenomena or of the manner of divine action the business of science is simply to ascertain in what manner phenomena coexist with each other or follow each other and the only kind of explanation with which it can properly deal is that which refers one set of phenomena to another set in pursuing this its legitimate business science does not trench on the province of theology in any way and there is no conceivable occasion for any conflict between the two from the previous considerations taken together it follows not only that such explanations as are contained in the newtonian and darwinian theories are entirely consistent with theism but also that they are the only kind of explanations with which science can properly concern itself at all to say that complex organisms were directly created by the deity 
is to make an assertion which, however true in the theistic sense, is utterly barren. It is of no profit to theism, which must be taken for granted before the assertion can be made, and it is of no profit to science, which must still ask its question, how? Setting aside, then, the theological criticism as irrelevant to the question really at stake, the Darwinian theory, like the Newtonian, remains to be tested by strictly scientific considerations. In the more recent instance, as in the earlier, the relevant question is how far the course of events, as sketched by the hypothesis, agrees with the observed phenomena of nature. But in the directness with which this question can be answered, there is great difference between the two theories. The Newtonian hypothesis asserted the existence of a general physical property of matter, and could therefore be tested by a single crucial instance, such as was afforded by the simple case of the planetary motions. Kepler's three laws comprised in a succinct form a very complete description of the movements of the planets. And when it was shown that these movements were just such as must occur according to the theory of gravitation, the theory was rightly regarded as verified. Further confirmatory instances could but repeat the same lesson as when the irregularities of movement due to the attractions exercised by the various planets upon each other were likewise seen to conform strictly to the hypothesis. Nor was any alteration or enlargement of the original theory required in order to obtain the supreme triumph of verified prediction, as when Clairaut foretold the precise amount of delay in the reappearance of Halley's Comet, caused by the interfering attractions of Jupiter and Saturn, or as when Leverrier and Adams discovered the existence of Neptune through its effect upon the motions of Uranus. In all these cases, the physical principle involved was simple, and admitted of precise mathematical treatment, and it is owing to this that the law of gravitation has become the most illustrious example which the history of science can furnish of a completely verified hypothesis. To look for similar conciseness of verification in the case of the Darwinian theory would be to mistake entirely the conditions under which scientific evidence can be procured. To estimate properly the value of any hypothesis, it is necessary that we should know what kind and degree of proof to expect, and in the present case, we must not look for a demonstration that shall be direct and simple. Instead of a universal property of matter, so conspicuous as to be recognized at once by the inspection of a few striking instances, we have, in the theory of natural selection, to deal with a very complex process, working results of endless diversity throughout the organic world and often masked in its action by accompanying processes, some of which we can detect without being able to estimate their relative potency, while others, no doubt, have thus far escaped our attention altogether. Accordingly, while we may consider it as certain that natural selection is capable of working specific changes in organisms, we may, at the same time, find it impossible to give a complete account of the origin of any one particular species through natural selection, because we can never be sure that we have taken due notice of all the innumerable concrete circumstances involved in such an event. The theory, therefore, cannot be adequately tested by any single striking instance, but must depend for its support on the cumulative evidence afforded by its general harmony with the processes of organic nature. If we consider the Darwinian theory as a whole, it must be admitted that such cumulative evidence has already been brought forward in sufficient quantity to amount to a satisfactory demonstration. The convergence of proofs is too persistent and unmistakable to allow of any alternative hypothesis being put in the field. But in exhibiting this, it is desirable that there should be no confusion of thought as to the full import of the Darwinian theory. Mr. Mivart's way of describing that theory as an attempt to account for the origin of all the various forms of life through the operation of natural selection alone is a gross misrepresentation. Mr. Darwin has never urged his hypothesis in this limited shape. The essential theorems of Darwinism are, first, that forms of life now widely unlike have been produced from a common original through the actions of accumulated inheritance. Mr. Darwin has never urged his hypothesis in this limited shape. The essential theorems of Darwinism are, first, that forms of life, now widely unlike, have been produced from common original, 
through the accumulated inheritance of minute individual modifications, and, secondly, that such modifications have been accumulated mainly, or in great part, through the selection of individuals best fitted to survive and transmit their peculiarities to their offspring. But that this survival of the fittest individuals has been the sole agency concerned in bringing about the present wondrous variety of living beings, Mr. Darwin has nowhere asserted or implied, having even in the earliest edition of his great work explicitly pointed out other agencies as involved in this complex result. Yet other agencies, hitherto unsuspected, may be discovered in the future, but such discoveries, however far they may go in supplementing the Darwinian theory, can only strengthen the central position as regards the rise of specific differences through gradual modifications. The wonders wrought by artificial selection in the breeding of domestic animals and cultivated plants are such that one might well have attributed great results to the exercise of a similar selection by nature through countless ages, could any such process be detected. Few, however, save those instructed naturalists who have frequent occasion to ponder the subject, are aware what a tremendous reality natural selection is. As I have elsewhere observed, a single codfish has been known to lay six million eggs within a year. If these eggs were all to become adult codfish, and the multiplication were to continue at this rate for three or four years, the ocean would not afford room for the species. Yet we have no reason to suppose that the race of codfishes is actually increasing in numbers to any notable extent. With the codfish, as with animal species in general, the numbers during many successive generations oscillate about a point which is fixed, or moves but slowly forward or backward. Instead of a geometrical increase with a ratio of six millions, there is practically no marked increase at all. Now, this implies that out of the six million embryo codfish, a sufficient number will survive to replace their two parents, and to replace a certain small proportion of those contemporary codfish, which leave no progeny. Perhaps a dozen may suffice for this, perhaps a hundred. The rest of the six million must die. The amount of destruction is not so great as this in all parts of the animal kingdom. Among the higher birds and mammals, the preservation of the individual bears a very much higher ratio to the preservation of the race. But with the immense classes of fish, insects, and crustaceans, as well as the sub-kingdom of mollusks, which taken together make up by far the greater portion of the animal world, the destruction continually going on is probably not less than that which is described in the example cited. Even if we were to take account only of the individuals which survive the embryo or larva state, but do not succeed in leaving offspring behind them, the cases of destruction would still bear an enormous ratio to the cases of preservation. But in maintaining the characteristics of a race, only those individuals can be counted who produce offspring. It is obvious, then, that each species of organisms, as we know it, consists only of a few favored individuals selected out of countless multitudes who have been tried and rejected as unworthy to live. No selection that is exercised by man compares in rigor to this. It is somewhat as if a breeder of racehorses were to choose, with infallible accuracy of judgment, the two or three fleetest out of each hundred thousand, destroying all the rest, that the high standard of the breed might run no possible risk of deterioration. In such a rigorous competition as this, no individual peculiarity can be so slight that we are entitled to regard it as unimportant. No peculiarity is really slight that enables its possessor to survive until he transmits it to posterity. In view of all this, we see how misleading it is to describe natural selection, as Mr. Mivert does, as a process which operates only occasionally upon variations assumed to be fortuitous. We see that natural selection, like a power that slumbers not, nor sleeps, is ever preserving the stability of species by seizing all individual peculiarities that oscillate within narrow limits on either side of the mean that is most advantageous to the species, while cutting off all such peculiarities as transgress these limits. Domesticated animals, protected from the exigencies of wild life, often exhibit great varieties in coloring, while wild animals of the same genus or species are monotonously colored because only one kind of coloring will aid them in catching prey or eluding enemies. 
and all the variations are killed out. Who can doubt that antelopes are so fleet only because all but the fleetest individuals are sure to be overtaken and eaten by lions? Protected from the lions, a thousand generations might well make them as lazy and clumsy as sheep. Operating in this stern way, natural selection thus secures the general adaptation of each race of organisms to the conditions of life which surround it. And so long as the species continues surrounded by circumstances that are tolerably persistent, natural selection maintains its stability of character. Thus, what the older naturalists called the fixity of species is fully accounted for, but a fixity of species that is maintained only under such conditions is really no fixity at all. Change the surrounding circumstances, and the average character of the species must change. Slight peculiarities that once ensured survival will now ensure destruction, and tendencies to vary that once would have been nipped short will now be encouraged and exaggerated. In this way, the strong tendency, hereditary in all mammals, toward the growth of hair on the surface was greatly exaggerated in the Siberian mammoth, while checked in his brethren, the elephants of India and Africa. In this way, a peculiar curve in the contour of butterfly wings, which is persistently killed out in India and Java, is, with equal persistence, selected for preservation in Salibs. How far such alterations in the direction of natural selection may work deep-seated changes in the structure of an organism, one cannot accurately define, but there is no doubt that they go very far indeed. When taken in connection with the facts of what is called correlation of growth, an organism is not a mere aggregation of parts of which one can be altered without affecting the others. Increase in the size and weight of a deer's horns entails an increase in the size of the cervical vertebrae and muscles and indirectly modifies the shoulders and forelimbs, while all of these changes, by altering the animal's center of gravity, cause compensating changes in the rest of the body. Increased thickness of fur modifies the efficiency of skin as an excreting organ, and thus reacts upon the lungs, livers, and kidneys. But it is not only in these clearly traceable ways that correlation of growth is manifested. Sometimes the correlations are inexplicable. Thus, to lengthen the beak of a pigeon is to increase the size of his feet. Hairless dogs have their teeth imperfect, and white tomcats with blue eyes are almost invariably deaf. In the present state of physiological knowledge, we cannot account for such facts, but it is enough for the purposes of the Darwinian theory to know that they exist. For, taken all together, they show that natural selection, operating on even the most superficial variations, is quite competent to work deep-seated changes of structure and function. When we consider, then, that the circumstances which determine what individuals shall survive are not constant in the long run for any species, though apparently constant, for limited periods of time. When we reflect that there is no one of the larger groups of plants and animals, such as orders or families or even genera, which have not been subjected again and again to great and complicated changes of environment, it becomes evident that anything like fixity of species is utterly out of the question. No such thing is possible or even imaginable once the facts of the case have been thoroughly conceived. Looking over the Earth's surface today, things may seem quiet and stable enough, but if we contemplate the succession of past events as disclosed by the geologist, what mainly strikes our attention is the secular turmoil. Islands aggregating into continents, continents breaking up into archipelagos, rivers shifting their beds, coastlines changing their direction, oceans now separated by impassable isthmus walls, now mingling their floras and faunas through new-made channels, torrid zones becoming temperate and temperate zones becoming frigid, marshes transformed into deserts and glaciated valleys thawing into sunny lakes, high tablelands sinking into ocean floors and submarine ledges rearing their heads as alpine ranges. Deep-sea mollusks and crustaceans seeking refuge in shallow waters while littoral organisms migrate upland to find new food and contend with new enemies. Plant seeds carried by vagrant birds to unwanted habitats, peaceful tribes of ruminants decimated by invading carnivores, ceaseless conflict and redistribution of every possible sort. These are the things we are called upon to contemplate. Remembering then, how stability of species is maintained only by the rigorous selection 
of a few individuals that are best adapted to a given set of exigencies, we see that as the combinations of exigencies are altered from time to time, the stability of species can in general be but temporary. Now and then we may expect to find very long persistency of type where, in spite of great terrestrial changes, some simple set of conditions most important to the organism remain unaltered. In the vast majority of cases, such persistence is impossible. It is seldom that the life of any species extends over more than one geological epoch. Often, the duration is much shorter than this. Whether, therefore, it is practicable for us today to explain every minute peculiarity of any one particular species by an appeal to natural selection alone is not the main point to be considered in estimating the success of the Darwinian theory. The question has a scientific interest of its own, which is very great, but it is not the main question. The main point is that admitting natural selection to be a vera causa at all, and this no one denies, the stability of species is proved to be but a contingent and temporary affair. The old notion of an absolute fixity of species is overthrown once and for all, and with it the only semblance of an argument that could ever have been alleged in behalf of the hypothesis of special creations. For in considering nearly allied forms, like the lion, tiger, and leopard, their actual consanguinity would never have been doubted for a moment, but for the inability of naturalists to understand how the type which appears so constant when viewed through a short period of time and amid unchanging conditions, should, after all, be variable. Unable to imagine any probable cause or method of variation by which the descendants of a common feline ancestor should have acquired the divergent characteristics of lions and leopards, the naturalist either gave up the problem as insoluble or retreated to the assumption that leopards and lions were separately created. In either case, science was equally at fault for, as above argued, the hypothesis of special creations as referring a particular group of phenomena to that divine action, which is the equal source of all phenomena, is not entitled to be considered a scientific explanation. But when Mr. Darwin called attention to the working of natural selection, the difficulty was removed, and it at once became highly probable that such allied forms had diverged from a common stock through the accumulation of minute modifications such being the conclusion to which we are led by considering the process of natural selection it becomes desirable to inquire whether the conclusion is confirmed by the most general phenomena of organic life that have been observed and tabulated there is no hesitation or ambiguity in the answer whether we consider the classificatory relationships of plants and animals their embryology their morphology their geographical distribution or their geological succession there is not only abundance of evidence, but the evidence points wholly in one direction. With entire unanimity, the phenomena in question testify that species have arisen by descent with modifications, and not by disconnected acts of creation. The facts of classification alone are sufficiently decisive. By the older naturalists who sought to arrange animals and plants in groups according to their resemblances, attempts were often made to construct a linear series in which each group should be intermediate between those which preceded and those which followed it. All such attempts proved futile, and after a half century of discussion and criticism, it became evident that the only possible classification which correctly represents the facts is one in which organisms are arranged in divergent groups and subgroups, like the branches and twigs of what is aptly termed a family tree. Wherever different orders, family, or genera show points of resemblance to each other, the resemblances always occur at the bottom, among their least highly developed species. Apes, bats, and rabbits are sufficiently distinct in type, but the lowest member of the order to which these animals respectively belong are strikingly like one another. At the bottom of the mammalian class, the echidna and duckbill have many points in common with birds and reptiles, while birds and reptiles not only draw together so that it is hard to distinguish their most primitive forms as clearly bird or clearly reptile, but these primitive forms remind one in many ways of the Batrachians. A Batrachian, in turn, is an animal which ends its life as a kind of reptile, having begun it as a kind of imperfectly specialized fish, 
again the lowest known vertebrate the amphiochus usually ranked with the fishes though hardly specialized enough to be called a true fish exhibits marks of actual relationship with the ascidian which is nothing more than a worm of the order known as tunicata no two animals could be less like each other than a bee and a nautilus yet in their lowest members the two sub-kingdoms of articulata and mollusks become barely distinguishable from each other and from the worms which the vertebrate subkingdom also becomes blended it is on account of this convergence of types as we descend in the scale that naturalists have found it so difficult to classify satisfactorily those lower organisms which cuvier roughly grouped together as radiata parallel phenomena recur as we reach the confines of the animal and vegetal kingdoms and meet with numbers of organisms which there is as much reason for assigning to the one kingdom as the other all this complicated arrangement of organisms in groups within groups resembling each other at the bottom of the scale and differing most widely at the top is just what is presupposed by the darwinian theory of descent with modification and on any other theory it appears to be totally inexplicable precisely similar testimony as to the gradual divergence is found in the facts of embryology and morphology it is a familiar fact that the germs of all organisms are like each other and are moreover very like such lowest forms of life as the amoeba and protococcus but as a germ develops it becomes specialized and defined first to its subkingdom then as to its class order family genus species and variety the germ cell of a mandrel is at first indistinguishable from that of a snail or lobster the fetal ape arising therefrom is at first definable as a vertebrate but not as a mammal on the other hand it circulates its blood through a system of gills and its nascent heart is like the heart of a fish presently with the appearance of the allantoidal membrane the fetus seems to be on the point of becoming a reptile or bird but after a while it declares itself a mammal next it becomes apparent that it is not a rodent or insectivore but a primate next it exhibits characteristics which define it as a true ape and not a lemur still later it is seen to be a catarine ape and finally it is born with the specific attributes of a mandrel which are however further intensified as it reaches maturity facts like these which are invariably found in the embryonic development of organisms tell just the same story as the facts of classification if they do not mean that the various forms of organic life have arisen by gradual divergence from a common original one might well be excused for doubting whether the phenomena of nature have any rational meaning whatever of like import are many of the more special facts of embryology such as the useless rudiments of hind limbs in many snakes the presence of teeth in the beaks of sundry embryonic birds and in the jaws of fetal whales and the gill-like glands in the human throat as if all this were not enough the study of morphology discloses that all the diversified mechanical functions performed by the various animals comprised in any sub-kingdom are achieved by more or less considerable modifications of a framework that in its typical features is common to all in embryonic development the fins of the fish correspond with the legs of reptiles and mammals and with the legs and wings of birds to enable the bat to fly no new mechanism is invented but an embryonal hand develops into a wing by the elongation of its fingers and the growth of a web-like skin between them if we consider the most general features of the geographical distribution and geological succession of organisms we find the evidence hardly less complete and convincing generally speaking the contemporary species found in any geographical area most closely resembles the species that inhabited the same area in former ages thus in the miocene age australia abounded in marsupials and marsupials specifically different though nearly allied to these make up today the greater part of the mammalian fauna of australia there is no imaginable reason why this should be so unless the contemporary marsupials are descended from the earlier forms it cannot be urged that marsupials are better adapted to the conditions of life in australia than placental mammals for the placental mammals lately introduced there are already beginning to supplant and exterminate the marsupials the only possible explanation is that whereas marsupials once covered the terrestrial globe and have been supplanted by better adapted forms in the old world and with the exception of the opossum in america 
the isolation of Australia has allowed them there to go on reproducing their kind until the present day. In such an instance as this, we have something very nearly like the crucial proof of the theory of descent with modifications. In like manner, the extinct Eden Tata of South America are closely allied to the living anteaters, sloths, and armadillos. So, too, the indigenous flora and fauna of islands lying near continents always resemble the flora and fauna of the continents near which they lie. The Galapagos Archipelago, distant some 500 miles from the coast of Ecuador, has a fauna which, though generically distinct from all others, is yet South American in type, and closely resembles the fauna of Ecuador. Again, among the animals living on the different islands of this group, we find specific diversity along with generic identity. On the Darwinian theory, this is just what might be expected. The long isolation of the archipelago from the continent has given opportunity for the rise of generic divergences between their once homogeneous faunas. While the briefer isolation of the several islands from each other has been attended by slighter or specific divergences, and, as if to complete by contrast the force of example, we find that the only animals on the archipelago which are not generically different from their allies on the continent are birds able to fly back and forth over the intervening sea. Unless the Darwinian theory be true, these striking relations not only become meaningless, but it is difficult to see why any discernible relations at all should exist between these neighboring faunas. To cite all the confirmatory facts of this sort would be to write an exhaustive account of the distribution of plants and animals. In examining the geological record in general, we are struck with its corroboration of the above-cited testimony of classification and embryology. For instance, as we go back in time, we find families and orders drawing more and more closely together. We find earlier forms less specialized than their successors, and, as we now have embryonic birds with rudimentary teeth in their beaks, so we find that formerly adult birds with such teeth existed. It is one of the most significant truths of paleontology that extinct forms are generally intercalary between forms now existing so that not only genera and families, but even orders of contemporary animals are every now and then fused together by the discovery of extinct intermediate forms. It is in this way that the Cuvarian orders of pachyderms and ruminants have come to be ranked as a single order, the horse and the pig being connected by numerous fossil links with the camel and the antelope. Until quite lately, there has been less success in the attempt to find a perfect series of transitional forms connecting some well-known animal with its generically different ancestor. But the argument heretofore used against the Darwinian theory, on the ground of this imperfect success, was at best a weak one, as resting merely upon the absence of evidence which further discovery might furnish at any moment. The Darwinian might candidly urge that his failure was due partly to the fragmentary character of the geological record in which there is no reason for supposing that more than one form out of a hundred has been preserved, and partly to the fact that only a small portion of the Earth's surface has been explored by the paleontologist, and that portion but superficially. The justice of such a plea is rendered apparent while the hostile argument is completely silenced by the recent discoveries of Professor Marsh as to the paleontological history of the ancestors of the horse. As these discoveries have just been well described in Professor Huxley's admirable lectures in New York, a brief mention here will suffice to show their import. One of the most striking peculiarities of the equine genus, including the horse, ass, zebra, and quagga, is the modification of the limbs, so that what appears to be the horse's foreknee is really his wrist, and what in the hind limb looks like a reversed knee is really his heel, while the lower halves of the legs are really feet terminating in the middle toe, armed with its nail, which we call the hoof. The two adjacent toes are represented only by splint bones on either side of the middle metacarpal, or metatarsal, and the radius and ulna in the forelimb, as well as the tibia and fibula in the hind limb, are almost completely fused together. Now, according to the Darwinian theory, such a highly specialized animal as the horse must be descended from a less specialized mammal, in which the limbs were like ordinary mammalian limbs, ending in ordinary feet with five separate toes each. The embryology of the horse points to this conclusion, and here, as usual, but with unwanted emphasis, paleontology confirms the inference. Already in Europe had been found the three-toed hipparion, in which the two side toes were like dew claws, 
and the older Anchitherium, in which all three toes were complete. But the discoveries of Professor Marsh have set before us a much more perfect series. Going back in time as we reach the upper Pliocene, the horse disappears, and we find the Pliohippus, very much like him. In the lower Pliocene, this creature is replaced by the Protohippus, with three toes like the Hipparion. Or in the upper Miocene, we have the Meohippus, with three well-developed toes, like the Anchitherium, and with the rudiment of a foretoe on the forefoot. In the Mesohippus of the lower Miocene, this rudiment is a sprint bone, like those which represent the later disappearing toes in the modern horse. By this time, we find the ulna and fibula well-developed and distinct from the radius and tibia. Still further back, in the upper Eocene, comes the orohippus, with four complete toes on the forefoot. And finally, in the lower Eocene, we get the eohippus, which shows the rudiment of a fifth toe on the front and a fourth toe on the hind foot. In the structure of the teeth, the other chief point in which the modern horse is notably specialized, we find a similar gradation back to the ordinary mammalian type. The agreement of observed facts with requirements of theory is here complete, minute, and specific. And Professor Huxley may well say that the history of the descent of the horse from a five-toed mammal, as thus demonstrated, supplies all that was required to complete the proof of the Darwinian theory. The theory not only alleges a vera causa, and is not only confirmed by the unanimous important facts of classification, embryology, morphology, distribution, and succession, but it has further succeeded in tracing the actual origination of one generic type from another through gradual descent with modifications. And thus, within a score of years from its first announcement, the daring hypothesis of Mr. Darwin may fairly claim to be regarded as one of the established truths of science. December. 1876. End of Darwin Verified from Darwinism and Other Essays by John Fisk, 1842 to 1901. Recorded by Bradley Haig. The Dred Scott Decision, read from Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 2, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in November 2015. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4 The Dred Scott Decision deep and widespread as hitherto had been the slavery agitation created by the repeal of the missouri compromise and by the consequent civil war in kansas an event entirely unexpected to the public at large suddenly doubled its intensity this was the announcement two days after buchanan's inauguration of the decision of the supreme court of the united states in the dred scott case this celebrated case had arisen as follows two or three years before the nebraska bill was thought of a suit was begun by a negro named dred scott in a local court in st louis missouri to recover the freedom of himself and his family from slavery he alleged that his master one dr emerson an army surgeon living in missouri had taken him as his slave to the military post at rock island in the state of illinois and afterwards to fort snelling situated in what was originally upper louisiana but was at that time part of wisconsin territory and now forms part of minnesota while at this latter post dred scott with his master's consent married a colored woman also brought as a slave from missouri and of this marriage two children were born all this happened between the years eighteen thirty four and eighteen thirty eight afterwards dr emerson brought dred scott and his family back to missouri in this suit they now claimed freedom because during the time of residence with their master at these military posts slavery was there prohibited by positive law namely at rock island by the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven and later by the constitution of illinois at fort snelling by the missouri compromise acts of eighteen twenty and other acts of congress relating to wisconsin territory 
the local court in st louis before which this action was brought appears to have made short work of the case it had become settled legal doctrine by lord mansfield's decision in the somerset case rendered four years before our declaration of independence that quote, the state of slavery is of such a nature that it is incapable of being introduced on any reasons moral or political but only positive law it is so odious that nothing can be suffered to support it but positive law End quote the learned chief justice therefore ordered that somerset being claimed as a virginia slave brought by his master into england when it was attempted to carry him away against his will should be discharged from custody or restraint because there was no positive law in england to support slavery the doctrine was subsequently modified by another english chief justice lord stowell in eighteen twenty seven to the effect that absence of positive law to support slavery in england only operates to suspend the master's authority which is revived if the slave voluntarily returns into an english colony where slavery does exist by positive law the states of the union naturally inherited and retained the common law of england and the principles and maxims of english jurisprudence not necessarily abrogated by the change of government and among others this doctrine of lord mansfield unlike england however where there was no slavery and no law for or against it some of the american states had positive laws establishing slavery others positive laws prohibiting it lord mansfield's doctrine therefore enlarged and strengthened by american statutes and decisions had come to be substantially this slavery being contrary to natural right exists only by virtue of local law if the master takes his slave for permanent residence into a jurisdiction where slavery is prohibited the slave thereby acquires a right to his freedom everywhere on the other hand lord stowell's doctrine was similarly enlarged and strengthened so as to allow the master right of transit and temporary sojourn in free states and territories without suspension or forfeiture of his authority over the slave under the complex american system of government in which the federal union and the several states each claim sovereignty and independent action within certain limitations it became the theory and practice that towards each other the several states occupied an attitude of foreign nations which relation was governed by international law and that the principle of comity alone controlled the recognition and enforcement by any state of the law of any other state under this theory the courts of slave states had generally accorded freedom to slaves even when acquired by the laws of a free state and reciprocally the courts of free states had enforced the master's right to his slave where that right depended on the laws of a slave state in this spirit and conforming to this established usage the local court of missouri declared dred scott and his family free the claimant loath to lose these four human chattels carried the case to the supreme court of the state of missouri where at its march term eighteen fifty two it was reversed and the decree rendered that these negroes were not entitled to freedom three judges formed the court and two of them joined in an opinion bearing internal evidence that it was prompted not by considerations of law and justice but by a spirit of retaliation growing out of the ineradicable antagonism of freedom and slavery Quote, every state says the opinion has the right of determining how far in a spirit of comity it will respect the laws of other states those laws have no intrinsic right to be enforced beyond the limits of the state for which they are enacted the respect allowed them will depend altogether on their conformity to the policy of our institutions no state is bound to carry into effect enactments conceived in a spirit hostile to that which pervades her own laws it is a humiliating spectacle to see the courts of a state confiscating the property of her own citizens by the command of a foreign law times now are not as they were when the former decisions on this subject were made 
since then not only individuals but states have been possessed with a dark and fell spirit in relation to slavery whose gratification is sought in the pursuit of measures whose inevitable consequence must be the overthrow and destruction of our government under such circumstances it does not behoove the state of missouri to show the least countenance to any measure which might gratify this spirit she is willing to assume her full responsibility for the existence of slavery within her limits nor does she seek to share or divide it with others End quote. to this partisan bravado the third judge replied with a dignified rebuke in his dissenting opinion he said quote, as citizens of a slave-holding state we have no right to complain of our neighbors of illinois because they introduce into their state constitution a prohibition of slavery nor has any citizen of missouri who removes with his slave to illinois a right to complain that the fundamental law of the state to which he removes and in which he makes his residence dissolves the relation between him and his slave it is as much his own voluntary act as if he had executed a deed of emancipation there is with me nothing in the law relating to slavery which distinguishes it from the law on any other subject or allows any more accommodation to the temporary public excitements which are gathered around it in this state it has been recognized from the beginning of the government as a correct position in law that a master who takes his slave to reside in a state or territory where slavery is prohibited thereby emancipates his slave citing cases but the supreme court of missouri so far from standing alone on this question is supported by the decisions of other slave states including those in which it may be supposed that there was the least disposition to favor emancipation citing cases times may have changed public feeling may have changed but principles have not and do not change and in my judgment there can be no safe basis for judicial decision but in those principles which are immutable End quote. these utterances it must be remembered occurred in the year eighteen fifty two when all slavery agitation was supposed to have been forever settled they show conclusively that the calm was superficial and delusive and that this deep reaching contest was still as before the adjustment of eighteen fifty actually transforming the various institutions of society gradually and as yet unnoticed by the public the motives disclosed in these opinions were beginning to control courts of justice and popular discussion and excitement were not only shaping legislation but changing the tenor of legal decisions throughout the country not long after the judgment by the supreme court of missouri dred scott and his family were sold to a man named sanford who was a citizen of new york this circumstance afforded a ground for bringing a similar action in a federal tribunal and accordingly dred scott once more sued for freedom in the united states circuit court at st louis the case was tried in may eighteen fifty four and a decree rendered that they quote, were negro slaves the lawful property end quote, of sanford as a final effort to obtain justice they appealed by writ of error to the supreme court of the united states the highest judicial tribunal of the nation before this court of last resort the case was argued a first time in the spring of eighteen fifty six the country had been for two years in a blaze of political excitement civil war was raging in kansas congress was in a turmoil of partisan discussion a presidential election was impending and the whole people were anxiously noting the varying phrases of party politics few persons knew there was such a thing as the dred scott case on the docket of the supreme court but those few appreciated the importance of the points it involved and several distinguished lawyers volunteered to take part in the argument two questions were presented to the court first is dred scott a citizen entitled to sue secondly did his residence at rock island and at fort snelling under the various prohibitions of slavery existing there work his freedom the supreme court was composed of nine justices namely chief justice tanney and associate justices mclean wayne catron daniel nelson greer curtis and campbell 
there was at once manifested among the judges not only a lively interest in the questions presented but a wide difference of views as to the manner of treating them consultations of the supreme court are always shrouded in inviolable secrecy but the opinions afterwards published indicate that the political aspects of slavery which were then convulsing the country from the very first found a certain sympathy and reflection in these grave judicial deliberations the discussion yet turned upon certain merely technical rules to be applied to the pleadings under review and ostensibly to give time for further examination the case was postponed and a re-argument ordered for the next term it may however be suspected that the nearness of the presidential election had more to do with this postponement than did the exigencies of the law the presidential election came and mr buchanan was chosen soon after the court met to begin its long winter term and about the middle of december eighteen fifty six the dred scott case was once more elaborately argued again occupying the attention of the court for four successive days as it had also done in the first hearing the eminent counsel after passing lightly over mere technical subtleties discussed very fully what was acknowledged to be the leading point in the controversy namely whether congress had power under the constitution to prohibit slavery in the federal territories as it had done by the missouri compromise act and various other laws it was precisely the policy or impolicy of this and similar prohibitions which formed the subject of contention in party politics the question of their constitutional validity was certain to take even a higher rank in public interest when after the second argument the judges took up the case in conference for decision the majority held that the judgment of the missouri federal tribunal should simply be affirmed on its merits in conformity to this view justice nelson was instructed to prepare an opinion to be read as the judgment of the supreme court of the united states such a paper was thereupon duly written by him of the following import it was a question he thought whether a temporary residence in a free state or territory could work the emancipation of a slave it was the exclusive province of each state by its legislature or courts of justice to determine this question for itself this determined the federal courts were bound to follow the state's decision the supreme court of missouri had decided dred scott to be a slave in two cases tried since the same judgment had been given though former decisions had been otherwise this must now be admitted as the settled law of the state which he said is conclusive of the case of this court this very narrow treatment of the points at issue having to do with the mere lifeless machinery of the law was strikingly criticized in the dissenting opinion afterwards read by justice mclean a part of which by way of anticipation may properly be quoted here he denied that it was exclusively a missouri question Quote, it involves a right claimed under an act of congress and the constitution of illinois and which cannot be decided without the consideration and construction of those laws rights sanctioned for twenty-eight years ought not and cannot be repudiated with any semblance of justice by one or two decisions influenced as declared by a determination to counteract the excitement against slavery in the free states having the same rights of sovereignty as the state of missouri in adopting a constitution i can perceive no reason why the institutions of illinois should not receive the same consideration as those of missouri the missouri court disregards the express provisions of an act of congress and the constitution of a sovereign state both of which laws for twenty-eight years it had not only regarded but carried into effect if a state court may do this on a question involving the liberty of a human being what protection do the laws afford End quote. had the majority of the judges carried out their original intention and announced their decision in the form in which justice nelson under their instruction wrote it the case of dred scott would after a passing notice have gone to a quiet sleep under the dust of the law libraries a far different fate was in store for it the nation was then being stirred to its very foundation by the slavery agitation 
the party of pro-slavery reaction was for the moment in the ascendant and as by an irresistible impulse the supreme court of the united states was swept from its hitherto impartial judicial moorings into the dangerous seas of politics before judge nelson's opinion was submitted to the judges in conference for final adoption as the judgment of the court a movement seems to have taken place among the members not only to change the ground of the decision but also greatly to enlarge the field of inquiry it is stated by one of the participants in that memorable transaction justice campbell that this occurred quote, upon a motion of mr justice wayne who stated that the case had created public interest and expectation that it had been twice argued and that an impression existed that the questions argued would be considered in the opinion of the court End quote. He further says that, quote, the apprehension has been expressed by others of the court that the court would not fulfill a public expectation or discharge its duties by maintaining silence upon these questions, and my impression is that several opinions had already been begun among the members of the court in which a full discussion of the case was made before Justice Wayne made this proposal, End quote the exact time when this movement was begun cannot now be ascertained the motives which prompted it can be inferred by recalling contemporaneous political events a great controversy divided public opinion whether slavery might be extended or should be restricted the missouri compromise had been repealed to make such an extension possible the term of that repeal was purposely couched in ambiguous language kansas and nebraska were left perfectly free to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way subject only to the constitution of the united states End quote. whether under the constitution slavery could be excluded from the federal territories was affirmed by northern and denied by southern democrats northern and southern democrats acting together in the cincinnati national convention had ingeniously avoided any solution of this difference a twofold interpretation had enabled that party to elect mr buchanan not by its own popular strength but by the division of its opponents notwithstanding its momentary success unless it could develop new sources of strength the party had only a precarious hold upon power its majority in the senate was waning in kansas free state immigration was outstripping the south in numbers and checkmating her in border strife according to the existing relative growth in sectional representation and sectional sentiment the balance of power was slowly but steadily passing to the north out of this doubt and difficulty there was one pathway that seemed easy and certain all the individual utterances from the democratic party agreed that the meaning of the words subject to the constitution was a question for the courts this was the original compact between northern and southern democrats in caucus when douglas consented to repeal douglas shorn of his prestige by his defeat for the presidential nomination must accept conditions from his successful rival the dred scott case afforded the occasion for a decision of the nine judges on the supreme bench seven were democrats and of these five were appointed from slave states a better opportunity for the south to obtain a favorable dictum could never be expected to arise a declaration by the supreme court of the united states that under the constitutional congress possessed no power to prohibit slavery in the federal territories would by a single breath end the old and begin a new political era congress was in session and the political leaders were assembled at washington political topics excluded all other conversation or thought politics reddened the plains of kansas politics had recently desecrated the senate chamber with a murderous personal assault politics contended greedily for the spoils of a new administration politics nursed a tacit conspiracy to nationalize slavery the slavery sentiment ruled society ruled the senate ruled the executive mansion it is not surprising that this universal influence flowed in at the one door of the national hall of justice that it filtered through the very walls which surrounded the consulting room of the supreme court the judges were after all but men they dined they talked they exchanged daily personal and social courtesies with the political world 
curiosity friendship patriotism led them to the floors of congress to listen to the great debates official ceremony called them into the presence of the president of legislators of diplomats they were feasted flattered questioned reminded of their great opportunity tempted with the suggestion of their supreme authority footnote four a striking example may be found in the utterance of attorney general caleb cushing of the retiring pierce administration in a little parting address to the supreme court march fourth eighteen fifty seven Quote, yours is not the guaranteed hand of the soldier nor yours the voice which commands armies rules cabinets or leads senates but though you are none of these yet you are backed by all of them theirs is the external power which sustains your moral authority you are the incarnate mind of the political body of the nation in the complex institutions of our country you are the pivot point upon which the rights and liberties of all government and people alike turn or rather you are the central light of constitutional wisdom around which they perpetually revolve long may this court retain the confidence of our country as the great conservators not of the private peace only but of the sanctity and integrity of the constitution End quote published in the national intelligencer march fifth eighteen fifty seven and footnote they could render their names illustrious they could honor their states they could do justice to the south they could perpetuate their party they could settle the slavery question they could end sectional hatred extinguish civil war preserve the union save their country advanced age physical feebleness party bias the political ardor of the youngest and the satiety of the eldest all conspired to draw them under the insidious influence of such considerations one of the judges in official language frankly avowed the motive and object of the majority of the court Quote, this case he wrote involves private rights of value and constitutional principles of the highest importance about which there had become such a difference of opinion that the peace and harmony of the country required the settlement of them by judicial decision this language betrays the confusion of ideas and misconception of authority which tempted the judges beyond their proper duty required only to decide a question of private rights they thrust themselves forward to sit as umpires in a quarrel of parties and factions in an evil hour they yielded to the demands of public interest and resolved to fulfill public expectation justice wayne proposed that the chief justice should write an opinion on all of the questions as the opinion of the court this was assented to some reserving to themselves to qualify their assent as the opinion might require others of the court proposed to have no question save one discussed the extraordinary proceeding was calculated to touch the pride of justice nelson he appears to have given it a kind of sullen acquiescence Quote, i was not present he wrote when the majority decided to change the ground of the decision and assigned the preparation of the opinion to the chief justice and when advised of the change i simply gave notice that i should read the opinion i had prepared as my own and which is the one on file End quote. from this time the pens of other judges were busy and in the inner political circles of washington the case of dred scott gradually became a shadowy and portentous cause celebre the first intimation which the public at large had of the coming new dictum was given in mr buchanan's inaugural the fact that he did not contemplate such an announcement until his arrival in washington leads to the inference that it was prompted from high quarters in congressional and popular discussions the question of the moment was at what period in the growth of a territory its voters might exclude or establish slavery referring to this mr buchanan said Quote, it is a judicial question which legitimately belongs to the supreme court of the united states before whom it is now pending and will it is understood be speedily and finally settled to their decision in common with all good citizens i shall cheerfully submit whatever this may be End quote. the popular acquiescence being thus invoked by the presidential voice and example the court announced its decision two days afterwards 
march sixth eighteen fifty seven the essential character of the transaction impressed itself upon the very form of the judgment if indeed it may be called at all by that name chief justice tanney read the opinion of the court justices nelson wayne daniel greer catron and campbell each read a separate and individual opinion agreeing with the chief justice on some points and omitting or disagreeing on others or arriving at the same result by different reasoning and in the same manner differing from one another the two remaining associate justices mclean and curtis read emphatic dissenting opinions thus the collective utterance of the bench resembled the speeches of a town meeting rather than the decision of a court and employed two hundred and forty printed pages of learned legal disquisition to order the simple dismissal of a suit the opinion read by chief justice tanney was long and elaborate and the following were among its leading conclusions that the declaration of independence and the constitution of the united states do not include nor refer to negroes otherwise than as property that they cannot become citizens of the united states nor sue in the federal courts that dred scott's claim to freedom by reason of his residence in illinois was a missouri question which missouri law had decided against him that the constitution of the united states recognizes slaves as property and pledges the federal government to protect it and that the Missouri Compromise Act and like prohibitory laws are unconstitutional. That the Circuit Court of the United States has no jurisdiction in the case and could give no judgment in it, and must be directed to dismiss the suit. This remarkable decision challenged the attention of the whole people to a degree never before excited by any act of their courts of law multiplied editions were at once printed scattered broadcast over the land read with the greatest avidity and earnestly criticized the public sentiment regarding it immediately divided generally on existing party lines the south and the democrats accepting and commending the north and the republicans spurning and condemning it the great anti-slavery public was not slow in making a practical application of its dogmas that a sweeping and revolutionary exposition of the constitution had been attempted when confessedly the case and question had no right to be in court that an evident partisan dictum of national judges had been built on an avowed partisan decision of state judges that both the legislative and judicial authority of the nation had been trifled with that the settler's sovereignty in kansas consisted only of the southern planter's right to bring his slaves there and that if under the property theory the constitution carries slaves to the territories it would by the same inevitable logic carry it into free states but much more offensive to the northern mind than his conclusions of law were the language and historical assertions by which chief justice tanney strove to justify them Quote, in the opinion of the court said he the legislation and histories of the times and the language used in the declaration of independence show that neither the class of persons who had been imported as slaves nor their descendants whether they had become free or not were then acknowledged as a part of the people nor intended to be included in the general words used in that memorable instrument it is difficult at this day to realize the state of public opinion in relation to that unfortunate race which prevailed in the civilized and enlightened portions of the world at the time of the declaration of independence and when the constitution of the united states was framed and adopted but the public history of every european nation displays it in a manner too plain to be mistaken they had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race either in social or political relations and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that the negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit he was bought and sold and treated as an ordinary article of merchandise and traffic whenever a profit could be made by it End quote. quoting the provisions of several early slave codes he continued quote, 
they show that a perpetual and impassable barrier was intended to be erected between the white race and the one which they had reduced to slavery and governed as subjects with absolute and despotic power and which they then looked upon as so far below them in the scale of created beings that intermarriages between white persons and negroes or mulattoes were regarded as unnatural and immoral and punished as crimes not only in the parties but in the person who joined them in marriage and no distinction in this respect was made between the free negro or mulatto and the slave but this stigma of the deepest degradation was fixed upon the whole race End quote. referring to the phrase in the declaration of independence which asserts that all men are created equal he remarked quote, the general words above quoted would seem to embrace the whole human family and if they were used in a similar instrument at this day would be so understood but it is too clear for dispute that the enslaved african race were not intended to be included and formed no part of the people who framed and adopted this declaration for if the language as understood in that day would embrace them the conduct of the distinguished men who framed the declaration of independence would have been utterly and flagrantly inconsistent with the principles they asserted and instead of the sympathy of mankind to which they so confidently appealed they would have deserved and received universal rebuke and reprobation End quote. he then applied the facts thus assumed as follows quote, the only two provisions which point to them and include them treat them as property and make it the duty of the government to protect it no other power in relation to this race is to be found in the constitution no one we presume supposes that any change in public opinion or feeling in relation to this unfortunate race in the civilized nations of europe or in this country should induce the court to give to the words of the constitution a more liberal construction in their favor than they were intended to bear when the instrument was framed and adopted it is not only the same in words but the same in meaning and delegates the same powers to the government and reserves and secures the same rights and privileges to the citizen and as long as it continues to exist in its present form it speaks not only in the same words but with the same meaning and intent with which it spoke when it came from the hands of its framers and was voted on and adopted by the people of the united states End quote this cold and pitiless historical delineation of the bondage ignorance and degradation of the unfortunate kidnapped africans and their descendants in a bygone century as an immutable basis of constitutional interpretation was met by loud and indignant protest from the north the people and press of that section seized upon the salient phrase of the statement and applying it in the present tense accused the chief justice with saying that quote, a negro has no rights which a white man is bound to respect end quote this was certainly a distortion of his exact words and meaning yet the exaggeration was more than half excusable in view of the literal and unbending rigor with which he proclaimed the constitutional disability of the entire african race in the united states and denied their birthright in the declaration of independence his unmerciful logic made the black before the law less than a slave it reduced him to the status of a horse or a dog a bale of dry goods or a block of stone against such a debasement of any living image of the divine maker the resentment of the public conscience of the north was quick and unsparing had chief justice tanney's delineation been historically correct it would have been nevertheless unwise and unchristian to embody it in the form of a disqualifying legal sentence and an indelible political brand but its manifest untruth was clearly shown by justice curtis in his dissenting opinion he reminded the chief justice that at the adoption of the constitution quote, in five of the thirteen original states colored persons then possessed the elective franchise and were among those by whom the constitution was ordained and established if so it is not true in point of fact that the constitution was made exclusively by the white race and that it was made exclusively for the white race is in my opinion not only an assumption not warranted by anything in the constitution but contradicted by its opening declaration that it was ordained and established by the people of the united states for themselves and their posterity 
and as free colored persons were then citizens of at least five states and so in every sense part of the people of the united states they were among those for whom and whose posterity the constitution was ordained and established End quote. elsewhere in the same opinion he said Quote, I shall not enter into any examination of the existing opinions of that period respecting the African race, nor into any discussion concerning the meaning of those who asserted in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness my own opinion is that a calm comparison of these assertions of universal abstract truths and of their own individual opinions and acts would not leave these men under any reproach of inconsistency that the great truths they asserted on that solemn occasion they were ready and anxious to make effectual wherever a necessary regard to circumstances which no statesman can disregard without producing more evil than good would allow and that it would not be just to them nor true in itself to allege that they intended to say that the creator of all men had endowed the white race exclusively with the great natural rights which the declaration of independence asserts End quote. justice mclean in his dissenting opinion completed the outline of the true historical picture in accurate language quote, i prefer the lights of madison hamilton and jay as a means of construing the constitution in all its bearings rather than to look behind that period into the traffic which is now declared to be piracy and punished with death by christian nations i do not like to draw the sources of our domestic relations from so dark a ground our independence was a great epoch in the history of freedom and while i admit the government was not made especially for the colored race yet many of them were citizens of the new england states and exercised the rights of suffrage when the constitution was adopted and it was not doubted by any intelligent person that its tendencies would greatly ameliorate their condition many of the states on the adoption of the constitution or shortly afterwards took measures to abolish slavery within their respective jurisdictions and it is a well-known fact that a belief was cherished by the leading men south as well as north that the institution of slavery would gradually decline until it would become extinct the increased value of slave labor in the culture of cotton and sugar prevented the realization of this expectation like all other communities and states the south were influenced by what they considered to be their own interests but if we are to turn our attention to the dark ages of the world why confine our view to colored slavery on the same principles white men were made slaves all slavery has its origin in power and is against right End quote to the constitutional theory advanced by the chief justice that congress cannot exercise sovereign powers over federal territories and hence cannot exclude slave property from them justices mclean and curtis also opposed a vigorous and exhaustive argument which the most eminent lawyers and statesmen of that day deemed conclusive the historical precedents alone ought to have determined the issue Quote, the judicial mind of this country state and federal said mclean has agreed on no subject within its legitimate action with equal unanimity as on the power of congress to establish territorial governments no court state or federal no judge or statesman is known to have had any doubts on this question for nearly sixty years after the power was exercised End quote. and curtis added quote, here are eight distinct instances beginning with the first congress and coming down to the year eighteen forty eight in which congress has excluded slavery from the territory of the united states and six distinct instances in which congress organized governments of territories by which slavery was recognized and continued beginning also with the first congress and coming down to the year eighteen twenty two these acts were severally signed by seven presidents of the united states beginning with general washington and coming regularly down as far as mr john quincy adams thus including all who were in public life when the constitution was adopted 
if the practical construction of the constitution contemporaneously with its going into effect by men intimately acquainted with its history from their personal participation in framing and adopting it and continued by them through a long series of acts of the gravest importance be entitled to weigh in the judicial mind on a question of construction it would seem to be difficult to resist the force of the acts above averted to End quote. End of the Dred Scott Decision by John G. Nicolay and John Hay John Faust, or Fust, from a General Biographical Dictionary by John D. Gordon and Henry George Bone Published 1851 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. John Faust, or Fust, a goldsmith of mints, one of the three artists to whom the invention of printing is generally ascribed. It is, however, doubtful he did more than advance money to Gutenberg, who had previously made some attempts with carved blocks at Strasbourg. The third person concerned was Schaefer, who married the daughter of Faust, and who is allowed the honor of having invented punches and matrices, by means of which this grand art was carried to perfection. The first fruits of the new process was Durande Rationale Divinorum Officiorum, published by Faust and Schaefer in 1459, which was followed some years after by the Catholicon Johannes Janunzus after which in fourteen sixty two succeeded the bible so much sought for by those fond of early specimens of typography these works were however preceded by a bible psalter and other books executed with characters engraved on wood and by a mechanism which faust and schaefer possessed in common with gutenberg it has been pretended that when Faust went to Paris to sell a second edition of his Bible in 1462, he was taken up on the supposition that he had effected the printing of them by magic. But this story appears to be mere fable. There is reason to believe that he died of the plague in 1466, as the name of Schaeffer alone is found in the books printed after that time at Mentz according to certain german writers the celebrated romance of dr faustus the subject of so much traditionary horror and admiration and which has been since immortalized by the genius of goethe originated in the malice of the monks towards faust whose employment of printing deprived them of their gain as copiers that occupation being almost exclusively in their hands there seems however so little connection between the birthplace profession etc of the real and supposititious faustus that the conjecture is possibly founded only on the similarity of the name accidentally given to one of the legendary characters of the period end of john faust or fust from a general biographical dictionary Letter to C. E. Norton, Esquire, Downing Street, June twenty third, eighteen fifty eight, by Arthur Hugh Clough. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I have had mirabile dictu a letter from emerson who reprimanded me strongly for the termination of the amours de voyage in which he may be right and i may be wrong and all my defence can only be that i always meant it to be so and began it with the full intention of its ending so but very likely i was wrong all the same i cannot help wishing to preserve some corporate body or privy council for india to elect half the minister's council though i have no liking for the constituency of seven thousand or eight thousand to whom lord stanley did propose to give this power last night i heard tennyson read a third arthur poem the detection of guinevere and the last interview with arthur 
these poems all appear to me to be maturer and better than any he has written hitherto as for wars and rumours of wars i trust we need not alarm ourselves at present i hope the french are at heart pacific they cannot well afford the money for a war and though i believe they might inflict if the chances favoured them immense damage upon us in the end they would find themselves the weaker vessels their population it is said by the statistical authorities is decreasing and they ought to nurse their vitality carefully it has not yet recovered the losses of the wars of eighteen twelve to fifteen end of letter to c e norton esq downing street june twenty third eighteen fifty eight by arthur hugh clough Chapter 18 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe, compiled from her letters and journals by her son, Charles Edward Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 18, Old Town Folks, 1869, covering Professor Stowe, the original of harry in old town folks professor stowe's letter to george eliot her remarks on the same professor stowe's narrative of his youthful adventures in the world of spirits professor stowe's influence on mrs stowe's literary life and george eliot on old town folks this biography would be signally incomplete without some mention of the birth childhood early associations and very peculiar and abnormal psychological experiences of professor stowe aside from the fact of dr stowe's being mrs stowe's husband and for this reason entitled to notice in any sketch of her life however meagre he is the original of the visionary boy in old town folks and old town fireside stories embody the experiences of his childhood and youth among the grotesque and original characters of his native town march twenty sixth eighteen eighty two professor stowe wrote the following characteristic letter to mrs lewes i e george eliot mrs lewes i fully sympathize with you in your disgust with hume and the professing mediums generally hume spent his boyhood in my father's native town among my relatives and acquaintances and he was a disagreeable nasty boy but he certainly has qualities which science has not yet explained and some of his doings are as real as they are strange my interest in the subject of spiritualism arises from the fact of my own experience more than sixty years ago in my early childhood i then never thought of questioning the objective reality of all i saw and supposed that everybody else had the same experience of what this experience was you may gain some idea from certain passages in old town folks the same experiences continue yet but with serious doubts as to the objectivity of the scenes exhibited i have noticed that people who have remarkable and minute answers to prayer such as stilling frank lavater are for the most part of this peculiar temperament is it absurd to suppose that some peculiarity in the nervous system in the connecting link between soul and body may bring some more than others into an almost abnormal contact with the spirit world for example jacob boehm and swedenborg and that too without correcting their faults or making them morally better than others allow me to say that i have always admired the working of your mind there is about it such a perfect uprightness and uncalculating honesty i think you are a better christian without church or theology than most people are with both though i am and always have been in the main a calvinist of the jonathan edwards school god bless you i have a warm side for mr lewes on account of his goethe labors goethe has been my admiration for more than forty years in eighteen thirty i got hold of his faust and for two gloomy dreary november days while riding through the woods of new hampshire in an old-fashioned stage-coach to enter upon a professorship in dartmouth college i was perfectly dissolved by it sincerely yours calvin ellis stowe 
in a letter to mrs stowe written june twenty fourth eighteen seventy two mrs lewes i e george eliot alludes to professor stowe's letter as follows quote, pray give my special thanks to the professor for his letter his handwriting which does really look like arabic a very graceful character surely happens to be remarkably legible to me and i did not hesitate over a single word some of the words as expressions of fellowship were very precious to me and i hold it very good of him to write to me that best sort of encouragement i was much impressed with the fact which you have told me that he was the original of the visionary boy in old town folks and it must be deeply interesting to talk with him on his experience perhaps i am inclined under the influence of the facts physiological and psychological which have been gathered of late years to give larger place to the interpretation of vision seeing as subjective than the professor would approve it seems difficult to limit at least to limit with any precision the possibility of confounding sense by impressions derived from inward conditions with those which are directly dependent on external stimulus in fact the division between within and without in this sense seems to become every year a more subtle and bewildering problem End quote in eighteen thirty four while mr stowe was a professor in lane theological seminary in cincinnati ohio he wrote out a history of his youthful adventures in the spirit world from which the following extracts are taken Quote, i have often thought i would communicate to some scientific physician a particular account of a most singular delusion under which i lived from my earliest infancy till the fifteenth or sixteenth year of my age and the effects of which remain very distinctly now that i am past thirty the facts are of such a nature as to be indelibly impressed upon my mind they appear to me to be curious and well worth the attention of the psychologist i regard the occurrences in question as the more remarkable because i cannot discover that i possess either taste or talent for fiction or poetry i have barely imagination enough to enjoy with a high degree of relish the works of others in this department of literature but have never felt able or disposed to engage in that sort of writing myself on the contrary my style has always been remarkable for its dry matter-of-fact plainness my mind has been distinguished for its quickness and adaptedness to historical and literary investigations for ardor and perseverance in pursuit of the knowledge of facts eine verstandisch rich tongue as the germans would say rather than for any other quality and the only talent of a higher kind which i am conscious of possessing is a turn for accurate observation of men and things and a certain broad humor and drollery from the hour of my birth i have been constitutionally feeble as were my parents before me and my nervous system easily excitable with care however i have kept myself in tolerable health and my life has been an industrious one for my parents were poor and i have always been obliged to labor for my livelihood with these preliminary remarks i proceed to the curious details of my psychological history as early as i can remember anything i can remember observing a multitude of animated and active objects which i could see with perfect distinctness moving about me and could sometimes though seldom hear them make a rustling noise or other articulate sounds but i could never touch them they were in all respects independent of the sense of touch and incapable of being obstructed in any way by the intervention of material objects i could see them at any distance and through any intervening object with as much ease and distinctness as if they were in the room with me and directly before my eyes i could see them passing through the floors and the ceilings and the walls of the house from one apartment to another in all directions without a door or a keyhole or crevice being open to admit them i could follow them with my eyes to any distance or directly through or just beneath the surface or up and down in the midst of boards and timbers and bricks or whatever else would stop the motion or intercept the visibleness of all other objects these appearances occasioned neither surprise nor alarm except when they assumed some hideous and frightful form or exhibited some menacing gesture for i became acquainted with them as soon as with any of the objects of sense 
as to the reality of their existence and the harmlessness of their character i knew no difference between them and any other of the objects which met my eye they were as familiar to me as the forms of my parents and my brother they made up a part of my daily existence and were as really the subjects of my consciousness as the little bench on which i sat in the corner by my mother's knee or the wheels and sticks and strings with which i amused myself upon the floor i indeed recognized a striking difference between them and the things which i could feel and handle but to me this difference was no more a matter of surprise than that which i observed between my mother and the black woman who so often came to work for her or between my infant brother and the little spotted dog brutus of which i was so fond there was no time or place or circumstance in which they did not occasionally make their appearance solitude and silence however were more favourable to their appearance than company and conversation they were more pleased with candlelight than the daylight they were most numerous distinct and active when i was alone and in the dark especially when my mother had laid me in bed and returned to her own room with the candle at such times i always expected the company of my aerial visitors and counted on it to amuse me till i dropped asleep whenever they failed to make their appearance as was sometimes the case i felt lonely and discontented i kept up a lively conversation with them not by language or by signs for the attempt on my part to speak or move would at once break the charm and drive them away in a fret but by a peculiar sort of spiritual intercommunion when their attention was directed towards me i could feel and respond to all their thoughts and feelings and was conscious that they could in the same manner feel and respond to mine sometimes they would take no notice of me but carry on a brisk conversation among themselves principally by looks and gestures with now and then an audible word in fact there were but few with whom i was very familiar these few were much more constant and uniform in their visits than the great multitude who were frequently changing and too much absorbed in their own concerns to think much of me i scarcely know how i can give an idea of their form and general appearance for there are no objects in the material world with which i can compare them and no language adapted to an accurate description of their peculiarities they exhibited all possible combinations of size shape proportion and color but their most usual appearance was with the human form and proportion but under a shadowy outline that seemed just ready to melt into the invisible air and sometimes liable to the most sudden and grotesque changes as with a uniform darkly bluish color spotted with brown or brownish white this was the general appearance of the multitude but there were many exceptions to this description particularly among my more welcome and familiar visitors as will be seen in the sequel besides these rational and generally harmless beings there was another set of objects which never varied in their form or qualities and were always mischievous and terrible the fact of their appearance depended very much on the state of my health and feelings if i was well and cheerful they seldom troubled me but when sick or depressed they were sure to obtrude their hateful presence upon me these were a sort of heavy clouds floating about overhead of a black colour spotted with brown in the shape of a very flaring inverted tunnel without a nozzle and from ten to thirty or forty feet in diameter they floated from place to place in great numbers and in all directions with a strong and steady progress but with a tremulous quivering internal motion that agitated them in every part whenever they approached the rational phantoms were thrown into great consternation and well it might be for if a cloud touched any part of one of the rational phantoms it immediately communicated its own colour and tremulous motion to the part it touched in spite of all the efforts and convulsive struggles of the unhappy victim this colour and motion slowly but steadily and uninterruptedly proceeded to diffuse itself over every part of the body and as fast as it did so the body was drawn into the cloud and became a part of its substance it was indeed a fearful sight to see the contortions the agonizing efforts of the poor creatures who had been touched by one of these awful clouds and were dissolving and melting into it by inches without the possibility of escape or resistance this was the only visible object that had the least power over the phantoms and this was evidently composed of the same material as themselves 
the forms and actions of all these phantoms varied very much with the state of my health and animal spirits but i never could discover that the surrounding material objects had any influence upon them except in this one particular namely if i saw them in a neat well-furnished room there was a neatness and polish in their form and motions and on the contrary if i was in an unfinished rough apartment there was a corresponding rudeness and roughness in my aerial visitors a corresponding difference was visible when i saw them in the woods or in the meadows upon the water or upon the ground or in the air or among the stars every different apartment which i occupied had a different set of phantoms and they always had a degree of correspondence to the circumstances in which they were seen it should be noted however that it was not so much the place where the phantoms themselves appeared to me to be that affected their forms and movements as the place in which i myself actually was while observing them the apparent locality of the phantoms it is true had some influence but my own actual locality had much more thus far i have attempted only a general outline of these curious experiences i will now proceed to a detailed account of several particular incidents for the sake of illustrating the general statements already made i select a few manifestations without number i am able to ascertain dates from the following circumstances i was born in april eighteen o two and my father died in july eighteen o eight after suffering for more than a year from a lingering organic disease between two or three years before his death we removed from the house in which i was born to another at a little distance from it what occurred therefore before my father's last sickness must have taken place during the first five years of my life and whatever took place before the removal of the family must have taken place during the first three years of my life before the removal of the family i slept in a small upper chamber in the front part of the house where i was generally alone for several hours in the evening and morning adjoining this room and opening into it by a very small door was a low dark narrow unfinished closet which was open on the other side into a ruinous old chaise house this closet was a famous place for the gambols of the phantoms but of their forms and actions i do not now retain any very distinct recollection i only remember that i was very careful not to do anything that i thought would be likely to offend them yet otherwise their presence caused me no uneasiness and was not at all disagreeable to me the first incident of which i have a distinct recollection was the following one night as i was lying alone in my chamber with my little dog brutus snoring beside my bed there came out of the closet a very large indian woman and a very small indian man with a huge bass veal between them the woman was dressed in a large loose black gown secured around her waist by a belt of the same material and on her head she wore a high dark gray fur cap shaped somewhat like a lady's muff ornamented with a row of covered buttons in front and open towards the bottom showing a red lining the man was dressed in a shabby black colored overcoat and a little round black hat that fitted closely to his head they took no notice of me but were rather ill-natured towards each other and seemed to be disputing for the possession of the bass viol the man snatched it away and struck upon it a few harsh hollow notes which i distinctly heard and which seemed to vibrate through my whole body with a strange stinging sensation the woman then took it and appeared to play very intently and much to her own satisfaction but without producing any sound that was perceptible by me they soon left the chamber and i saw them go down into the back kitchen where they sat and played and talked with my mother it was only when the man took the bow that i could hear the harsh abrupt disagreeable sounds of the instrument at length they arose went out of the back door and sprang upon a large heap of straw and unthreshed beans and disappeared with a strange rumbling sound this vision was repeated night after night with scarcely any variation while i lived in that house and once and once only after the family had removed to the other house the only thing that seemed to me unaccountable and that excited my curiosity was that there should be such a large heap of straw and beans before the door every night when i could see nothing of it in the daytime i frequently crept out of the bed and stole softly down into the kitchen and peeped out of the door to see if it was there very early in the morning 
i attempted to make some inquiries of my mother but as i was not as yet very skilful in the use of language i could get no satisfaction out of her answers and could see that my questions seemed to distress her at first she took little notice of what i said regarding it no doubt as the meaningless prattle of a thoughtless child my persistence however seemed to alarm her and i suppose that she feared for my sanity i soon desisted from asking anything further and shut myself more and more within myself one night very soon after the removal when the house was still and all the family were in bed these unearthly musicians once more made their appearance in the kitchen of the new house and after looking around peevishly and sitting with a discontented frown and in silence they arose and went out of the back door and sprang on a pile of corn stalks and i saw them no more our new dwelling was a low studded house of only one story and instead of an upper chamber i now occupied a bedroom that opened into the kitchen within this bedroom directly on the left hand of the door as you entered the kitchen was the staircase which led to the garret and as the room was unfinished some of the boards which enclosed the staircase were too short and left a considerable space between them and the ceiling one of these open spaces was directly in front of my bed so that when i lay upon my pillow my face was opposite to it every night after i had gone to bed and the candle was removed a very pleasant-looking human face would peer at me over the top of that board and gradually press forward his head neck shoulders and finally his whole body as far as the waist through the opening and then smiling upon me with great good nature would withdraw in the same manner in which he had entered he was a great favorite of mine for though we neither of us spoke we perfectly understood and were entirely devoted to each other it is a singular fact that the features of this favorite phantom bore a very close resemblance to those of a boy older than myself whom i feared and hated still the resemblance was so strong that i called him by the same name harvey harvey's visits were always expected and always pleasant but sometimes there were visitations of another sort odious and frightful one of these i will relate as a specimen of the rest one night after i had retired to bed and was looking for harvey i observed an unusual number of the tunnel-shaped tremulous clouds already described and they seemed intensely black and strongly agitated this alarmed me exceedingly and i had a terrible feeling that something awful was going to happen it was not long before i saw harvey at his accustomed place cautiously peeping at me through the aperture with an expression of pain and terror on his countenance he seemed to warn me to be on my guard but was afraid to put his head into the room lest he should be touched by one of the clouds which were every moment growing thicker and more numerous harvey soon withdrew and left me alone on turning my eyes toward the left-hand wall of the room i thought i saw at an immense distance below me the regions of the damned as i have heard them pictured in sermons from this awful world of horror the tunnel-shaped clouds were ascending and i perceived that they were the principal instruments of torture in these gloomy abodes these regions were at such an immense distance below me that i could obtain but a very indistinct view of the inhabitants who were very numerous and exceedingly active near the surface of the earth and as it seemed to me but a little distance from my bed i saw four or five sturdy resolute devils endeavoring to carry off an unprincipled and dissipated man in the neighborhood by the name of brown of whom i had stood in terror for years these devils i saw were very different from the common representations they had neither red faces nor horns nor hoofs nor tails they were in all respects stoutly built and well-dressed gentlemen the only peculiarity that i noted in their appearance was as to their heads their faces and necks were perfectly bare without hair or flesh and of a uniform sky-blue color like the ashes of burnt paper before it falls to pieces and of a certain glossy smoothness as i looked on full of eagerness the devil struggled to force brown down with him and brown struggled with the energy of desperation to save himself from their grip and it seemed that the human was likely to prove too strong for the infernal 
in this emergency one of the devils panting for breath and covered with perspiration beckoned to a strong thick cloud that seemed to understand him perfectly and whirling up to brown touched his hand brown resisted stoutly and struck out right and left at the cloud most furiously but the usual effect was produced the hand grew black quivered and seemed to be melting into the cloud then the arm by slow degrees and then the head and shoulders at this instant brown collecting all his energies for one desperate effort sprang at once into the centre of the cloud tore it asunder and descending to the ground exclaimed with a hoarse furious voice that grated on my ear there i've got out damn me if i haven't this was the first word that had been spoken through the whole horrible scene it was the first time i had ever seen a cloud fail to produce its appropriate result and it terrified me so that i trembled from head to foot the devils however did not seem to be in the least discouraged one of them who seemed to be the leader went away and quickly returned bringing with him an enormous pair of rollers fixed in an iron frame such as are used in iron mills for the purpose of rolling out and slitting bars of iron except instead of being turned by machinery each roller was turned by an immense crank three of the devils now seized brown and put his feet to the rollers while two others stood one at each crank and began to roll him in with a steady strain that was entirely irresistible not a word was spoken not a sound was heard but the fearful struggles and terrified agonizing looks of brown were more than i could endure i sprang from my bed and ran through the kitchen into the room where my parents slept and entreated that they would permit me to spend the remainder of the night with them after considerable parleying they assured me that nothing could hurt me and advised me to go back to bed i replied that i was not afraid of their hurting me but i couldn't bear to see them acting so with c brown pooh pooh you foolish boy replied my father sternly you've only been dreaming go right back to bed or i shall have to whip you knowing that there was no other alternative i trudged back through the kitchen with all the courage i could muster cautiously entered my room where i found everything quiet there being neither cloud nor devil nor anything of the kind to be seen and getting into bed i slept quietly till morning the next day i was rather sad and melancholy but kept all my troubles to myself through fear of brown this happened before my father's sickness and consequently between the four and six years of my age during my father's sickness and after his death i lived with my grandmother and when i had removed to her house i forever lost sight of harvey i still continued to sleep alone for the most part but in a neatly furnished upper chamber across the corner of the chamber opposite to and at a little distance from the head of my bed there was a closet in the form of an old-fashioned buffet after going to bed on looking at the door of this closet i could see at a great distance from it a pleasant meadow terminated by a beautiful little grove out of this grove and across this meadow a charming little female figure would advance about eight inches high and exquisitely proportioned dressed in a loose black silk robe with long smooth black hair parted up her head and hanging loose over her shoulders she would come forward with a slow and regular step becoming more distinctly visible as she approached nearer till she came even with the surface of the closet door when she would smile upon me raise her hands to her head and draw them down on each side of her face suddenly turn around and go off at a rapid trot the moment she turned i could see a good-looking mulatto man rather smaller than herself following directly in her wake and trotting off after her this was generally repeated two or three times before i went to sleep the features of the mulatto bore some resemblance to those of the indian man with the bass viol but were much more mild and agreeable i awoke one bright moonlight night and found a large full-length human skeleton of an ashy blue color in bed with me i screamed out with fright and soon summoned the family around me i refused to tell the cause of my alarm but begged permission to occupy another bed which was granted for the remainder of the night i slept but little but i saw upon the window stools companies of little fairies about six inches high in white robes gambling and dancing with incessant merriment two of them a male and female rather taller than the rest were dignified with a crown and sceptre 
they took the kindest notice of me smiled upon me with great benignity and seemed to assure me of their protection i was soothed and cheered by their presence though after all there was a sort of sinister and selfish expression in their countenances which prevented my placing implicit confidence in them up to this time i had never doubted the real existence of these phantoms nor had i ever suspected that other people had not seen them as distinctly as myself i now however began to discover with no little anxiety that my friends had little or no knowledge of the aerial beings among whom i have spent my whole life that my allusions to them were not understood and all complaints respecting them were laughed at i had never been disposed to say much about them and this discovery confirmed me in my silence it did not however affect my own belief or lead me to suspect that my imaginations were not realities during the whole of this period i took great pleasure in walking out alone particularly in the evening the most lonely fields the woods and the banks of the river and other places most completely secluded were my favorite resorts for there i could enjoy the sight of innumerable aerial beings of all sorts without interruption every object even every shaking leaf seemed to me to be animated by some living soul whose nature in some degree corresponded to its habitation i spent much of my life in these solitary rambles there were particular places to which i gave names and visited them at regular intervals moonlight was particularly agreeable to me but most of all i enjoyed a thick foggy night at times during these walks i would be excessively oppressed by an indefinite and deep feeling of melancholy without knowing why i would be so unhappy as to wish myself annihilated and suddenly it would occur to me that my friends at home were suffering some dreadful calamity and so vivid would be my impression that i would hasten home with all speed to see what had taken place at such seasons i felt a morbid love for my friends that would almost burn up my soul and yet at the least provocation from them i would fly into an uncontrollable passion and foam like a little fury i was called the dreadful tempered boy but the lord knows that i never occasioned pain to any animal whether human or brutal without suffering untold agonies in consequence of it i cannot even now without feelings of deep sorrow call to mind the alternate fits of corroding melancholy irritation and bitter remorse which i then endured these fits of melancholy were most constant and oppressive during the autumnal months i very early learned to read and soon became immoderately attached to books in the bible i read the first chapters of job and parts of ezekiel daniel and revelation with most intense delight and with such frequency that i could repeat large portions from memory long before the age at which boys in the country are usually able to read plain sentences the first large book besides the bible that i remember reading was morse's history of new england which i devoured with insatiable greediness particularly those parts which relate to indian wars and witchcraft I was in the habit of applying to my grandmother for explanations, and she would relate to me, while I listened with breathless attention, long stories from Mather's Magnalia, or Magnilli, as she used to call it, a work which I earnestly longed to read, but of which I never got sight till after my twentieth year. Very early there fell into my hands an old school book called The Art of Speaking, containing numerous extracts from Milton and Shakespeare there was little else in the book that interested me but these extracts from the two great english poets though there were many things in them that i did not well understand i read again and again with increasing pleasure at every perusal till i had nearly committed them to memory and almost thumbed the old book into nonentity but of all the books that i read at this period there was none that went to my heart like bunyan's pilgrim's progress i read it and re-read it night and day i took it to bed with me and hugged it to my bosom while i slept every different edition that i could find i seized upon and read with as eager a curiosity as if it had been a new story throughout and i read with the unspeakable satisfaction of most devoutly believing that everything which honest john related was a real verity an actual occurrence oh that i could read that most inevitable book once more with the same solemn conviction of its literal truth that i might once more enjoy the same untold ecstasy 
one other remark it seems proper to make before i proceed further to details the appearance and especially the motions of my aerial visitors were intimately connected either as cause or effect i can't determine which with certain sensations of my own their countenances generally expressed pleasure or pain complacence or anger according to the mood of my own mind if they moved from place to place without moving their limbs with that gliding motion appropriate to spirits i felt in my stomach that peculiar tickling sensation which accompanies a rapid progressive movement through the air and if they went off with an uneasy trot i felt an unpleasant jarring through my frame their appearance was always attended with considerable effort and fatigue on my part the more distinct and vivid they were the more would my fatigue be increased and at such times my face was always pale and my eyes unusually sparkling and wild this continued to be the case after i became satisfied that it was all a delusion of the imagination and it so continues to the present day End quote it is not surprising that mrs stowe should have felt herself impelled to give literary form to an experience so exceptional still more must this be the case when the early associations of this exceptional character were as amusing and interesting as they are shown forth in her old town fireside stories none of the incidents or characters embodied in those sketches are ideal the stories are told as they came from mr stowe's lips with little or no alteration sam lawson was a real character in eighteen seventy four mr whitter wrote to mrs stowe quote, i am not able to write or study much or read books that require thought without suffering but i have sam lawson lying at hand and as corporal trim said of yorick's sermon i like it hugely End quote the power and literary value of these stories lie in the fact that they are true to nature professor stowe was himself an inimitable mimic and story-teller no small portion of mrs stowe's success as a literary woman is to be attributed to him not only was he possessed of a bright quick mind but wonderful retentiveness of memory mrs stowe was never at a loss for reliable information on any subject as long as the professor lived he belonged to that extinct species the general scholar his scholarship was not critical in the modern sense of the word but in the main accurate in spite of his love for the marvellous it is not out of place to give a little idea of his power in character painting as it shows how suggestive his conversation and letters must have been to a mind like that of mrs stowe natick july fourteenth eighteen thirty nine i have had a real good time this week writing my oration I have strolled over my old walking places and found the same old stone walls, the same old footpaths through the rye fields, the same bends in the river, the same old bullfrogs with their green spectacles on, the same old terrapins sticking up their heads and bowing as I go by, and nothing was wanting but my wife to talk with me to make it all complete. I have had some rare talks with old Uncle Jaw Bacon and other old characters which you ought to have heard. The Curtises have been flooding Uncle Jaw's meadows, and he is in a great stew about it. He says, quote, I took and telled your Uncle Isaac to tell them mare Curtises that if the devil didn't get em for flowing my meadow out of that sort, I didn't see no use of having any devil. End quote. Have you talked with the Curtises yourself? Yes, hang the sarky dogs, and they took and telled me that they'd take and flow clean up to my front door and make me go out and in in a boat why don't you go to the law oh they keep altering and a tinkering up the laws so here in massachusetts that a body can't get no damage for flowing they think cold water can't hurt nobody End quote. mother and aunt nabby each keep separate establishments first aunt nabby gets up in the morning and examines the sink to see whether it leaks and rots the beam then she makes a little fire gets her little teapot of bright shining tin and puts into it a teaspoonful of black tea and so prepares her breakfast by this time mother comes creeping downstairs like an old tabby cat out of an ash hole and she kind of doubts and reckons whether or no she had better try to get any breakfast being as she's not much appetite this morning 
but she goes to the leg of bacon and cuts off a little slice reckons she'll broil it then goes and looks at the coffee pot and reckons she'll have a little coffee don't exactly know whether it's good for her but she don't drink much so while aunt nabby is sitting sipping her tea and munching her bread and butter with a matter-of-fact certainty and marvellous satisfaction mother goes doubting and reckoning round like mrs diffidence in doubting castle till you see rising up another little table in another corner of the room with a good substantial structure of broiled ham and coffee and a boiled egg or two with various etc which miss diffidence after many desponding ejaculations finally sits down to and in spite of all presentiments makes them fly as nimbly as mr ready to halt did miss much afraid when he footed it so well with her on his crutches in the dance on the occasion of giant despair's overthrow i have thus far dined alternately with mother and aunt susan not having yet been admitted to aunt nabby's establishment there are now great talkings and congresses and consultations of the allied powers and already rumors are afloat that perhaps all will unite their forces and dine at one table especially as harriet and little hattie are coming and there is no knowing what might come out in the papers if there should be anything a little odd mother is very well thin as a hatchet and smart as a steel trap aunt nabby fat and easy as usual for since the sink is mended and no longer leaks and rots the beam and she has nothing to do but watch it and uncle bill has joined the washingtonians and no longer drinks rum she is quite at a loss for topics of worriment uncle ike has had a little touch of palsy and is rather feeble he says that his legs and arms have rather given out but his head and pluck are as good as they ever were i told him that our sister kate was very much in the same fix whereat he was considerably affected and opened the crack in his great pumpkin of a face displaying the same two rows of great white ivories which have been my admiration from my youth up he is sixty-five years of age and has never lost a tooth and was never in his life more than fifteen miles from the spot where he was born except once in the ever memorable year of eighteen nineteen when i was at bradford academy in a sudden glow of adventurous rashness he undertook to go after me and bring me home for vacation and he actually performed the whole journey of thirty miles with his horse and wagon and slept at a tavern the whole night a feat of bravery on which he has never since ceased to plume himself i well remember that awful night in the tavern in the remote region of north andover we occupied a chamber in which were two beds in the unsuspecting innocence of youth i undressed myself and got into bed as usual but my brave and thoughtful uncle merely divesting himself of his coat put it under his pillow and then threw himself on to the bed with his boots on his feet and his two hands resting on the rim of his hat which he had prudently placed on the apex of his stomach as he lay on his back he wouldn't allow me to blow out the candle but he lay there with his great white eyes fixed on the ceiling in a cool determined manner of a bold man who had made up his mind to face danger and meet whatever might befall him we escaped however without injury the doughty landlord and his relentless sons merely demanding pay for supper lodging horse feed and breakfast which my valiant uncle betraying no signs of fear resolutely paid mrs stowe has woven this incident into chapter thirty two of old town folks where uncle ike figures as uncle jacob mrs stowe had misgivings as to the reception which old town folks would meet in england owing to its distinctly new england character shortly after the publication of the book she received the following words of encouragement from mrs lewes george eliot july eleventh eighteen sixty nine quote i have received and read old town folks i think that few of your readers can have felt more interest than i have felt in that picture of an elder generation for my interest in it has a double root one in my own love for our old-fashioned provincial life which had its affinities with the contemporary life even all across the atlantic and of which i have gathered glimpses in different phases from my father and mother with their relations the other is my experimental acquaintance with some shades of calvinistic orthodoxy 
i think your way of presenting the religious convictions which are not your own except by the way of indirect fellowship is a triumph of insight and true tolerance both mr lewes and i are deeply interested in the indications which the professor gives of his peculiar psychological experience and we should feel it a great privilege to learn much more of it from his lips it is a rare thing to have such an opportunity of studying exceptional experience in the testimony of a truthful and in every way distinguished mind old town folks is of interest as being undoubtedly the last of mrs stowe's works which will outlive the generation for which it was written besides its intrinsic merit as a work of fiction it has a certain historic value as being a faithful study of new england life and character in that particular time of its history which may be called the seminal period End quote whether mrs stowe was far enough away from the time and people she attempts to describe to make her mind as still and passive as a looking-glass or a mountain lake and to give merely the images reflected there is something that will in great part determine the permanent value of this work its interest as a story merely is of course ephemeral End of chapter eighteen of the life of harriet beecher stowe compiled from her letters and journals by her son charles edward stowe read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in october two thousand fifteen miss alice mangold soiree musical an unsigned review from the musical times and singing class circular march first eighteen sixty three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org hanover square rooms Miss Alice Mangold's soiree musicale took place at these rooms on the 14th of February. The music selected by this young pianist for performance was Hummel's trio in E major for pianoforte, violin, and violoncello, solos by Bach, Hensett, Howard Glover, and Lubeck, and Clementi's sonata in B flat for two pianofortes, in which she was joined by Herr Power miss mangold is gifted with great talent she has the most finished execution which is combined with so much purity of tone and elegance of expression that she will doubtless rise to the highest position in the profession she was also assisted by messrs rees deichmann webb and piotti miss soldine and mademoiselle georgi the conductor was signor randiger End of Miss Alice Mangold's Soiree Musicale, an unsigned review from The Musical Times and Singing Class Circular, March 1st, 1863. Mystic Theology by Dionysius the Areopagite, translated by Rev. John Parker, M.A. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface to Mystic Theology Mystic Theology is like that ladder set up on the earth, whose top reached to heaven, on which the angels of God were ascending and descending, and above which stood Almighty God. The angel ascending is the negative, which distinguishes Almighty God from all created things. God is not matter, soul, mind, spirit, any being, nor even being itself, but above and beyond all these. The angel descending is the affirmative. God is good, wise, powerful, the being. Until we come to symbolic theology, which denotes him under material forms and conditions. Theology prefers the negative because Almighty God is more appropriately presented by distinction than by comparison. Mystic Theology Caput I. What is the divine gloom? 
Section 1 Triad Supernal Both Super God and Super Good Guardian of the Theosophy of Christian Men Direct us aright to the Super Unknown and Super Brilliant and Highest Summit of the Mystic Oracles where the simple and absolute and changeless mysteries of theology lie hidden within the superluminous gloom of the silence, revealing hidden things, which in its deepest darkness shines above the most superbrilliant, and in the altogether impalpable and invisible, fills to overflowing the eyeless minds with glories of surpassing beauty. This then be my prayer. But thou, O dear Timothy, by thy persistent commerce with the mystic visions, leave behind both sensible perceptions and intellectual efforts, and all objects of sense and intelligence, and all things not being and being, and be raised aloft unknowingly to the union, as far as attainable, with him who is above every essence and knowledge. For by the resistless and absolute ecstasy in all purity, from thyself and all, thou wilt be carried on high to the super-essential ray of the divine darkness, when thou hast cast away all and become free from all. Section 2 But see that none of the uninitiated listen to these things, those, I mean, who are entangled in things being, and fancy there is nothing super-essentially above things being, but imagine that they know, by their own knowledge, him who has placed darkness as his hiding place. But if the divine initiations are above such, what would any one say respecting those still more uninitiated, such as both portray the cause exalted above all, from the lowest of things created, and say that it in no wise excels the no-gods fashioned by themselves and of manifold shapes, it being our duty both to attribute and affirm all the attributes of things existing to it as cause of all, and more properly to deny them all to it as being above all, and not to consider the negations to be in opposition to the affirmations, but far rather that it, which is above every abstraction and definition, is above the privations. Section 3 Thus, then, the divine Bartholomew says that theology is much and least, and the gospel broad and great, and on the other hand concise, he seems to me to have comprehended this supernaturally, that the good cause of all is both of much utterance, and at the same time of briefest utterance and without utterance, as having neither utterance nor conception, because it is superessentially exalted above all, and manifested without veil and in truth, to those alone who pass through both all things consecrated and pure, and ascend above every ascent of all holy summits, and leave behind all divine lights and sounds, and heavenly words, and enter into the gloom, where really is, as the oracles say, he who is beyond all. For even the divine Moses is himself strictly bidden to be first purified and then to be separated from those who are not so, and after entire cleansing hears the many-voiced trumpets, and sees many lights, shedding pure and streaming rays. Then he is separated from the multitude, and with the chosen priests goes first to the summit of the divine ascents, although even then he does not meet with Almighty God himself, but views not him, for he is viewless but the place where he is. Now this, I think, signifies that the most divine and highest of the things seen and contemplated are a sort of suggestive expression of the things subject to him who is above all, 
through which his holy inconceivable presence is shown, reaching to the highest spiritual summits of his most holy places. And then he, Moses, is freed from them who are both seen and seeing, and enters into the gloom of the agnosia, a gloom veritably mystic, within which he closes all perceptions of knowledge, and enters into the altogether impalpable and unseen, being wholly of him who is beyond all, and of none, neither himself nor other, and by inactivity of all knowledge, united in his better part to the altogether unknown, and by knowing nothing, knowing above mind. Caput two. How we ought both to be united and render praise to the cause of all and above all. Section 1. We pray to enter within the super-bright gloom, and through not seeing and not knowing, to see and to know that the not to see nor to know is itself the above sight and knowledge. For this is veritably to see and to know and to celebrate superessentially the superessential, through the abstraction of all existing things, just as those who make a lifelike statue, by extracting all the encumbrances which have been placed upon the clear view of the concealed, and by bringing to light, by the mere cutting away, the genuine beauty concealed in it. And it is necessary, as I think, to celebrate the abstractions in an opposite way to the definitions. For we used to place these latter by beginning from the foremost and descending through the middle to the lowest. But in this case, by making the ascents from the lowest to the highest, we abstract everything, in order that without veil we may know that agnosia which is enshrouded under all the known, in all things that be, and may see that superessential gloom, which is hidden by all the light in existing things. Caput three. What are the affirmative expressions respecting God, and what the negative? Section one. In the theological outlines, then, we celebrated the principal affirmative expressions respecting God, how the divine and good nature is spoken of as one, how as threefold, what is that within it which is spoken of as paternity and sonship, what the divine name of the Spirit is meant to signify, how from the immaterial and indivisible good the lights dwelling in the heart of goodness sprang forth and remained in their branching forth without departing from the co-eternal abiding in himself and in themselves and in each other. How the superessential Jesus takes substance in veritable human nature and whatever other things made known by the oracles are celebrated throughout the theological outlines and in the treatise concerning divine names, how he is named good, how being, how life and wisdom and power, and whatever else belongs to the nomenclature of God. Further, in the symbolical theology, what are the names transferred from objects of sense to things divine? What are the divine forms? What the divine appearances and parts and organs? what the divine places and ornaments, what the angers, what the griefs, and the divine wrath, what the carousals and the ensuing sicknesses, what the oaths, and what the curses, what the sleepings and what the awakings, and all the other divinely formed representations which belong to the description of God through symbols. And I imagine that you have comprehended how the lowest are expressed in somewhat more words than the first. For it was necessary that the theological outlines and the unfolding of the divine name should be expressed in fewer words than the symbolic theology. 
since in proportion as we ascend to the higher, in such a degree the expressions are circumscribed by the contemplations of the things intelligible. And even now, when entering into the gloom which is above mind, we shall find not a little speaking, but a complete absence of speech, and absence of conception. In the other case, the discourse in descending from the above to the lowest is widened according to the descent, to a proportionate extent. But now, in ascending from below to that which is above, in proportion to the ascent, it is contracted, and after a complete ascent, it will become wholly voiceless, and will be wholly united to the unutterable. But, for what reason in short, you say, having attributed the divine attributes from the foremost, do we begin the divine abstraction from things lowest? Because it is necessary that they who place attributes on that which is above every attribute should place the attributive affirmation from that which is more cognate to it. But that they who abstract with regard to that which is above every abstraction should make the abstraction from things which are further removed from it. Are not life and goodness more cognate than air and stone? And he is not given to debauch and to wrath, more removed than he is not expressed nor conceived. Caput 4 That the preeminent cause of every object of sensible perception is none of the objects of sensible perception. Section 1 We say then that the cause of all, which is above all, is neither without being, nor without life, nor without reason, nor without mind, nor is a body, nor has shape, nor form, nor quality, or quantity, or bulk, nor is in a place, nor is seen, nor has sensible contact, nor perceives, nor is perceived by the senses, nor has disorder and confusion as being vexed by earthly passions, nor is powerless as being subject to casualties of sense, nor is in need of light. Neither is it, nor has it, change or decay, or division, or deprivation, or flux, or any other of the objects of sense. Caput 5 that the preeminent cause of every object of intelligible perception is none of the objects of intelligible perception. On the other hand, ascending, we say, that it is neither soul nor mind, nor has imagination, or opinion, or reason, or conception. Neither is expressed, nor conceived. Neither is number, nor order, nor greatness, nor littleness, nor equality, nor inequality, nor similarity, nor dissimilarity, neither is standing, nor moving, nor at rest, neither has power, nor is power, nor light, neither lives, nor is life, neither is essence, nor eternity, nor time, neither is its touch intelligible, neither is it science, nor truth, nor kingdom, nor wisdom, neither one, nor oneness, neither deity, nor goodness, nor is it spirit according to our understanding, nor sonship, nor paternity, nor any other being of those known to us, or to any other existing being, neither is it any of non-existing, nor of existing things, nor do things existing know it as it is, nor does it know existing things qua existing. Neither is there expression of it, nor name, nor knowledge, neither is it darkness, nor light, nor error, nor truth, neither is there any definition at all of it, nor any abstraction. 
but when making the predications and abstractions of things after it, we neither predicate nor abstract from it, since the all-perfect and uniform cause of all is both above every definition and the preeminence of him who is absolutely freed from all and beyond the whole is also above every abstraction. End of Mystic Theology by Dionysius the Areopagite Translated by Rev. John Parker, M.A. Read by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, USA August 2015Xenophon on Horsemanship Translated by Morris H. Morgan, Ph.D., Assistant Professor, Harvard University This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Xenophon on Horsemanship Chapter 1 it has been my fortune to spend a great deal of time in riding, and so I think myself versed in the horseman's art. This makes me willing to set forth to the younger of my friends what I believe would be the best way for them to deal with horses. It is true that a book on horsemanship has already been written by Simon, I mean the man who dedicated the bronze horse at the Elder Sinian in Athens with his own exploits in relief on the pedestal. Still, I shall not strike out of my work all the points in which I chance to agree with him, but shall take much greater pleasure in passing them on to my friends, believing that I speak with the more authority because a famous horseman, such as he, has thought as I do. And then again I shall try to make clear whatever he has omitted. To begin with, I shall describe how a man, in buying a horse, would be least likely to be cheated. In the case of an unbroken colt, of course his frame is what you must test. As for spirit, no very sure signs of that are offered by an animal that has never yet been mounted. And in his frame, the first things which I say you ought to look at are his feet. Just as a house would be good for nothing if it were very handsome above but lacked the proper foundations, so too a war horse, if all his other points were fine, would yet be good for nothing if he had bad feet for he could not use a single one of his fine points. The feet should first be tested by examining the horn. Thick horn is a much better mark of good feet than thin. Again, one should not fail to note whether the hooves at toe and heel come up high or lie low. High ones keep what is called the frog well off the ground, while horses with low hooves walk with the hardest and softest part of the foot at once like knock-kneed men. Simon says that their sound is a proof of good feet, and he is right, for a hollow hoof resounds like a cymbal as it strikes the ground. As we have begun here, let us now proceed to the rest of the body. The bones above the hooves and below the fetlocks should not be very straight up and down, like the goats, for if they have no spring, they jar the rider, and such legs are apt to get inflamed. These bones should not come down very low either, else the horse might get his fetlocks stripped of hair and torn in riding over heavy ground or over stones. The shank bones ought to be stout, for they are the supporters of the body, but they should not be thickly coated with flesh or veins. If they are in riding over hard ground, the veins would fill with blood and become varicose, the legs would swell and the flesh recede. With this slackening of the flesh, the back sinew often gives way and makes the horse lame. As for the knees, if they are supple in bending when the colt walks, you may infer that his limbs will be supple in riding. For as time goes on, all colts get more and more supple at the knees. Supple knees are highly esteemed, and justly, because they make the horse easier and less likely to stumble than stiff ones. Forearms stout below the shoulders look stronger and comelier, as they do in man. The broader the chest, so much the handsomer and the stronger is it, and the more naturally adapted to carry the legs well apart and without interference. The neck should not be thrown out from the chest like a boar's, 
but like a cox, should rise straight up to the pole and be slim at the bend, while the head, though bony, should have but a small jaw. The neck would then protect the rider, and the eye see what lies before the feet. A horse thus shaped could do the least harm, even if he were very high-spirited, for it is not by arching the neck and head, but by stretching them out, that horses try their powers of violence. You should note also whether his jaws are fine or hard, whether they are alike or different. Horses whose jaws are unlike are generally hard-mouthed. A prominent eye rather than a sunken one is a sure sign that the horse is wide awake, and such a one can see further too. Wide nostrils mean freer breathing than close ones, and at the same time they make the horse look fiercer, for whenever a horse is provoked at another, or gets excited during exercises, he dilates his nostrils very widely. A rather large pole and ears somewhat small give the head more of the look which a horse should have. High withers make the rider's seat surer, and his grip on the shoulders stronger. A double back is easier to sit upon, and better looking than a single one. A deep side, rather rounded at the belly, generally makes the horse at once easier to sit upon, stronger, and a better feeder. The broader and the shorter the loins, with so much the greater ease does the horse raise his forehand and bring up the hindquarters to follow. Then, too, the belly looks smallest, which, when it is large, is not only disfiguring, but makes the horse weaker and more unwieldy. The quarters should be broad and full in proportion to the sides and chest, and all these parts, if firm, would be lighter for running, and make your horse a great deal faster. If he has his buttocks well apart, under the tail with the line between them broad he will be sure to spread well behind in so doing he will have a stronger and a prouder look both when gathering himself in and in riding and all his points will be improved you may take the case of men to prove this whenever they wish to lift anything from the ground they do it with their legs apart rather than close together the horse should certainly not have large stones but this point cannot be determined in the colt as for the hocks below, all the shanks and the fetlocks and hooves, I say about them here just what I did in the case of the forefeet. I will set down too how you are least likely to miss the mark in the matter of size. That colt always turns out the largest, whose shanks are longest at the time of foaling. For the shanks do not grow very much in any quadrupeds as time goes on, but the rest of the frame grows so as to correspond to the shanks. It seems to me that by testing a colt's shape in the manner described, people would get, as a general rule, an animal with sound feet, strong, good conditioned, graceful and large. Even though some alter as they grow, we should still apply these tests with confidence, since there are a great many more ugly colts that turn out handsome than handsome ones that turn out ugly. Chapter 2 it does not seem necessary for me to describe the method of breaking a colt, because those who are enlisted in the cavalry in our states are persons of very considerable means and take no small part in the government. It is also a great deal better than being a horse-breaker for a young man to see that his own condition and that of his horse is good, or if he knows this already, to keep up his practice in riding, while an old man had better attend to his family and friends, to public business, and military matters than be spending his time in horse breaking. The man then that feels as I do about horse breaking will, of course, put out his colt. He should not put him out, however, without having a written contract made, stating what the horse is to be taught before he is returned, just as he does when he puts his son out to learn a trade. This will serve as a reminder to the horse breaker of what he must attend to if he is to get his fee. See to it that the colt be kind, used to the hand, and fond of men when he is put out to the horse-breaker. He is generally made so at home, and by the groom, if the man knows how to manage, so that solitude means to the colt hunger and thirst and teasing horse-flies, while food, drink, and relief from pain come from man. For if this be done, colts must not only love men, but even long for them. Then, too, the horse should be stroked in the places which he most likes to have handled, that is, where the hair is thickest, 
and where he is least able to help himself if anything hurts him. The groom should also be directed to lead him through crowds and to make him familiar with all sorts of sights and all sorts of noises. Whenever the colt is frightened at any of them, he should be taught not by irritating but by soothing him that there is nothing to fear. It seems to me that this is enough to tell the amateur to do in the matter of horse breaking. Chapter 3 I shall now set down some memoranda to be observed in buying a horse already broken to riding, if you are not to be cheated in the purchase. First then, the question of age should not pass unnoticed, for if he no longer has the markers, the prospect is not a glad one, and he is not to be disposed of so easily. His youth once made sure of, the way in which he lets you put the bit into his mouth and the headpiece about his ears should not escape you. This would be least likely to pass unnoticed if the bridle were put on and taken off in the sight of the purchaser. Next we ought to observe how he receives the rider upon his back. A great many horses hardly let come near them things whose very approach is a sign that there is work to be done. This too must be observed, whether when mounted he is willing to leave other horses, or whether when ridden near horses that are standing still he runs away towards them. Some horses also, from bad training, take flight towards home from the riding grounds. The exercise called the volta shows up a hard mouth, and even more the practice of changing the direction. Many horses do not try to run away unless the mouth is hard on the same side with the road for a bolt towards home. Then you must know whether, when let out at full speed, he will come to the poise and be willing to turn round. It is not a bad thing to try whether he is just as ready to mind when roused by a blow as he was before. A disobedient servant is of course a useless thing, and so is a disobedient army. A disobedient horse is not only useless, but he often plays the part of a very traitor. As I assume that the horse to be bought is meant for war, trial should be made of all the qualities that war itself puts to the test. These are jumping ditches, going over walls, breasting banks and leaping down from them. You must try him riding up hill and down dale and along the slope. All these tests prove whether his spirit is strong and his body sound. He should not be rejected, however, if he does not perform them all very finely, as many animals fail not from inability but from want of practice in these feats. With instruction, habit and practice they may do all finely, provided they are sound and not vicious. But you must beware of horses that are naturally shy. The over-timid let no harm come to the enemy from off their backs, and they often throw the rider and bring him into the greatest danger. You must learn, too, whether the horse has any particular vice, shown towards other horses or towards men, and whether he is very skittish. These are all troublesome matters for his owner. You could much better discover objections to being bridled and mounted and other vices by trying to do over again after the horse has finished his work, just what you did before beginning your ride. Horses that are ready to submit to a task the second time, after having done it once, give proof enough of high spirit. To sum it all up, the least troublesome and the most serviceable to his rider in the wars would naturally be the horse that is sound-footed, gentle, sufficiently fleet, ready and able to undergo fatigue, and first and foremost, obedient. On the other hand, horses that need much urging from laziness or much coaxing and attention from being too mettlesome keep the rider's hands always engaged and take away his courage in moments of danger. Chapter 4 When one has bought a horse that he really admires and has taken him home, it is a good thing to have his stall in such a part of the establishment that his master shall very often have an eye on the animal. It is well, too, that the stable should be so arranged that the horse's food can no more be stolen out of the manger than his master's out of the storeroom. In my opinion, the man who neglects this matter is neglecting himself, for it is plain that in moments of danger the master gives his own life into the keeping of his horse. A secure stable is a good thing, not only to prevent the stealing of grain, but also because you can easily tell when the horse refuses his feed. 
Observing this, you may know either that there is too much blood in him, or that he has been overworked and wants rest, or that barley surfeit or some other disease is coming on. In the horse, as in the man, all diseases are easier to cure at the start than after they have become chronic and have been wrongly diagnosed. The same care which is given to the horse's food and exercise to make his body grow strong should also be devoted to keeping his feet in condition. Even naturally sound hooves get spoiled in stalls with moist, smooth floors. The floor should be sloping to avoid moisture, and to prevent smoothness, stones should be sunk close to one another, each about the size of the hooves. The mere standing on such floors strengthens the feet. Further, of course, the groom should lead the horse out somewhere to rub him down, and should loose him from the manger after breakfast, so that he may go to dinner the more readily. This place outside of the stall would be best suited to the purpose of strengthening the horse's feet if you threw down loosely four or five cartloads of round stones, each big enough to fill your hand and about a pound and a half in weight, surrounding the hole with an iron border to keep them from getting scattered. Standing on these would be as good for him as travelling a stony road for some part of every day, and whether he is being rubbed down or is teased by horseflies, he has to use his hooves exactly as he does in walking. Stones strewn about in this way strengthen the frogs too. As for his mouth, you must take as much care to make it soft as you take to make his hooves hard, and the same treatment softens a horse's mouth that softens a man's flesh. Chapter 5 It is also a horseman's duty, I think, to see that his groom is taught the proper way to treat the horse. First of all, he ought to know that he should never make the knot in the halter at the place where the headpiece fits round. The horse often rubs his head against the manger, and it may make sores if the halter is not easy about the ears. And of course, when there are sores, then the horse must be somewhat fretful in bridling and grooming. It is well that the groom should have orders to carry out the droppings and the litter every day to a given place. By doing so, he may get rid of it in the easiest way for himself and would be doing the horse good too. The groom must understand that he is to put the muzzle on the horse when he leads him out to be rubbed down or to the place where he rolls. In fact, the horse ought always to be muzzled whenever he is taken anywhere without a bridle. The muzzle, without hindering his breathing, allows no biting, and when it is on, it serves to keep horses from mischievous designs. The horse should by all means be fastened from above his head, for instinct makes him toss his head up when anything is worrying him about his face, and if he is fastened in this way, the tossing slackens the halter instead of pulling it taut. In grooming, begin with the head and mane. If the upper parts are not clean, it is waste labour to clean the lower parts. Next, raise the hair on the rest of the body by the use of all the ordinary cleaning implements, and then clear away the dust by working with the grain of the hair. But the hair on the backbone should never be touched by any implement at all. It is to be rubbed with the hand and softly smoothed in its natural direction, for thus the seat would be least injured. The head, however, must be washed with water. It is bony, and to clean it with iron or wood would hurt the horse. The forelock also should be wetted, this hair, even though pretty long, does not prevent the horse from seeing, but clears away from his eyes things that would hurt him. The gods, we must believe, gave this tuft to the horse instead of the huge ears which they gave to asses and mules to protect their eyes. The tail and mane should be washed, seeing that the hair must be made to grow on the tail, so that the horse, reaching out as far as possible, may switch away things that torment him and made to grow on the neck to afford plenty to take hold of in mounting. The mane, forelock and tail are gifts of the gods bestowed on the horse for beauty. A proof is that brood mares, as long as their hair is flowing, are not so apt to admit asses, whence all breeders of mules cut off the hair from their mares preparatory to covering. Washing down of the legs is a thing I absolutely forbid. It does no good, on the contrary, daily washing is bad for the hooves, and washing under the belly should be done very sparingly. It worries the horse more than washing anywhere else, 
and the cleaner these parts are made, the more they attract things under the belly that would torment it. And no matter what pains one has spent on it, the horse is no sooner led out than it gets exactly as dirty as before. These parts, then, should be let alone, and as for the legs, rubbing with the mere hand is quite enough. Chapter 6 Next I shall explain how a man may groom a horse with the least danger to himself and the greatest good to the animal. If he tries to clean him facing with the horse, he runs the risk of a blow in the face from knee or hoof. But if he faces just the other way and outside the reach of the leg, when he cleans him and takes his place off the shoulder blade in rubbing him down, he will not be harmed at all and may even bend back the hoof and attend to the horse's frog. Let him clean the hind legs in the same way. The man that takes care of the horse should know that both in this matter and in everything else which has to be done, the very last places at which he should approach to do it are in front and behind. For if the horse means mischief, these are the two points at which he has the advantage of a man. But by approaching him at the side, you can handle him most freely and with the least danger to yourself. When the horse is to be led, I certainly do not approve of leading him behind you, for then you have the least chance to look out for yourself, and the horse has the best chance to do whatever he likes. Then again, I object to teaching the horse to go on ahead with a long leading rein. The reason is that the horse can then do mischief on either side he pleases, and can even whirl round and face his leader. Why, only think of several horses led together in this fashion? How in the world could they be kept away from one another? But a horse that is accustomed to be led by the side can do the least mischief to other horses and to men, and would be most convenient and ready for the rider, especially if he should ever have to mount in a hurry. In order to put the bridle on properly, the groom should first come up on the near side of the horse. Then, throwing the reins over the head and letting them drop on the withers, he should take the headpiece in his right hand and offer the bit with his left. If the horse receives it, of course the headstall is to be put on. But if he does not open his mouth, the bit should be held against his teeth and the thumb of the left hand thrust within his jaw. This makes most horses open the mouth. If he does not receive the bit even then, press his lip hard against the tush. Very few horses refuse it on feeling this. Let your groom be well instructed in the following points. First, never to lead the horse by one rein, for this makes one side of the mouth harder than the other. Secondly, what is the proper distance of the bit from the corners of the mouth? If too close, it makes the mouth callous, so that it has no delicacy of feeling. But if the bit hangs too low down in the mouth, the horse can take it in his teeth and so refuse to mind it. The following must also be urged strongly upon the groom if any work at all is to be done. Willingness to receive the bit is such an important part that a horse that refuses it is utterly useless. Now if the bridle is put on not only when he is going to be worked, but also when he is led to his food and home after exercise, it would not be at all strange if he should seize the bit of his own accord when you hold it out to him. It is well for the groom to understand how to put a rider up Persian fashion, so that his master, if he gets infirm or has grown oldish, may himself have somebody to mount him handily, or may be able to oblige another with a person to mount him. The one great precept and practice in using a horse is this. Never deal with him when you are in a fit of passion. A fit of passion is a thing that has no foresight in it, and so we often have to rue the day when we gave way to it. Consequently, when your horse shies at an object and is unwilling to go up to it, he should be shown that there is nothing fearful in it, least of all to a courageous horse like him. But if this fails, touch the object yourself that seems so dreadful to him and lead him up to it with gentleness. Compulsion and blows inspire only the more fear, for when horses are at all hurt at such a time, they may think that what they shied at is the cause of the hurt. I do not find fault with a horse for knowing how to settle down so as to be mounted easily when the groom delivers him to the rider. Still, I think that the true horseman ought to practice and be able to mount even if the horse does not so offer himself. 
different horses fall to one's lot at different times, and the same horse serves you one way at one time and another at another. Chapter 7 I shall next set down the method of riding which the horseman may find best for himself and his horse when once he has received him for mounting. First, then, with the left hand, he must take up lightly the halter which hangs from the chin strap or the nose band, holding it so slack as not to check the horse, whether he intends to raise himself by laying hold of the mane about the ears and to mount in that way, or whether he vaults on from his spear. With the right hand, he must then take the reins at the withers and also grasp the mane, so that he may not wrench the horse's mouth at all as he gets up. In springing to his place, he must draw up the body with the left hand, keeping his right stiff as he raises himself with it, for in mounting thus he will not look ungraceful even from behind. The leg should be kept bent, the knee must not touch the horse's back, and the calf must be brought clean over to the off side. After having brought his foot completely round, he is then to settle down in his seat on the horse. I think it good that the horseman should practice springing up from the offside as well, on the chance that he may happen to be leading his horse with the left hand and holding his spear in his right. He has only to learn to do with the left what he did before with the right, and with the right what he did with the left. Another reason why I approve of the latter method of mounting is that the moment he is on horseback, the rider would be completely ready if he should have to engage the enemy all of a sudden. When the rider takes his seat, whether bareback or on the cloth, I do not approve of a seat which is as though the man were on a chair, but rather as though he were standing upright with his legs apart. Thus he would get a better grip with his thighs on the horse, and being upright he could hurl his javelin more vigorously and strike a better blow from on horseback if need be. His foot and leg from the knee down should hang loosely, for if he keeps his legs stiff, and should strike it against something, he might get it broken, but a supple leg would yield if it struck against anything without at all disturbing the thigh. Then too the rider should accustom himself to keep his body above the hips as supple as possible, for this would give him greater power of action, and he would be less liable to a fall if somebody should try to pull or push him off. The horse should be taught to stand still when the rider is taking his seat, and until he has drawn his skirts from under him, if necessary, made the reins even and taken the most convenient grasp of his spear. Let him then keep his left arm at his side. This will give the rider the tidiest look and to his hand the greatest power. As for reins, I recommend such as are alike, not weak nor slippery and not thick either, so that if necessary the hand may hold the spear as well. When the horse gets the signal to start, let him begin at a walk, for this frets him least. If the horse carries his head low, hold the reins with the hands a bit high. If he carries it somewhat high, then rather low. This would make the most graceful appearance. Next, by taking the true trot, the horse would relax his body with the least discomfort and come with the greatest ease into the hand gallop and as leading with the left is the more approved way, this lead would best be reached if the signal to gallop should be given the horse at the moment when he is rising with his right in the trot. For being about to raise his left foot next, he would lead with it and would begin the stride as he comes over to the left, for the horse instinctively leads with the right on turning to the right and with the left on turning to the left. I recommend the exercise known as the volta because it accustoms the horse to turn on either jaw. Changing the direction is also a good thing, that the jaws on either side may be equally suppled. But I recommend the career with sharp turns at each end, rather than the complete volta, for the horse would like turning better after he has had enough of the straight course, and thus would be practising straight away running and turning at the same time. He must be collected at the turns, because it is not easy or safe for the horse to make short turns when he is at full speed, especially if the ground is uneven or slippery. When the rider collects him, he must not throw the horse a slant at all with the bit, nor sit at all a slant himself, else he must be well aware 
that a slight matter will be enough to bring himself and his horse to the ground. The moment the horse faces the stretch after finishing the turn, the rider should push him on to go faster. In war, of course, turns are executed for the purpose of pursuing or retreating. Hence it is well that he should be trained to speed after turning. After the horse appears to have had enough exercise, it is well to give him a rest and then to urge him suddenly to the top of his speed, either away from other horses or towards them. Then to quiet him down out of his speed by pulling him up very short. And again, after a halt, to turn him and push him on. It is very certain that there will come times when each of these manoeuvres will be necessary. When the moment comes to dismount, never do so among other horses, nor in a crowd of bystanders, nor outside of the riding ground, but let the horse enjoy a season of rest in the very place where he is obliged to work. Chapter 8 There are many occasions, of course, when the horse will have to run downhill, and uphill, and along a slope, as well as to take a leap across or out of something and to jump down. So all of these movements must be learned and practised by both horse and rider. The two will thus become obviously the more helpful and useful to one another. If it is thought that I am repeating myself, because I am speaking now of what I have spoken before, let me say that there is no repetition here. I did lay down that you should try whether the horse could do all this at the time you bought him, but what I am now urging is that a man should teach his own horse, and I shall describe the right method of instruction. With a horse that has no experience whatever in leaping, take him with the leading rein loose and leap across the ditch before him. Then draw the rein tight to make him jump over. If he refuses, let someone with a whip or stick lay it on pretty hard. He will then jump over not merely the proper distance, but a great deal more than is required. He will never need a blow after that, but will jump the minute he sees anybody coming up behind him. When he is used to taking a leap in this way, let the rider mount and put him first at small and then at larger ditches, pricking him with the spur just as he is about to leap. Prick him with the spur in the same way in teaching him to leap up and to leap down. If the horse uses his whole body at once for all these, it will be much safer for him and for his rider than if his quarters are not well gathered in as he leaps or jumps up or down. Going downhill must be taught him at first on soft ground, and finally, when he gets used to it, he will like to run down much more than to run up. As for the fears that some folks feel of dislocating the horse's shoulder in riding downhill, they should take courage from the knowledge that the horses of the Persians and Adrissians, all of which habitually run their races downhill, are not a bit less sound than Greek horses. I shall not omit to tell how the rider himself ought to conform to all these movements. When the horse bolts suddenly off, the rider should lean forward, for then the horse would be less likely to draw in under the rider and jolt him up. But he should bend back when the horse is being brought to a poise, as he would then be less jolted. In leaping a ditch or running uphill, it is not a bad thing to lay hold of the mane, so that the horse may not be troubled by the bit and the ground at the same time. Going down a steep place, the rider should throw himself well back and support the horse by the bit, so that rider and horse may not be carried headlong down the hill. It is well that the rides should be in different directions occasionally, and that they should be sometimes long and sometimes short. The horse is apt to dislike this less than riding always in the same places and over the same distance. The rider must have a firm seat when going at full speed over all sorts of ground, and must also be able to use his weapons well on horseback. Hence there is nothing to be said against the practice of riding in the hunt, where there is a suitable country with wild animals. But where these are not to be had, it is good training for two riders to arrange together, one to fly from the other on horseback over all sorts of ground, wheeling about with his spear and retreating again, while the other pursues with buttons on his javelins and on his spear. Whenever he gets within javelin shot, he is to hurl his button-tipped javelins at the runner, and to strike him with his spear when he overtakes him within striking distance. 
if they come to close quarters it is well for one to pull his adversary towards him and then to thrust him back all of a sudden this is the way to unhorse him but the proper thing for a man who is being pulled to do is to urge his horse forward for by so doing he will be more likely to unhorse the other man than to get a fall himself and if ever there is cavalry skirmishing when two armies are set in array against each other and the one side pursues even to the enemy's main body while the other retreats among its friends it is well just here to bear in mind that while one is among his friends he is both brave and safe in wheeling among the first and pressing on at full speed but that when he gets near the foe he should keep his horse well in hand for thus while doing hurt to the enemy he could probably best escape being hurt by them himself the gods have bestowed upon man the gift of teaching his brother man what he ought to do by word of mouth but it is evident that by word of mouth you can teach a horse nothing if however you reward him with kindness after he has done as you wish and punish him when he disobeys he will be most likely to learn to obey as he ought this rule to be sure may be expressed in a few words but it holds good in every branch of the art of horsemanship for instance he would receive the bit more readily if some good should come of it every time he received it and he will leap and jump up and obey in all the rest if he looks forward to a season of rest on finishing what he has been directed to do chapter nine so far then it has been stated how a person would be least likely to be cheated in buying a colt or a horse and least likely to spoil him in use but particularly how one could produce a horse with all the qualities that a rider needs in war now on the chance that you should happen to have a horse that is either too high mettled for the occasion or too sluggish this is perhaps the proper time to set down how to treat either in the most correct fashion in the first place you are to know that metal is to a horse what temper is to a man exactly therefore as a man who neither says nor does anything harsh would be least likely to rouse the temper of his neighbour so one who avoids fretting a high mettled horse would be the last to exasperate him at the very outset then in mounting care should be taken to mount without annoying him after mounting the rider should sit quiet more than the ordinary time and then move him forward by the most gentle signs possible next beginning very slowly induce him in turn to quicker paces in such a way that the horse may reach full speed almost without knowing it every abrupt sign that you make him sudden sights sounds or impressions all disturb a high-mettled horse just as they do a man abruptness you must remember always confuses a horse if you want to collect a high-mettled horse when he is dashing along faster than is convenient, you should not draw rein abruptly, but you should win him over gently with the bit, calming him down, not forcing him to be still. Long stretches, rather than frequent turns, calm horses down, and leisurely riding for a good while soothes, calms down, and does not rouse the spirit of the horse of metal. But if anybody expects to calm such a horse down by tiring him out with riding swiftly and far, his supposition is just the reverse of the truth. These are exactly the circumstances in which a high-mettled horse tries to carry the day by main force, and in his wrath, like an angry man, he often does much irreparable harm to himself and his rider. A high-mettled horse must be kept from dashing on at full speed and utterly prevented from racing with another for as a rule remember the most ambitious horses are the highest mettled smooth bits are more suitable for such horses than rough but if a rough one is put in it must be made as easy as the smooth by lightness of hand it is well also to get into the habit of sitting quiet especially on a high mettled horse and utterly to avoid touching him with any other part than those which we use in securing a firm seat you must know that it is orthodox to calm him down with a chirrup and to rouse him by clucking still if from the first you should cluck when caressing and chirrup when punishing the horse would learn to start up at the chirrup and calm down at a cluck so when a shout is raised or a trumpet blown you should not let him see you disturbed least of all should you do anything to alarm him 
but should quiet him down so far as you can at such a time, and give him his breakfast or his dinner if circumstances should permit. But the best piece of advice I can give is not to get a very high-mettled horse to use in war. As for a sluggish horse, I think it's sufficient to set down that your method of handling him should at all times be just the opposite to that which I recommended in the case of the high-mettled one. Chapter 10 If you desire to handle a good war horse, so as to make his action the more magnificent and striking, you must refrain from pulling at his mouth with the bit as well as from spurring and whipping him. Most people think that this is the way to make him look fine, but they only produce an effect exactly contrary to what they desire. They positively blind their horse by jerking the mouth up instead of letting them look forward, and by spurring and striking scare them into disorder and danger. This is the way horses behave that are fretted by their riders into ugly and ungraceful action. But if you teach your horse to go with a light hand on the bit, and yet to hold his head well up and to arch his neck, you will be making him do just what the animal himself glories and delights in. A proof that he really delights in it is that when a horse is turned loose and runs off to join other horses, and especially towards mares, then he holds his head up as high as he can, arches his neck in the most spirited style, lifts his legs with free action, and raises his tail. So when he is induced by a man to assume all the airs and graces which he puts on of himself when he is showing off voluntarily, the result is a horse that likes to be ridden, that presents a magnificent sight, that looks alert, that is the observed of all observers. I shall now attempt to explain how I think this result may be obtained. In the first place you must own at least two bits. Let one of them be smooth, with the discs on it good size, the other with the discs heavy, and not standing so high, but with the echini sharp, so that, when he seizes it, he may drop it from dislike of its roughness. Then, when he shall have received the smooth bit in its turn, he will like its smoothness, and do everything on the smooth bit which he has been trained to do on the rough. He may, however, come not to mind its smoothness, and to bear hard upon it, and this is why we put the large discs on the smooth bit, to make him keep his jaws apart and drop the bit. You can make the rough bit anything you like, by holding it lightly or drawing it tight. No matter what the kind of bit, it must always be flexible. When a horse seizes a stiff bit, he holds the whole of it at once against his bars. He lifts it all, just as a man does a spit, at whatever point he takes it up. But the other kind acts like a chain. Only the part that you are grasping remains unbending, and the rest hangs loose. So, as the horse is always after the part that is getting away from him in his mouth, he drops the bit from his bars. For the same reason, little rings are hung from the joints of the bit in the middle, so that the horse, in trying to catch them with his tongue and teeth, may not think of snatching up the bit against his bars. I will set down the definitions of flexible and stiff bits, in case some reader may not know them. The bit is flexible when the joints are broad and smooth where they meet, so that it bends easily, and all the pieces put on round the joints are more likely to be flexible if they are roomy and not tight. On the contrary, if the different parts of the bit do not run and play into each other easily, the bit is a stiff one. Whatever the kind of bit, it must be used according to the following rules, which are in every case the same, provided that it is desired to give a horse the look that has been described. The horse's mouth must not be checked too harshly, so that he will toss his head, nor too gently for him to feel it. The moment he acknowledges it, and begins to raise his neck, give him the bit. And in everything else, as I have insisted over and over again, the horse should be rewarded as long as he behaves well. When you see a horse show his pleasure by carrying his neck high and yielding to the hand, there is no need of using harsh measures, as though you were forcing him to work. He should rather be coaxed on, as when you wish him to rest. He will then go forward most cheerfully to his swift paces. A proof that the horse enjoys fast running is that when he has got loose he never moves at a walk, but runs. 
it is his nature to enjoy it unless he is obliged to run an excessive distance neither horse nor man likes anything in the world that is excessive when it comes to his riding in a proud and stately style in the first part of his training we accustomed him you remember to dash forward at full speed after making the turns well after he has learned this if you support him by the bit and at the same moment give him one of the signs to dash forward the bit holds him in and the signal to advance rouses him up he will then throw out his chest and raise his legs rather high and furiously though not flexibly for horses do not use their legs very flexibly when they are being hurt now if when his fire is thus kindled you let him have the bit the slackness of it makes him think that he is given his head and in his joy thereat he will bound along with proud gait and prancing legs imitating exactly the airs that he puts on before other horses everybody that sees such a horse cries out that he is free willing fit to ride high-mettled brilliant and at once beautiful and fiery in appearance so much for this subject in case you are an admirer of such action chapter eleven if you chance to wish to own a horse for parade a high stepper and of showy action such qualities are not as a rule to be found in every horse but he must have to start with the natural gifts of high spirit and strong body some people fancy that if a horse has supple legs it follows that he will be able to rear his body on them but this is not the fact it is the horse with supple loins and short and strong ones too that can do this i do not mean the loins at the tail but at the belly between the ribs and the haunches such a horse will be able to gather the hind legs well in under the fore now when he has gathered them well in if you take him up by the bit he falls back on his hocks and raises his forehand so that his belly and sheath can be seen from the front you must give him the bit when he does this and it will look to the spectators as if he were doing all of his own accord the prettiest feat that a horse can do there are to be sure some persons who teach this movement either by tapping the hocks with a rod or by directing someone to run along by the side and strike him with a stick under the gaskins but for my part i think as i have said all along that it is the best of lessons if the horse gets a season of repose whenever he has behaved to his rider's satisfaction for what the horse does under compulsion as simon also observes is done without understanding and there is no beauty in it either any more than if one should whip and spur a dancer there would be a great deal more ungracefulness than beauty in either a horse or a man that was so treated no he should show off all his finest and most brilliant performances willingly and at a mere sign if he goes on at his exercise till he is covered with sweat and then if you dismount and unbridle him the moment he rears up in fine style you must be sure that he will come to the act of rearing with a will this is the attitude in which the horses of gods and heroes are always depicted and men who can handle a horse gracefully in it are a magnificent sight the horse rearing thus is such a thing of wonder as to fix the eyes of all beholders young or old nobody i assure you either leaves him or gets tired of watching him as long as he presents the brilliant spectacle yet if a chance that the owner of such a horse should command a troop or regiment of cavalry he should not aspire to be the only brilliant figure himself but should try all the more to make the whole line that follows a sight worth seeing if he goes on ahead at an extremely slow pace with his horse rearing very high and very often it is obvious that the rest of the horses would have to follow him at a walk what could there be at all brilliant in such a sight as this but if you rouse your horse and take the lead at a gait neither too fast nor too slow but simply suited to the horses that are most spirited alert and graceful in action with such leading the general effect is complete and the horses prance and snort all together so that not only you yourself but all that follow after would be a sight well worth seeing to conclude if a man buys his horses skilfully feeds them so that they can bear fatigue and handles them properly in training them for war in exercising them for the parade and in actual service in the field 
what is there to prevent him from making his horses more valuable than when he acquired them, and hence from owning horses that are famous and from becoming famous himself in the art of horsemanship? Nothing except the interposition of some divinity. Chapter 12 I wish also to set down how the man who is to run the hazard of battle on horseback should be armed. To begin with the cuirass, this must always be made to fit the body, for if it fits well, the body supports its weight, but if it is very loose, the shoulders have to carry it all by themselves. As for too tight a cuirass, it is a straight jacket and not a piece of armour. Next, as the neck is one of the vital parts, I say that a covering should be made for it rising from out of the cuirass itself to fit the neck. This will at once be an ornament, for if it is made as it should be, it will cover the rider's face when he pleases as far as the nose. For a helmet, the viotian is the best, in my opinion, since it most completely protects all the parts that are above the cuirass, without preventing you from seeing. Let the cuirass be made so as not to hinder sitting nor stooping. Round the belly, the groin and thereabouts, there should be flaps of such material and number as to protect these parts. Since the horseman is disabled if anything happens to his left arm, I consequently recommend the newly invented piece of armour called the arm. It protects the shoulder, the arm, the elbow and the part that holds the reins, and it can be extended or bent together. Besides, it covers the gap left by the cuirass under the armpit. The right arm must, of course, be raised whenever the rider wants to hurl his javelin or to strike a blow. The part of the cuirass that hinders this must therefore be removed, and in its place flaps put on at the joints, unfolding altogether when the arm is raised and closing when it is lowered. For the arm itself, something worn like a greave seems to me better than to have it of a piece with the cuirass. The part of the arm that is bared when it is raised must be protected near the cuirass with calfskin or bronze, else it will be left unguarded in its most vital part. Now, as the rider himself is in extreme danger if anything happens to his horse, the animal also should be armed with a frontlet, breastplate and thigh pieces. The last serve at the same time to cover the thighs of the rider. Above all, the horse's belly should be protected as being the most vital and the weakest part. It may be protected with the cloth. This cloth must also be of such material and so sewed together so as to give the rider a safe seat and not to gall the horse's back. For the rest, this should be the armour for horse and man. But as the shins and feet would of course project below the thigh pieces, they too may be armed with top boots of the leather of which shoes are made. These will at once protect the shins and cover the feet. This, and the grace of the gods, is the defensive armour. For offensive, I recommend the sabre rather than the sword. For the rider being aloft, a scimitar blow will be more in place than the thrust of a sword. Instead of a spear of scantling, which is weak and clumsy to carry, I am inclined to recommend two javelins made of cornell wood. A skilful person can throw one and then use the other in front, on the flank or in the rear. They are also stronger than the spear and handier to carry. I recommend hurling the javelin at the longest possible range. This gives more time to recover oneself and to seize the other javelin. I will set down in a few words the best method of hurling the javelin. Throw forward the left, draw back the right, rise from the thighs and let it go with the point slightly raised. Then it will carry with the greatest force and the longest range and it will be sure to hit the mark provided the point is always aimed at the mark when you let it go. This completes the hints, lessons and exercises on which I was to write for the private. The knowledge and practice necessary for the commander of cavalry have been set forth already in a different work. End of Xenophon on Horsemanship Translated by Morris H. Morgan, PhD, Assistant Professor, Harvard University
Frederick Hegel, Lectures on the Philosophy of Religion, 1832. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It may happen that religion is awakened in the heart by means of philosophical knowledge, but it is not necessarily so. It is not the purpose of philosophy to edify. And quite as little is it necessary for it to make good its claims by showing in any particular case that it must produce religious feeling in the individual. Philosophy, it is true, has to develop the necessity of religion in and for itself, and to grasp the thought that spirit must of necessity advance from the other modes of its will in conceiving and feeling to this absolute mode. But it is the universal destiny of spirit which is thus accomplished. It is another matter to raise up the individual subject to this height. The self-will, the perversity, or the indolence of the individuals may interfere with the necessity of their universal spiritual nature. Individuals may deviate from it and attempt to get for themselves a standpoint of their own and hold on to it. The possibility of letting oneself drift through inertness to the standpoint of untruth or of lingering there consciously and purposely is involved in the freedom of the subject. While planets, plants, animals cannot deviate from the necessity of their nature from the truth and become what they ought to be. But in human freedom, what is and what ought to be are separate. This freedom brings with it the power of free choice, and it is possible for it to sever itself from its necessity, from its laws, and to work in the opposition of its true destiny. Therefore, although philosophical knowledge should clearly perceive the necessity of the religious standpoint, and though the will should learn in the sphere of reality the nullity of its separation, all this does not hinder the will from being able to persist in its obstinacy and to stand aloof from its necessity and truth. There is a common and shallow manner of arguing against cognition or philosophical knowledge, as when, for instance, it is said that such and such a man has a knowledge of God, and yet remains far from religion, and has not become godly. It is not, however, the aim of knowledge to lead to this, nor is it meant to do so. What knowledge must do is to know religion as something which already exists. It is neither its duty to induce this or that person, any particular empirical subject, to be religious, if he has not been so before if he has nothing of religion in him and does not wish to have. But the fact is, no man is so utterly ruined, so lost and so bad, nor can we regard anyone as being so wretched that he has no religion whatever in him, even if it were only that he has the fear of it, or some yearning after it, or a feeling of hatred towards it for even in this last case he is inwardly occupied with it and cannot free himself from it End of frederick hegel lectures on the philosophy of religion eighteen thirty two published in eighteen ninety five from hegel's introduction pages five and six The Problem from the Philosophy of History by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Editor's Footnote Hegel uses with great effect a quotation from a Neoplatonist philosopher who used the clear thoughts of Aristotle and Plato to explain the symbolic consciousness of the Greeks. End footnote. 
that the spirit of the egyptians presented itself to their consciousness in the form of a problem is evident from the celebrated inscription in the sanctuary of the goddess neith at sais i am that which is that which was and that which will be no one has lifted my veil this inscription indicates the principle of the egyptian spirit though the opinion has often been entertained that this purport applies to all times proclus supplies the addition the fruit which i have produced is helios that which is clear to itself is therefore the result of and the solution of the problem in question this lucidity is spirit the son of neith the concealed night-loving divinity in the egyptian neith truth is still a problem the greek apollo is its solution his utterance is man know thyself in this dictum is not intended a self-recognition that regards the specialties of one's own weaknesses and defects it is not the individual that is admonished to become acquainted with his idiosyncrasy but humanity in general is summoned to self-knowledge this mandate was given for the greeks and in the greek spirit humanity exhibits itself in its clear and developed condition wonderfully then must the greek legend surprise us which relates that the sphinx the great egyptian symbol appeared in thebes uttering the words what is that which in the morning goes on four legs at midday on two and in the evening on three oedipus giving the solution man precipitated the sphinx from the rock the solution and liberation of that oriental spirit which in egypt had advanced so far as to propose the problem is certainly this that the inner being the essence of nature is thought which has its existence only in the human consciousness but that time-honored antique solution given by oedipus who thus shows himself possessed of knowledge is connected with a dire ignorance of the character of his own actions the rise of spiritual illumination in the old royal house is disparaged by connection with abominations the result of ignorance and that primeval royalty must in order to attain true knowledge and moral clearness first be brought into shapely form and be harmonized with the spirit of the beautiful by civil laws and political freedom end of the problem by georg wilhelm friedrich hegel seventeen seventy to eighteen thirty one shoppers tips for watermelons and cantaloupes by the united states department of agriculture radio service this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org historic archived document do not assume content reflects current scientific knowledge policies or practices united states department of agriculture radio service office of information housekeepers chat friday august sixth nineteen thirty seven for broadcast use only subject shoppers tips for watermelons and cantaloupes Information from the Bureau of Home Economics, U.S. Department of Agriculture. The other day I watched a man shopping for watermelons. There must have been 50 big, dark green melons in front of him. Some of them were those long Tom Watson melons. Some were the rounder rattlesnake stripe variety. This shopper was systematically going the round of those watermelons, thumping them. 
he would squat down beside one cock his head on one side and give the melon a good vigorous thump finally he found a watermelon that satisfied him and lugged it out to his auto ever since i was a child i've believed that thumping a watermelon was the test of its quality that if the melon says pink it is green but if it gives back a dull punk it is ripe and good but experts at the united states department of agriculture say that thumping a watermelon is not a dependable test even of ripeness the most you can learn about the watermelon that goes punk is that it is not green but melons that are overripe also make that sound when you thump them and they may also have other defects so there are other tests you ought to use in buying watermelons to supplement the thumping test one is to roll the melon over and look at the side that has lain on the ground if the color of that underneath side is yellowish the melon is probably ripe if it is very yellow it may not be so good good ripe melons are also firm and fresh looking and have a velvety bloom on the surface of the rind some people put great faith in a plug cut from a watermelon and if the plug goes deep enough you can tell a good deal about the ripeness and flavor of the melon from seeing and tasting this sample there is such a wide variation among watermelons not until you eat a given melon can you be sure of its sweetness and flavor the only way an inexperienced shopper can be absolutely sure of her purchase is to buy watermelon slices or half a watermelon but when you buy it so you have to eat it soon once cut into watermelon rapidly deteriorates inspectors have been reporting uneven quality in watermelons shipped from the southern states and locally grown ones are also likely to run uneven in quality so it's a good idea to have in mind all these different clues to watermelon excellence when you shop for this fruit of the vine thump it if you want to if it goes pink you will know it's green and eliminate it if it goes punk examine it further to see that it is not overripe and is of good quality otherwise yellowish in color where the sun didn't reach it but not too yellow firm with a bloom on its surface and get the salesman to plug it so that you can learn something about flavor musk melons or cantaloupes if you prefer that name are easier to shop for one good clue to quality is the stem scar if the stem has come off leaving a smooth well calloused scar you'll know that the melon was ripened on the vine and vine ripened cantaloupes are likely to be the best flavored if part of the scar is rough with maybe some of the stem still on that cantaloupe was not fully ripe when it was picked so it may not be quite so well flavored the stem scar isn't so much help with cassabas honey balls and honeydew melons as it is with the cantaloupe for these three types of melons can be ripened quite nicely off the vine another good test of ripeness for the cantaloupe is the rind in a high quality melon the netting on it stands out in rather bold relief and is coarse and grayish in color the ground color back of this gray netting is a pale green with a yellowish tinge some people consider the best clue to ripeness in a cantaloupe is the softness of the blossom end if you are the first person to press the melon on the blossom end you can tell a lot about the way it feels but if a dozen shoppers before you have also pressed that melon they will have made it soft in that spot even if it is an immature melon so 
softness of the blossom end is not always a sure test one of the very best tests of all is the smell when a cantaloupe's full flavor is developed the aroma advertises it most energetically with cantaloupes as with watermelons the final test is in the eating there are literally hundreds of varieties of cantaloupes and each has its own peculiar texture color sugar content and flavor some look fine but taste just like pumpkins others are sweet and delicious though odor and color give you some idea as to flavor you can't be sure of any melon until you eat it speaking of odor you put a musk melon into a refrigerator at your own risk but a thoroughly chilled musk melon is so desirable that a lot of people do it and if you wrap oiled paper around it you will keep some of the odor in by all means do not put chopped ice into a scooped out melon to chill it the ice melts and is messy and besides the melon flavor then is not so good if you want to chill a melon outside the refrigerator put it on a bed of chipped ice musk melon is a valuable food from the viewpoint of the nutritionists it is an excellent source of vitamin c a good source of vitamin a and a fair source of vitamin b watermelons are a fair source of these three vitamins both these melon types are in the low calorie group of foods they come in the six percent carbohydrate class along with strawberries blackberries and dandelion greens end of shoppers tips for watermelons and cantaloupes by the United States Department of Agriculture Radio Service. Read by Sue Anderson. To a Stranger by Martin Luther. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To a stranger. Consolation to one doubting his election to eternal life. July 20, 1528. Dear sir and friend, I wish you above all the grace and mercy of God through his son, Jesus, our sole Savior. Some days ago, my brother Caspar Krusiger, doctor of the Holy Scriptures, informed me that you were inflicted with strange thoughts as to God's omniscience, and had become quite perplexed, so that it was feared you might take your own life, which may God Almighty prevent. You find difficulty in believing that the Almighty knew from all eternity who should be saved, whether they were dead, alive, or as yet unborn now all must admit this for he knows all things and nothing is hidden from him who counts the stars in the heavens the leaves of the trees nay even the hairs of men's heads from all which you seem to fancy you may do what you will good or evil for if god has ordained whether you shall be saved or not which is true your thoughts are more taken up with damnation than salvation and you sink into despair and become a prey to despondency. So I, as my Lord Christ's servant, send this letter of consolation to let you know God's thoughts towards you, whether you be destined to blessedness or perdition. Although the Almighty knows everything and no one can go against the decrees of his will, still it is his earnest desire, nay command, decreed from all eternity, that all men should be partakers of everlasting joy, as is clearly seen from Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Seeing he desires the salvation of sinners who swarm beneath heaven's lofty vault, why will you, with your foolish thoughts prompted by Satan, separate yourself from them? thereby cutting yourself off from the grace of god Quote, 
For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him, end quote, and cry for help for he is rich toward all who call upon him but it is only strong faith which can drive away such despairing thoughts as in romans three verse twenty two even the righteousness of god which is by faith of jesus christ unto all and upon all them that believe mark these words unto all and upon all if not among that number at least you can reckon yourself among the sinners which is a greater reason that you should pray and be certain of the answer should god delay coming speedily to your help for he will never forsake those who call upon him nor fail to drive away your despairing doubts which are the fiery darts of the devil and his emissaries why wander in false ways when so good and straight a path is before you and the father cries this is my beloved son listen to his counsel and even although in your despair you were so hardened as not to hear god's voice you cannot overlook that of the sun who stands across the path which all must tread crying in trumpet-like tones come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest he not only uses the word come but all no one is excluded no matter how wicked he be so seeing all may come do you run with them leap and spring and do not remain among those lost crowds further he says to me who knows every foot of the way and will not let thy foot slide why wander aimlessly about but who are to come the weary and heavy laden and what kind of company would that be i do not know ministers weary and heavy laden they ought to have high-sounding names such as burgermaster and such like these masterminds who love to grovel in god's word with their human reason like the sow in a turnip field not at all it is he who is weary and heavy laden borne down with sad thoughts direct from the evil one who is called the man who does not know to what hand to turn and is ready to sink into despair so that is why he says heavy laden as if he had known our burdens and wished to help us to bear them nay even relieve us of them entirely and consider that god almighty created and elected us not to damnation but to everlasting life even as the angels in the first sermon proclaimed to the shepherds on the field glory to god in the highest and on earth peace good will toward men and it was inner not bodily peace they meant it was not from those who injured them but from the world the flesh and the devil they were to be delivered hence one can see from the scriptures how great is god's mercy and these and such like thoughts can enable him to form an opinion as to god's foreseeing and then there is no occasion for a man to torture himself nor would it avail even were he to worry his flesh from his bones what business is it of yours that god causes a dear sun to shine over good and bad over arid and green god has ordained that the sun should endure the moisture of the ground with its vital powers thus causing the roots and the branches of the trees to fructify and yield fruit and if a dried-up tree should nevertheless remain impervious to the rays of the sun still the tree is not so much at fault as a soil which is marshy for good ground good corn as the proverb says thus where the preaching is good and full of consolation there are sure to be tender consciences and joyful hearts therefore as you cannot hinder the natural sun which is a tiny spark compared to the starry firmament the smallest star being larger than the whole world from spreading her rays abroad still less can you limit god's grace being fathomless having neither beginning nor end dear one do not reckon so close with god fancy if the son of god had asked the high priests and levites at the crucifixion if he should receive the malefactor into heaven what would they have said doubtless the answer would have been if thieves and murderers desire to enter heaven we do not object and might have added if he belonged to paradise we should not have hung him upon a gallows and it is as likely he will enter heaven as that you are god 
thus speaks a scornful world and man's reason how well christ answered his disciples who asked as john lay asleep on his bosom what shall this man do if i will that he tarry till i come what is that to thee as if to warn him not to fall Quote, let every one sweep before his own door and then we shall be saved End quote. this would prevent much heart-burning as to what god in the eternal counsel of his will has decreed concerning those who should be saved or lost he who will not accept a certainty for an uncertainty will at length come away empty-handed besides being the object of ridicule he who will not be counseled in time and despises god's word will fall a prey to a raging devil as sure as god is god if things went with us according to our thoughts prompted by the flesh and the devil we should all be given over to death therefore we have the word of promise blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days but go thou thy way till the end be for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days if we persevere to the end we may console ourselves that devilish thoughts shall be expelled and we may raise our hearts in faith to god and be certain that we have received forgiveness of sins and shall be nay are justified according to christ's promise by faith of jesus christ as st paul testifies in galatians three verse twenty two that is when we are cast down and every path seems shut up to us we shall once more stand erect in faith resting on god's promises of christ or in christ amen martin luther end of to a stranger by martin luther the virginia statute for religious freedom by thomas jefferson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this act now commonly called the virginia statute for religious freedom began simply as bill number eighty two a bill for establishing religious freedom adopted in seventeen eighty five by the virginia legislature well aware that the opinions and belief of men depend not on their own will but follow involuntarily the evidence proposed to their minds that almighty god hath created the mind free and manifested his supreme will that free it shall remain by making it altogether insusceptible of restraint that all attempts to influence it by temporal punishments or burthens or by civil incapacitations tend only to beget habits of hypocrisy and meanness and are a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion who being lord both of body and mind yet chose not to propagate it by coercions on either as was in his almighty power to do but to extend it by its influence on reason alone that the impious presumption of legislators and rulers civil as well as ecclesiastical who being themselves but fallible and uninspired men have assumed dominion over the faith of others setting up their own opinions and modes of thinking as the only true and infallible and as such endeavouring to impose them on others hath established and maintained false religions over the greatest part of the world and through all time that to compel a man to furnish contributions of money for the propagation of opinions which he disbelieves and abhors is sinful and tyrannical that even the forcing him to support this or that teacher of his own religious persuasion is depriving him of the comfortable liberty of giving his contributions to the particular pastor whose morals he would make his pattern and whose powers he feels most persuasive to righteousness and is withdrawing from the ministry those temporary rewards which proceeding from an approbation of their personal conduct are an additional incitement to the earnest and unremitting labors for the instruction of mankind that our civil rights have no dependence on our religious opinions any more than our opinions in physics or geometry 
that therefore the proscribing any citizen as unworthy the public confidence by laying upon him an incapacity of being called to offices of trust and emolument unless he profess or renounce this or that religious opinion is depriving him injuriously of those privileges and advantages to which in common with his fellow citizens he has a natural right that it tends also to corrupt the principles of that very religion it is meant to encourage by bribing with a monopoly of worldly honors and emoluments those who will externally profess and conform to it that though indeed these are criminal who do not withstand such temptation yet neither are those innocent who lay the bait in their way that the opinions of men are not the object of civil government nor under its jurisdiction that to suffer the civil magistrate to intrude his powers into the field of opinion and to restrain the profession or propagation of principles on supposition of their ill tendency is a dangerous fallacy which at once destroys all religious liberty because he being of course judge of that tendency will make his opinions the rule of judgment and approve or condemn the sentiments of others only as they shall square with or differ from his own that it is time enough for the rightful purposes of civil government for its officers to interfere when principles break out into overt acts against peace and good order and finally that truth is great and will prevail if left to herself that she is the proper and sufficient antagonist to error and has nothing to fear from the conflict unless by human interposition disarmed of her natural weapons free argument and debate errors ceasing to be dangerous when it is permitted freely to contradict them we the general assembly of virginia do enact that no man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship place or ministry whatsoever nor shall be enforced restrained molested or burthened in his body or goods nor shall otherwise suffer on account of his religious opinions or belief but that all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinions in matters of religion and that the same shall in no wise diminish enlarge or affect their civil capacities and though we well know that this assembly elected by the people for the ordinary purposes of legislation only have no power to restrain the acts of succeeding assemblies constituted with powers equal to our own and that therefore to declare this act irrevocable would be of no effect in law yet we are free to declare and do declare that the rights hereby asserted are of the natural rights of mankind and that if any act shall be hereafter passed to repeal the present or to narrow its operation such act will be an infringement of natural right End of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom by Thomas Jefferson Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, October 2015propositions four and five an excerpt from the wonders of the invisible world being an account of the trials of several witches lately executed in new england by cotton mather doctor of divinity published eighteen sixty two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org proposition four most horrible woes come to be inflicted upon mankind when the devil does in great wrath make a descent upon them the devil is a due evil and wholly set upon mischief when our lord once was going to muzzle him that he might not mischief others he cried out art thou come to torment me he is it seems himself tormented if he but be restrained from the tormenting of men if upon the sounding of the three last apocalyptical angels it was an outcry made in heaven woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the voice of the trumpet i am sure a descent made by the angel of death would give cause for the like exclamation woe to the world by reason of the wrath of the devil 
what a woeful plight mankind would by the descent of the devil be brought into may be gathered from the woeful pains and wounds and hideous desolations which the devil brings upon them with whom he has with a bodily possession made a seizure you may both in sacred and profane history read many a direful account of the woes which they that are possessed by the devil do undergo and from thence conclude what must the children of men hope from such a devil moreover the tyrannical ceremonies whereto the devil uses to subjugate such woeful nations or orders of men as are more entirely under his dominion do declare what woeful work the devil would make where he comes the very devotions of those forlorn pagans to whom the devil is a leader are most bloody penances and what woes indeed must we expect from such a devil of the malach as relishes no sacrifices like those of human heart-blood and unto whom there is no music like the bitter dying doleful groans ejaculated by the roasting children of men furthermore the servile abject needy circumstances wherein the devil keeps the slaves that are under his more sensible vassalage do suggest unto us how woeful the devil would render all our lives we that live in a province which affords unto us all that may be necessary or comfortable for us found the province filled with vast herds of savages that never saw so much as a knife or a nail or a board or a grain of salt in all their days no better would the devil have the world provided for nor should we or any else have one convenient thing about us but be as indigent as usually our most ragged witches are if the devil's malice were not overruled by a compassionate god who preserves man and beast hence tis that the devil even like a dragon keeping a guard upon such fruits as would refresh a languishing world has hindered mankind for many ages from hitting those useful inventions which yet were so obvious and facile that it is every body's wonder they were no sooner hit upon the bemisted world must jog on for thousands of years without the knowledge of the lodestone until a neapolitan stumbled upon it about three hundred years ago nor must the world be blessed with such a matchless engine of learning and virtue as that of printing till about the middle of the fifteenth century nor could one old man all over the face of the whole earth have the benefit of such a little though most needful thing as a pair of spectacles till a dutch man a little while ago accommodated us indeed as the devil does begrudge us all manner of good so does he annoy us with all manner of woe as often as he finds himself capable of doing it but shall we mention some of the special woes with which the devil does usually infest the world briefly then plagues are some of those woes with which the devil troubles us it is said of the israelites in first corinthians ten ten they were destroyed of the destroyer that is they had a plague among them tis the destroyer or the devil that scatters plagues about the world pestilential and contagious diseases tis the devil who does oftentimes invade us with them tis no uneasy thing for the devil to impregnate the air about us with such malignant salts as meeting with the salt of our microcosm shall immediately cast us into that fermentation and putrefaction which will utterly dissolve all the vital ties within us even as an aqua fortis made with a conjunction of nitre and vitriol corrodes what it seizes upon and when the devil has raised those arsenical fumes which become venomous quivers full of terrible arrows how easily can he shoot the deleterious miasms into those juices or bowels of men's bodies which will soon inflame them with a mortal fire hence come such plagues as that besom of destruction which within our memory swept away such a throng of people from one english city in one visitation and hence those infectious fevers which are but so many disguised plagues among us causing epidemical desolations again wars are also some of those woes with which the devil causes our trouble it is said in revelations twelve seventeen the dragon was wrath and he went to make war 
and there is in truth scarce any war but what is of the dragon's kindling the devil is that vulcan out of whose forge come the instruments of our wars and it is he that finds us employments for those instruments we read concerning demoniacs or people in whom the devil was that they would cut and wound themselves and so when the devil is in man he puts them upon dealing in that barbarous fashion with one another wars do often furnish him with some thousands of souls in one morning from one acre of ground and for the sake of such theestian banquets he will push upon us as many wars as he can once more why may not storms be reckoned among those woes with which the devil does disturb us it is not improbable that natural storms on the world are often of the devil's raising we are told in job one eleven twelve nineteen that the devil made a storm which hurricanoed the house of job upon the heads of them that were feasting in it paracelsus could have informed the devil if he had not been informed as be sure he was before that if much aluminous matter with saltpetre not thoroughly prepared be mixed they will send up a cloud of smoke which will come down in rain but undoubtedly the devil understands as well the way to make a tempest as to turn the winds at the solicitation of a laplander whence perhaps it is that thunders are observed oftener to break upon churches than upon any other buildings and besides many a man yea many a ship yea many a town has miscarried when the devil has been permitted from above to make an horrible tempest however that the devil has raised many metaphorical storms upon the church is a thing than which there is nothing more notorious it was said unto believers in revelations two ten the devil shall cast some of you into prison the devil was he that at first set cain upon abel to butcher him as the apostle seems to suggest for his faith in god as a rewarder and in how many persecutions as well as heresies has the devil been ever since engaging all the children of cain that serpent the devil has acted his cursed seed in unwearied endeavors to have them of whom the world is not worthy treated as those who are not worthy to live in the world by the impulse of the devil tis that first the old heathens and then the mad arians were pricking briars to the true servants of god and that the papists that came after them have outdone them all for slaughters upon those that have been accounted as the sheep for the slaughters the late french persecution is perhaps the horriblest that ever was in the world and as the devil of mascon seems before to have meant it in his outcries upon the miseries preparing for the poor huguenots thus it has been all acted by a singular fury of the old dragon inspiring of his emissaries but in reality spiritual woes are the principal woes among all those that the devil would have us undone withal sins are the worst of woes and the devil seeks nothing so much as to plunge us into sins when men do commit a crime for which they are to be indicted they are usually moved by the instigation of the devil the devil will put ill men upon being worse was it not he that said in first kings twenty two twenty two i will go forth and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all the prophets even so the devil becomes an unclean spirit a drinking spirit a swearing spirit a worldly spirit a passionate spirit a revengeful spirit and the like in the hearts of those that are already too much of such a spirit and thus they become improved in sinfulness yea the devil will put good men upon doing ill thus we read in first chronicles twenty one one satan provoked david to number israel and so the devil provokes men that are eminent in holiness unto such things as may become eminently pernicious he provokes them especially unto pride and unto many unsuitable emulations there are likewise most lamentable impressions which the devil makes upon the souls of men by way of punishment upon them for their sins tis thus when an offended god puts the souls of men over into the hands of that officer who has the power of death that is the devil it is the woeful misery of unbelievers in second corinthians four four quote, the god of this world has blinded their minds 
End quote. And thus it may be said of those woeful wretches whom the devil is a god unto, the devil so muffles them that they cannot see the things of their peace and the devil so hardens them that nothing will awaken their cares about their souls how come so many to be seared in their sins tis the devil that with a red-hot iron fetched from his hell does cauterize them thus tis till perhaps at last they come to have wounded conscience in them and the devil has often a share in their torturing and confounding anguishes the devil who terrified Cain and Saul and Judas into desperation still becomes a king of terrors to many sinners and frights them from laying hold on the mercy of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In these regards, woe to us when the devil comes down upon us. Proposition 5 Toward the end of his time, the descent of the devil in wrath upon the world will produce more woeful effects than what we have been in former ages. The dying dragon will bite more cruelly and sting more bloodily than ever he did before. The death pangs of the devil will make him to be more of a devil than he ever was, and the furnace of this Nebuchadnezzar will be heated seven times hotter just before its putting out we are in the first place to apprehend that there is a time fixed and stated by god for the devil to enjoy a domination over our sinful and therefore woeful world the devil once exclaimed in matthew eight twenty nine quote, jesus thou son of god art thou come hither to torment us before our time End quote. It is plain that until the second coming of our Lord, the devil must have a time of plaguing the world, which he was afraid would have expired at his first. The devil is, quote, by the wrath of God, the prince of this world, end quote. And the time of his reign is to continue until the time when our Lord himself shall take to himself his great power and reign then tis that the devil shall hear the son of god swearing with loud thunders against him thy time shall now be no more then shall the devil with his angels receive their doom which will be depart into the everlasting fire prepared for you we are also to apprehend that in the meantime the devil can give a shrewd guess when he draws near the end of his time when he saw christianity enthroned among the romans it is here said in our revelations twelve twelve quote, he knows he hath but a short time end quote. and how does he know it why reason will make the devil to know that god won't suffer him to have the everlasting dominion and that when god has once begun to rescue the world out of his hands he'll go through with it until the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered but the devil will have scripture also to make him know that when his anti-christian vicar the seven-headed beast on the seven-hilled city shall have spent his determined years he with his vicar must unavoidably go down into the bottomless pit it is not improbable that the devil often hears the scripture expounded in our congregations yea that we never assemble without a satan among us as there are some divines who do with more uncertainty conjecture from a certain place in the epistle of the ephesians that the angels do sometimes come into our churches to gain some advantage from our ministry but be sure our demonstrable interpretations may give repeated notices to the devil that his time is almost out and what the preacher says unto the young man know thou that god will bring thee into judgment that may our sermons tell unto the old wretch know thou that thy judgment is at hand but we must now likewise apprehend that in such a time the woes of the world will be heightened beyond what they were at any time yet from the foundation of the world hence tis that the apostle has forewarned us in second timothy three one quote, this know that in the last days perilous times shall come End quote. truly when the devil knows that he has got into his last days he will make perilous times for us the times will grow more full of devils and therefore more full of perils than ever there were before of this if we would know what cause is to be assigned 
it is not only because the devil grows more able and more eager to vex the world but also and chiefly because the world is more worthy to be vexed by the devil than ever heretofore the sins of men in this generation will be more mighty sins than those of the former ages men will be more accurate and exquisite and refined in the arts of sinning than they used to be and besides their own sins the sins of all the former ages will also lie upon the sinners of this generation do we ask why the mischievous powers of darkness are to prevail more in our days than they did in those that are past and gone tis because the men by sinning over again the sins of the former days have a fellowship with all those unfruitful works of darkness as twas said in matthew twenty three twenty six quote, all these things shall come upon this generation End quote. so the men of the last generation will find themselves involved in the gulf of all that went before them of sinners tis said quote, they heap up wrath End quote and the sinners of the last generations do not only add unto the heap of sin that has been piling up ever since the fall of man but they interest themselves in every sin of that enormous heap there has been a cry of all former ages going up to god that the devil may come down and the sinners of the last generations do sharpen and louden that cry till the thing do come to pass as destructively as irremediably from whence it follows that the thrice holy god with his holy angels will now after a sort more abandon the world than in the former ages the roaring impieties of the old world at last gave mankind such a distaste in the heart of the just god that he came to say quote, it repents me that i have made such a creature End quote. and however it may be but a witty fancy in a late learned writer that the earth before the flood was nearer to the sun than it is at this day and that god's hurling down the earth to a further distance from the sun were the cause of that flood yet we may fitly enough say that men perished by a rejection from the god of heaven thus the enhanced impieties of this our world will exasperate the displeasure of god at such a rate as that he will more cast us off than heretofore until at last he do with a more than ordinary indignation say go devils do you take them and make them beyond all former measures miserable and lastly if we are inquisitive after instances of those aggravated woes with which the devil will towards the end of his time assault us let it be remembered that all the extremities which were foretold by the trumpets and vials in the apocalyptic schemes of these things to come upon the world were the woes to come from the wrath of the devil upon the shortening of his time the horrendous desolations that have come upon mankind by the eruptions of the old barbarians upon the roman world and then of the saracens and since of the turks were such woes as men had never seen before the infatious blindness and vileness which then came upon mankind and the monstrous crusades which thereupon carried the roman world by millions together unto the shambles were also such woes as had never yet had a parallel and yet these were some of the things here intended when it was said woe for the devil is come down in great wrath having but a short time but besides all these things and besides the increase of plagues and wars and storms and internal maladies now in our days there are especially two most extraordinary woes one would fear will in these days become very ordinary one woe that may be looked for is a frequent repetition of earthquakes and this perhaps by the energy of the devil in the earth the devil will be clapped up as a prisoner in or near the bowels of the earth when once that conflagration shall be dispatched which will make the new earth wherein shall dwell righteousness and that conflagration will doubtless be much promoted by the subterraneous fires which are a cause of the earthquakes in our days accordingly we read quote, great earthquakes in diverse places end quote, enumerated among the tokens of the time approaching when the devil shall have no longer time 
i suspect that we shall now be visited with more usual and yet more fatal earthquakes than were our ancestors inasmuch as the fires that are shortly to burn unto the lowest hell and set on fire the foundations of the mountains will now get more head than they used to do and it is not impossible that the devil who is ere long to be punished in those fires may augment his desert of it by having an hand in using some of those fires for our detriment learned men have made no scruple to charge the devil with it dio permitente tierra moset cosette the devil surely was a party in the earthquake whereby the vengeance of god in one black night sunk twelve considerable cities of asia in the reign of tiberius but there will be more such catastrophes in our days italy has lately been shaking till its earthquakes have brought ruins at once upon more than thirty towns but it will within a little while shake again and shake till the fire of god had made an entire etna of it and behold this very morning when i was intending to utter among you such things as these we are cast into a heartquake by tidings of an earthquake that has lately happened in jamaica an horrible earthquake whereby the tyrus of the english america was at once pulled into the jaws of the gaping and groaning earth and many hundreds of the inhabitants buried alive the lord sanctifies so dismal a dispensation of his providence unto all the american plantations but be assured my neighbors the earthquakes are not over yet we have not yet seen the last and then another woe that may be looked for is the devils being now let loose in preternatural operations more than formerly and perhaps in possessions and obsessions that shall be very marvellous you are not ignorant that just before our lord's first coming there were most observable outrages committed by the devil upon the children of men and i am suspicious that there will again be an unusual range of the devil among us a little before the second coming of our lord which will be to give the last stroke in destroying the works of the devil the evening wolves will be much abroad when we are near the evening of the world the devil is going to be dislodged of the air where his present quarters are god will with flashes of hot lightning upon him cause him to fall as lightning from his ancient habitation and the raised saints will there have a new heaven which we expect according to the promise of god now a little before this thing you be like to see the devil more sensible and visibly busy upon earth perhaps than ever he was before you shall oftener hear about apparitions of the devil and about poor people strangely bewitched possessed and obsessed by infernal fiends when our lord is going to set up his kingdom in the most sensible and visible manner that ever was and in a manner answering the transfiguration of the mount it is a thousand to one but the devil will in sundry parts of the world assay the like for himself with a most apish imitation and men at least in some corners of the world and perhaps in such as god may have some special designs upon will to their cost be more familiarized with the world of spirits than they had been formerly so that in fine if just before the end when the times of the jews were to be finished a man then ran about everywhere crying woe to the nation woe to the city woe to the temple woe 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 much more may the descent of the devil just before his end when all the times of the gentiles will be finished cause us to cry out woe 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 because of the black things that threaten us End of Propositions 4 and 5, excerpts from The Wonders of the Invisible World by Cotton Mather. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in August 2015.